Chapter 18 Now he's back, and almost anything may happen. September through October, 1928 Kennedy's European sojourn wasn't all meetings with Murdoch and international distributors. He knew he needed a serious stretch of vacation, and be at Palm Beach, Cape Cod, or France. He always found the ocean refueled him. His fortieth birthday was hardly a time of self-reflection, however, as he spent it in the splendor of the Hôtel du Palais in Biarritz, where he swam in the Atlantic and entertained visitors, including Gloria's husband, Henri. As usual, Joe stayed in near constant touch with the gang, and there were days his cables cost more than his hotel suite. The news grew disquieting, for in addition to the evolving situation at First National, Sarnoff and others were quoted making derogatory remarks about Kennedy, including the charge that his head-cutting tactics at KAO were resulting in a new low in efficiency and morale. There were reports that Ed Albee was trying to retake KAO, and that Kennedy was out if he didn't turn things around, even though his role as chairman had been ratified only two months earlier. Joe had planned to stay abroad longer. But while Murdoch and Casey remained in Europe, Kennedy returned home to personally take charge of the Keith matters. On Friday morning, September 28th, Film Daily headlined, Kennedy returns, and the man himself smiled widely as he walked down the gangplank of the Aquitania later that day. Once again, he was greeted by reporters, this time wanting his response to rumors of the sale of KAO. He was not about to say something specific, but his irritation that anyone would even think of doing anything without him was clear. The industry is watching with interest, was the best the press could report adding the caveat, Now he's back, and almost anything may happen. Outwardly, Joe was as confident as ever, even appearing on Sunday night as a guest on Collier's Radio Hour. Billed as an important leader of the entertainment industry, he had risen to the role of philosopher and prognosticator king of the film business, which he now proclaimed to be in a state of flux and experimentation. He used the opportunity to praise his fellow studio chiefs and review film's historic achievements, and he predicted that the time will come when television will carry the best of entertainment into the home. While acknowledging movies had crippled legitimate drama and even invaded vaudeville, he defended the art form as providing the world with amusement and instruction at a cost within the reach of everybody. He closed his address with a claim that a country finally gets the quality of government it deserves. It receives only the type and grade of entertainment it wants. To the reporters who gathered at the radio studio, he was still the mystery man. They wanted a comment on his plans and rumors that Warners, Fox, and RCA had offers on the table for KAO but all they got was a silent smile as Kennedy walked past them. For almost a decade, he had been forecasting the consolidation of companies for survival and profit. He was right. But with his failure to keep First National, his plans to personally lead the charge had floundered. For once, he wasn't sure what was going to happen. And the next morning, the first Monday after his return, he went behind closed doors with Elisha Walker to assess the situation. Kennedy still controlled FBO, and, along with Walker and the other financiers, Pathé and KAO. He was chairman of the board and the holder of 37,500 shares of KAO, with options on another 75,000, so it would be difficult for anyone to take over without Joe's consent. He, along with the members of Walker's holding company, held firm control, but under their purchase agreement of the previous May, they were only obliged to stay together as a block for a few more months. They needed to make their move soon, and, for Joe especially, the war drums were beating. Courier wanted out of FBO, and while Walker was still willing to back Kennedy, he planned to reduce his film-related holdings. 
Joe was intensely realistic when it came to recognizing the difference between what he could control and what he could not. He knew he was a builder and a promoter, not a long-term administrator. Over the past few months, profits from sound films had zoomed upward, and there was no question that their popularity was here to stay. Yet fewer than five percent of the country's theaters were wired for sound. The entire process was going to take a lot longer than originally anticipated, and much more time, money, and work would be required. Let someone else take the risks and deal with FBO, where, in spite of all the public pronouncements, the sound equipment was still not totally functional. Always the pragmatist, he decided it was time to maximize his profits. One of the sure ways of making money in pictures, Kennedy quipped, is to sell at a time when someone wants to buy. And David Sarnoff was ready to do just that. Paramount, MGM, Universal, United Artists, and First National had all signed with Western Electric's Vitaphone, and many believed they had mopped up all the gravy. But Sarnoff was convinced there was plenty of business left on the plate. He believed Vitaphone's sound-on-disc system would soon be obsolete, and that he had the superior products for the long run. He had diffused his focus by spending his time trying to put films into schools, churches, and homes, as well as theaters. But when First National was taken over by Warner Brothers, the linchpin company for Western Electric, he had to move quickly, and without being hampered by individual organizational problems. In other words, without Joe Kennedy. Sarnoff's immediate concern was the rumor that Warner Brothers was seeking to buy KAO. With Warner's and their bankers, Goldman Sachs, already controlling their own and now First National's theaters, adding KAO would give them an overwhelming advantage. Keith Albee Orpheum was the last large first-class independent chain in the country, and Sarnoff needed those theaters for Photophone. Further complicating the situation, Ed Albee's talk of returning to power increased the possibility of a bidding war. The leaks started spinning out of control to the point it was reported that the sale of KAO to Warners had progressed to a stage where only the details are to be straightened out. Yet the ace up Sarnoff's sleeve was that he already had a working relationship with Elisha Walker, whose investments in KAO were on the line— and Sarnoff brought in Walker's Blair and Company, along with Lehman Brothers, to finance his moves. Walker's cooperation was needed for more than KAO, since Sarnoff's plan was to buy FBO as well, and establish the first studio created to make sound films exclusively. With KAO's theaters, FBO's studio and distribution arm, Photophone sound systems, RCA's radio patents and recording abilities, as well as the National Broadcasting Company, it would be the fully integrated company Kennedy had been envisioning for years. If Joe felt a sense of defeat, he was clear about his decision and his priorities. I entered the amusement business with the viewpoint of a banker. If, after the organization of a new corporation is running smoothly, I look around and get a good offer for my holdings— I will make a trade. Yet everything wasn't running smoothly, and he wasn't getting out entirely. He still had Gloria, the important film they were making together, and he still had Pathé. He, along with Walker and Murdoch, would keep that company, which was in no position to be sold at the moment anyway. Pathé stock had fluctuated wildly that summer, in part because of the merger rumors. Standing alone, Pathé was judged to be in a stubborn fight for survival. The Independent Standard Trade and Security Service declared Pathé in the weakest position of all the film companies, and announced stock purchases are not advised at this time. In selling FBO and KAO, Kennedy was looking at an opportunity to triple or quadruple his fortune. But in order to maximize his profit, serious negotiations lay ahead. Still, he found himself unable to focus exclusively on them, as Gloria Swanson was weighing heavily on his mind. 
pre-production on their Stroheim film, had consumed the summer and early fall, and the accumulated costs had mounted to almost half a million dollars. It was a staggering amount. And while Kennedy could rightly question Stroheim's relentless perfectionism, much was also wasted because of Gloria's and Joe's inexperience as producers. At Kennedy's direction, the gang had moved ahead and hired personnel long before they were actually needed. Stroheim's hand-chosen first assistant director, as well as his personal publicist and his script girl, had all been under contract for five months. The leading cast members had been collecting paychecks since early August. Walter Byron, an English actor Sam Goldwyn had hired to star opposite Vilma Banke in The Awakening, was to play the wild and roistering prince. Cena Owen, a dependable feature actress in her early thirties who had been making films for fifteen years, was waiting to portray the evil Queen Regina, and Tully Marshall rounded out the featured roles as Jan, the brutal, lustful villain. In addition to the salaries, the studio, offices, carpentry, props, and stages all had to be paid for. According to the terms of agreement signed on August 1st, Gloria Productions was to pay FBO $5,000 for the use of the studio's equipment, stages, and projection room. Swanson was also to reimburse FBO for utilities and any of the personnel she used. The almost incestuous nature of the arrangement was apparent in the contract signed by Bill LeBaron for FBO and Charlie Sullivan for Gloria Productions. At the moment of signing, both men's salaries were being paid by FBO. Kennedy took from one pocket and filled the other, keeping everything on paper above board. Over at the United Artists' Publicity Department, Concern centered on a title guaranteed to keep audiences away in droves. Since early summer, the phrase, Gloria Swanson in The Swamp, had been headlining ads promoting their upcoming season. All the while, the U.A. publicists bombarded Gloria with requests that she secure a more attractive title. However, Stroheim resented anyone attempting to change anything of his— and Joe didn't seem worried about it. For a man who had been renaming films to maximize audience drawing power for years, Joe should have been the first to suggest another title. The Swamp, described in Stroheim's earliest drafts as a waterfront dive and an establishment of rather ill repute, was not only an unappealing title, but it put the emphasis on a place, not on the star. If Gloria was consciously aware of that or not, she did agree a change was needed, and when Joe came around to the same conclusion, he brought Stroheim with him. A variety of names were subjected to a thorough legal vetting. The Scarlet Saint? No, because that had been a very poor First National film a few years before. The Saint in Scarlet was available, but it was too similar. There was already a play entitled The Orchid Lady, and The Orchid Woman was a magazine article that was being made into a film. By process of elimination, they decided on Queen Kelly. Shooting had been scheduled to begin in early September, and everything appeared ready. Everything, that is, but Eric von Stroheim. The director argued that if he was to meet the now ten-week shooting schedule he had agreed to— he needed more time to perfect his script. Two and a half months in front of the camera might be more than twice the time taken to make most films, but to Stroheim it was a quickie. He had spent between twenty-six and one hundred weeks to complete his previous creations. The trades were doubtful that Stroheim could be controlled, with Variety asking if the Gower Street thrift bug will bore into hitherto impenetrable surfaces— none too subtly referring to the director's skull. A Stroheim film was big news, so every nugget of information was monitored, and the latest delay was blamed on various uncontrollable forces. Installation of sound equipment at the studio, sets that had to be built instead of borrowed, and then there were those hundreds of costumes to create. Upon Kennedy's return from Europe, 
Bill LeBaron reported to him that he was going into a final all-night session to cut down Stroheim's finished script, currently consisting of 735 scenes. LeBaron tried to soothe Joe's ire, telling him he knew it has been hard for you to understand why so much time has been necessary to get the story straightened out and the script finished. But the bottom line was the work could not be done any faster by Stroheim, and there was nothing else that could be done until his work was finished. If there wasn't anything Kennedy could do to get the cameras rolling, he could at least do something about Gloria. There she was on the cover of the September photoplay, staring out at him from every newsstand, yet he hadn't seen her for over two months, and it would be at least another month until he was free to return to California. If he didn't speak to her every day on the phone, he cabled her, sometimes in code or by sending every other word in two different telegrams. Their machinations heightened his excitement over their relationship, and now from New York he told her how much he missed her and urged her to come for a visit. In Kennedy's absence, Swanson had been entertaining herself. With time on her hands, she even agreed to take part in a stunt, dressing in a frumpy disguise of a blonde wig and less-than-fashionable clothes, and then making the rounds of casting offices looking for work as an extra. When she was turned down flat by three different studios, Gloria got a big laugh, and young women who were trying to break into the business had their confidence boosted. Bored with being asked about working with Stroheim when they hadn't even started yet, Gloria declined most requests for public appearances. But she did attend a few parties, and her friends Lois Wilson and Virginia Bowker both came for visits. By the end of September, it was clear the director wasn't going to be ready for at least several more weeks. But before she agreed to come to New York, she wanted some money. Her agreement with what she considered her own company was that she was to be paid a total of $50,000 for her appearance in Queen Kelly. But she needed cash now for reasonable expenses and pressing debts. Between Kennedy and the lines of credit he had established, the money was there and the funds were advanced against her eventual salary. Feeling flush, Gloria gave in to Joe's pleadings to put herself and the children on the train. If she thought about it, and she did occasionally, Gloria believed she was being the mother she was supposed to be by bringing the children with her. Miss Simonson, the governess who had been with them since shortly after little Gloria's birth, accompanied them as well. But for eight-year-old Gloria and brother, now six, spending two weeks in a New York hotel suite was hardly their idea of fun. Yet at home they were sheltered as well, enrolled at the private Curtis School with various tutors and music teachers coming to the house for lessons. They made sporadic appearances at the birthday parties of other stars' children. But Gloria didn't allow them to go to the movies with friends. She considered sending them to a Swiss boarding school, but even when they were with her she was rarely hindered by motherhood. In New York that meant being an active participant in the city's social life and going out with Joe almost every night. Swanson insisted other friends be with them when they made their public appearances, but she claimed that Joe didn't see why a beard was necessary. He had always maintained a separate life away from home, and even if that was now in Riverdale, only half an hour away from Manhattan, separate was separate. Part of their continued attraction was their willingness to stand up to the other. But when Joe saw how adamant Gloria was, he went along with her mandate. Even if they were in a group, Joe loved walking into a room with her and watching everyone's heads turn in her direction, and therefore in his direction as well. Yet being in New York with Gloria on a nightly basis still wasn't enough. He wanted to show her off to the home crowd as well, and announced he had promised his family that he would bring her to their house for a visit. While she refused to meet the wife of the man she was sleeping with, she compromised by allowing the children to go to Riverdale. Eddie Moore, who knew Gloria Jr. and brother well from being with them in Beverly Hills, was assigned to drive them to the Kennedy home for the day, and they returned to their hotel suite with stories of 
more children under one roof than they had dreamed possible. To the two lonely and protected siblings, it looked like nirvana. Fueled by Gloria's visit, Joe spent most of his October days and nights in Manhattan. While Arthur Poole and other accountants pulled together the numbers, E.B. Durr and Calvin Brown reviewed the multiple agreements that would have to be untwined or altered before any companies changed hands. John Murdoch returned from Europe on Friday, October 12th and much of that weekend was spent conferring with Kennedy about the stance they would take come Monday morning, and their first official meetings with RCA about selling KAO. RCA was offering $30 a share for KAO stock, $9 more than the Kennedy Walker Group had paid in May, but $2 less than its current high on the surge of all the buyout talk. Joe was convinced they could get even more. They had been in and out of meetings with RCA for two full days when he produced a letter from Goldman Sachs, Warner Brothers bankers, with a direct offer to buy his options on 75,000 shares for $36 a share. Kennedy had already done enough backpedaling in his relationship with Sarnoff, and the last thing he wanted to do was complicate things with Walker. Yet the Goldman offer, his KAO chairmanship, and his stock options— combined to give Joe the power to hold the whip in the negotiations. When they finally emerged from several days of intense discussions, it was with an offer of $36 a share and an extra $150,000 in Kennedy's pocket for facilitating the deal. Before, during, and after the KAO meetings, Kennedy was pulling together everything necessary to sell FBO. As part of the process, he needed to submit the company's balance sheet, and he listed its value at a little over $7.2 million, a 600% increase in the price he and Courier had paid for it two and a half years before. RCA not only accepted that value, they overpaid, offering almost $7.5 million in a stock swap deal. FBO's 208,796 shares of stock were owned by a total of 23 individuals or companies. Stockholders included RCA with 27,000 shares and Keith Orpheum with 11,715 shares. Many of the men Courier had brought in to help purchase the company in the first place, such as Louis Kirstein, Frederick Prince, and Joseph Powell, still held their stock with Courier's friends combining to own a little over 50,000 shares. Another 15,000 shares had been distributed to FBO employees or retainers. E.B. Durr held 5,000, Kennedy's attorney Benjamin DeWitt, who was on the FBO payroll at $2,000 a month, had 2,000, and Bill LeBaron, 1,500. Joe Schnitzer still owned 7,000 shares from when he and Pat Powers had invested in the company in 1923. With almost 100,000 shares, the largest single owner of FBO stock was the Gower Street Company, otherwise known as Joe Kennedy and Guy Courier. There had been no meetings of the Gower Street Board since June, but two meetings were held in October, in addition to the perfunctory annual meeting in Delaware. The board still consisted of only Kennedy Courier and Ted Strybert. They met to sell themselves 37,500 shares of FBO each at cost first acquired, presumably the $6 a share established when they created the company. With that, the stock was placed in escrow at the National City Bank to wait for the official issuing of the new company's stock at $36 a share, or $30 of clear profit on each share of FBO. Finally, it was time to go public with the plan, and on October 18, 1928, Kennedy released a letter to all FBO stockholders announcing the agreement between RCA and FBO to create a new company to be known as Radio Keith Orpheum Corporation. Shareholders had six weeks to exchange their FBO stock for that of the new company, quickly dubbed RKO. The following Monday, Joe's name was on another announcement, this one from KAO. 
Their board had agreed to sell the company to RCA, and since the board and executives in the meeting represented 40% of the shareholders, only 11% more was needed to finalize the arrangement. The remaining shareholders were put on notice they had until November 15th to ensure the full benefits of the stock swap. At a value of $36 a share, it was an impressive profit for the Walker Group, who had bought at $21 only five months and three days earlier. After two weeks together in New York, Joe ushered Gloria and her family onto the train and assured her he would join them in California soon. He then spent the last week of October in New York, in and out of Pathé meetings, and hosting his regional directors at a lunch at the Roosevelt Hotel to publicly put to rest any remaining rumors of dissatisfaction between him and Sarnoff, Kennedy organized a tour of the RCA studios for the Path A Men, where they screened portions of upcoming sound releases. There was one more piece of official business to be taken care of before going west, and for that, Kennedy went to Boston to appear with his wife, Cardinal O'Connell, the president of Harvard, and other local luminaries, at the opening of the new Keith Memorial Theater. It had been in the works for three years, but Joe was there to play host and claim credit for the magnificent theater with its black and gold carpet, a ceiling painted in gold leaf, and a backstage area complete with gymnasium, nursery, and private rooms and baths. It would be one of the last of the great palaces built with the intention of presenting vaudeville acts along with feature films. For Kennedy, it was another opportunity to be seen by his former hometown crowd, and he took center stage, praising Keith and Albee as one of the finest partnerships in theatrical history. While Kennedy was providing Keith with a revisionist biography as a progressive, the trade speculated over Joe's role in the new RKO. At first, it had been assumed that the sale meant his complete withdrawal. But stories to the contrary kept swirling. Kennedy and Sarnoff appeared to be sharing authority when they both signed a statement to all KAO employees, telling them there should be no concern about being replaced, and to pay no attention to any rumors there may be in circulation as to changes contemplated in the company. Of course, these very words were familiar to employees of Pathé and First National, who had received similar missives before Kennedy's reorganizations, as well as to the KAO workforce, who had heard the same phrases only months earlier, just before the Kennedy Ford Machine Gun Squadron took aim on that company. Kennedy positioned himself so whatever happened, it would appear to be his call. While continuing to refuse to be pinned down, he made clear he was making a tidy sum of money for himself and plenty for those associated with him. He claimed, When I originally came into this industry, it was supposed to have been for only six months. It had been over two years since then, and while he remained intrigued by the movies, the only thing he ruled out was that he would retire. For the moment, he was going to California to supervise Swanson's film, continue running Path A, and, along with Sarnoff, RKO. Chapter 19 The Dollar Sign Implanted in His Heart October through December 1928 This time it was Eddie Moore and Ted O'Leary who accompanied Kennedy to Los Angeles, and once he was home on Rodeo Drive, he faced some serious personnel decisions. Losing First National meant losing slots for his employees, and during his three months away, some of the men he had left behind had literally tripped over each other trying to establish their own power bases. After Joe's abrupt departure, E.B. Durr never returned to the First National lot. Instead, he stayed on in New York visiting with his wife and daughter for several weeks. In spite of his initial resistance, Durr was spending more and more time in California, and soon he was off again, stopping in Chicago where he and Joe Schnitzer spoke to the FBO sales meeting. They announced plans for over 50 films, almost all of which would have 
talking sequences. They were as upbeat as possible, but it was increasingly obvious that if any of these rumored mergers went through, there would be major changes at FBO. Barney Glazer had lasted only a few weeks as First National's Director General for Sound, and then returned to Pathé, pending further instructions from Kennedy. Yet, instead of a welcome reception, Glazer found that Paul Byrne was adamant he was in charge of all production at the Culver City studio. Byrne had failed to live up to Harry Eddington's prediction that he was equal to or better than Thalberg. Aside from his obvious talent and ability, Thalberg was known for keeping his own name off the screen and out of the trades, while Byrne seemed almost incapable of not promoting himself. As soon as Kennedy's ship had sailed, Byrne put out a release announcing he was in complete charge at Pathé. LeBaron, Durr, and Sullivan all met with Byrne at various times, encouraging him to work collaboratively. But he produced his contract, which indeed stated he was to be in charge of production. The other men thought it was best just to let things ride until Joe's return. But they continued to be irked that Byrne spent most of his time worrying about what kind of office he had and how much personal publicity he can get. Now Kennedy was back, and he declared both Byrne and Glazer unit producers. In spite of the grand plans of only three months ago, this was the new reality. Joe had been in California for a week when it was clear he was out of the new RKO, whether he wanted to be or not. On November 15th, the date established as the deadline to complete the KAO-RKO transition, Kennedy received a polite but firm request for his resignation as chairman of the board of KAO. The final paragraph assured him that this does not necessarily mean you are to be replaced— but his resignation was needed in order to make such changes as they may deem necessary and advisable. Yet the writing was on the wall when Sarnoff took his key personnel along with a few money men on a retreat to White Sulphur Springs, and Joe was not included. Kennedy had been pushed, but he had never been one for power-sharing, and he appeared gracious as he switched gears to play the only role available, that of transition advisor. He lost some men in the process. Bill LeBaron was to be RKO's head of production, and Joe Schnitzer was staying in their New York office. Of course, neither man had to change addresses, but for Schnitzer, waiting, deferring, and keeping his nose to the grindstone had finally paid off as he moved back into the office suite he had lost to Kennedy almost three years before. Privately, Joe praised both men to Sarnoff, and then offered to be on call to help if needed. On a corporate level, the merging of FBO and KAO into RKO was a relatively smooth one. General Electric, Westinghouse, and RCA were all represented on the new board of directors— as was Lehman Brothers and Blair and Company. Sarnoff's friend, Louis Kirstein, the man who had first introduced him to Kennedy, was added, and Elisha Walker and Jeremiah Milbank continued to serve. Sarnoff surprised everyone by anointing Hiram Brown, president of the U.S. Leather Company, as the new president of RKO. Brown was 46 years old and had started as a teenage office boy before working himself into the executive ranks in a variety of businesses. Sarnoff made the point that RKO was already heavy with men experienced in entertainment, and therefore he was looking for an administrator whose capacity has been so thoroughly proven in other fields. RKO initially kept FBO and KAO as separate, secondary divisions— Ed Alby continued in his role as president of KAO, hoping in vain that the veil of administrative oblivion was to be lifted. He could not have been encouraged by the fact that Johnny Ford was staying on as vice president and general manager. Joe Schnitzer was elevated to head of FBO, and one of his first announcements was that he was spearheading a radical reversal in production policy 
Under his management, cheap product is completely out. He proved it by paying Flo Ziegfeld $85,000, more than the average cost for an entire FBO film, for the rights to make a talkie out of his stage hit, Rio Rita. For a man whose company commitments had been reduced by 75% over the past three months, Joe Kennedy still had his hands full. He had to breathe life into Pathé, and then there was his passion, Gloria Swanson, and the long-awaited Queen Kelly. Before the cameras started to roll, Stroheim's The Wedding March was finally released, almost two years after he had filmed it. He had cut it down to six hours, and after Pat Powers sold the film to Paramount, they had taken the first half and reduced it to two hours. Even as Stroheim bemoaned the butchering, there was no debate regarding the possessory credit. There on the screen was the pronouncement, in its entirety, an Eric von Stroheim production. Kennedy must have been given pause when he watched the wedding march, a cynical, almost contemptuous tale. Stroheim starred as a hedonistic young prince, the only son of spiteful, money-grubbing royal parents, whose hatred of each other is made clear in the opening scene. Fay Ray is the young innocent from the countryside who falls in love with the uniformed prince and believes his promises of love as he literally deflowers her in a rain of apple blossoms. The analogy appears again when, in a brothel, the prince announces that he craves apple blossoms as a euphemism for wanting a virgin. He marries the innocent, rich, and deformed Zesu Pitts, who carries apple blossoms instead of a bouquet. Subtle, it was not. Twice, skeleton hands are seen playing the church organ, and crucifixes abound. According to Fay Ray, over a month had been spent filming the brothel scenes that occupy fifteen minutes on the screen. The cinematographer, Hal Moore, confirmed that they were played with an exactitude that would have caused apoplexy at the Hayes office and involved prostitutes from Madame Leah Francis's bordello and gallons of bootleg gin. The attention to detail the ornately decorated uniforms, the crowd scenes, and over thirty different sumptuous sets gave the epic a lush, authentic aura. But the wedding march should have set off warning bells. Kennedy had to see the similarities between the wedding march and Queen Kelly that verged on repetition. Orchids replaced apple blossoms as the recurring floral theme, but both were Cinderella stories with an odious twist. If one heroine was a poor Viennese girl and the other a virgin at a Catholic convent, each met her prince as he paraded on horseback, and both were the subjects of lecherous desire. Right there in the Wedding March program was an article by Stroheim's collaborator, Barney Glazer, telling of the director's refusal to take shortcuts, and how, during the writing process, heaps upon heaps of manuscripts accumulated— and scenes multiplied into thousands. The initial box office was respectable, but the wedding march was pulled from the Rivoli in New York after only two weeks and sent to smaller, less prestigious theaters to be screened as part of a double bill where it might run for a week or less. Yet with all this information right in front of him, Kennedy was not about to second-guess himself. He continued to assume that the combined creative vita of Stroheim and Swanson was beyond question, and his rationale for the less-than-stellar returns for the wedding march was that audiences had more alternatives than ever. It had been a year since the release of The Jazz Singer, and big-city moviegoers could now choose among several different sound films. In contrast, the wedding march, even with synchronized music, seemed instantly dated and old-fashioned. Joe told Stroheim that the lousiest sound film will be better than the best silent film. And as early as the summer of 1928, plans were being made to incorporate sound into Queen Kelly. The entire film would be made as a silent, 
Then the last two reels reshot with dialogue and music, perhaps including a song sung by Gloria. Kennedy was given full credit in the trades for this smart idea, and he had visions of the best of both worlds, a lavish epic redolent of the finest silent films, and then a dialogue and musical extravaganza for audiences in the large cities. While the press made the assumption that someone besides Stroheim would direct the sound portions, Kennedy was careful to include a clause in the director's contract to cover dialogue. To make those twenty minutes of sound happen, four photophone engineers were assigned to bring an entire baggage car full of the latest equipment from New York to Los Angeles. Duplicate sets were built to be installed in a soundproof stage. A musical director was hired to arrange for a forty-piece orchestra. A new position was created on the production roster, whose sole responsibility was to be Gloria's voice director, and that was separate from her voice coach, signed in New York at a hundred dollars a week and on his way to the coast to begin her daily lessons. More sound equipment was ordered and installed in the projection room in Gloria's home. The investment was massive, but it wasn't questioned. Warner Brothers had just reported $3 million in earnings for the last three months, more than they had made in any previous year. Finally, on Thursday, November 1st, after months of postponement, the cameras started churning on Queen Kelly's fabulously elaborate palace set. Joe arrived in Los Angeles a few days later, and while he scheduled meetings at Pathé, he happily spent most of his time at FBO, where the actors and crew were on the set an average of fourteen hours a day. On the second day of filming, they were dismissed at six-thirty in the morning. Stroheim was soon holding up the entire company for hours while he acted out scenes or rehearsed an actor for a close-up. Then he stopped production to demand the smallest change on a backdrop. Kennedy stepped in, declared the schedule inhumane, and told the director he had to change his ways. But they were still getting along famously. Kennedy joined Swanson Stroheim and one of the cinematographers, Paul Ivano, in the projection room to screen the results of the first week's shooting. Together they watched as The Prince was introduced— returning to the palace in the early morning hours, surrounded by a half-dozen half-dressed women of the night. Once again, Stroheim had turned to Madame Francis's Hollywood brothel to provide him with his hand-picked cast. Then came Cena Owen as the queen, with her nakedness covered with nothing but a big, pure white Persian cat, most delicately placed. They all agreed the film looked absolutely magnificent, and Gloria remembered finding the rushes breathtaking. Every scene was alive with glowing light play and palpable texture. The only apprehension anyone expressed was over Swanson's first appearance on the screen. A portion of Griffith Park had been turned into a Germanic countryside, where the prince, outriding with his entourage, encounters the young convent girls walking through the fields. His head is turned by sweet, innocent Gloria, and as they are exchanging meaningful glances, her underwear falls to her feet. When the prince starts to laugh, she throws the panties at him, and he waves them under his nose before pushing them into his pocket. While Gloria would later claim to have been off the set when the prince's close-up with the underwear was filmed, Paul Ivano remembers watching the rushes with her, Stroheim and Kennedy— when Ivano volunteered that he didn't know how the scene would get past the censors, he received quick kicks from both Swanson and the director. They were pleased with the results, and hoped Joe wouldn't notice. But he had seen it all and just laughed, saying, Oh, I guess we'll get away with it. For a man who, only months before, had been fearful that romanticizing Jesse James might run afoul of the morality watchers, Kennedy seems to have been swept away in the unique camaraderie of working alongside the woman he loved. He rarely saw the movies his companies produced, and he had certainly spent precious little time on the lot while they were being made, and so he found a new excitement in being in on every aspect of the creation. 
At long last, after a year of talking about it, he and Gloria were embarking on their important picture. Yet as much as he was enjoying himself, he had other concerns that demanded his attention. Except for his regular visits with Gloria, Joe stayed away from social Hollywood and made few public appearances. He had successfully quashed any rumors that he was leaving Pathé, and he was now visibly involved in lining up plans for the next season. If he wasn't on the Queen Kelly set, he was in meetings, actively participating in day-to-day decision-making alongside executives and directors. After much ballyhoo and full-page ads, Pathé's Sound News debuted in late November. Pathé had invented newsreels in 1910, and audiences had come to depend upon them as the only real supplement to newspapers in the years before radio. Pathé needed to add sound to stay competitive, but the production costs doubled. The premiere edition opened with their trademark rooster audibly crowing for the first time, followed by a loud blast from a gun and the sound of shattering glass as a bullet headed directly for the camera. Then came the deafening noise of riveting from bridge builders over the Hudson River, and the final segment consisted of highlights of the previous eighteen years of Pathé newsreels. The sound for newsreels had been accomplished with relative ease, but it had taken six months from the time the first equipment had been delivered to Culver City to put it to use at what was dubbed Sound Unit No. 1. Pathé's first feature film, made exclusively for sound, was just going before the cameras, a mystery melodrama titled The Missing Man. But in terms of both time and money, Pathé could not afford to make all dialogue films from scratch. Technology might have changed, but the goal remained the same. Maximize the distribution potential with bring em in titles at a minimum investment. Recently completed silent films were screened for spots where sound effects or bits of dialogue could be inserted. Show folks, Sal of Singapore, The Shady Lady, Square Shoulders, Noisy Neighbors, and Office Scandal were all run through sound unit number one. They had already recorded the sequences for Gang War, starring Mary's younger brother Jack Pickford and Olive Borden. But sound remained a challenge. The unit secretary reported that Everything is more or less experimental. But LeBaron, in one of his last glass-half-full memos, said he thought the sound work on Gang War was the best I have heard anywhere. With Pathé as his lone corporate base, Kennedy felt new pressures from financial circles. When he had taken over the newly recapitalized company eight months earlier, it had been assumed that he was preparing Pathé to be sold— or merged into a larger entity, and the stock price had risen accordingly. Once Pathé wasn't included in the deal that created RKO, Joe had to scramble to make the company look good standing on its own. His economy programs reached into every area of studio life, and no amount was too small to save. Low-level crew members and secretaries who were paid $35 a week had always stayed on the payroll no matter how few films were being made. But now they were all let go, and then a few hired back on a week-to-week -week basis. Even the remnants of Cecil B. DeMille's personal radio station were sold for a hundred dollars. Kennedy jumped into expanding Pathé in Europe, assigning Bob Kane the task of laying the groundwork to make sound films there. Foreign markets had been bringing in as much as 40% of a film's gross, and now that was threatened with the coming of sound. When Lillian Gish called silent films the international language, she was speaking of the art form of pantomime that transcended words. But it also underscored the fact that to send them around the world, the only change that needed to be made was the language of the title cards. It was all very cost-effective. Dialogue films, however, required language doubles, or the even more expensive proposition of multiple filmings in multiple languages. And acceptance of American sound films was not even guaranteed in other English-speaking countries. The British threatened to laugh off the screen 
actors speaking in the nasal twang of the Yankee. The French were even more vociferous, with one Parisian paper warning that Americans should not imagine that, in addition to having to swallow their films, we will have to put up with their language. European theaters were even slower than their American counterparts to be wired for sound, but Kennedy foresaw that making movies in France and Spain would give them immediate access to native-speaking actors, while tariffs, which took a chunk out of overseas profits, would be muted. England and France had recently tightened their rules concerning how many American films could enter their countries, so production abroad would get around that issue. And, if money was kept in the country where the films were made, taxes could be saved as well. Since his Hayden Stone days, Kennedy realized that the attractiveness of a stock was a phenomenon often unrelated to the strength of the company itself. Even if Pathé was on shaky ground, its stock continued to rise, and while some observers called that unexplainable, it wasn't unexplainable at all. Letters were sent to current Pathé shareholders and others, claiming that the stock was soon to move upward because of important information about to be released. Customers were urged to buy immediately to take advantage of the moment. Under the guise of being from a stock-tip firm, these letters were sent from offices in Los Angeles and Chicago, but Boston was the city of origin, and from an office on Milk Street at that. The method was shady, but still legal, and there can be little question that Kennedy was the source of the addresses of the Pathé stockholders, as well as the content of the letters. Running up a stock's price was almost second nature to him. Instead of investigating the story behind the mysterious rise in Pathé's stock price, the trades headlined, Pathé Shows a Profit Under New Management, and gave Kennedy the credit for turning the company around. The price of the stock had doubled since he had taken over, and it was simply assumed that reflected the strength of the company. Kennedy knew better. While encouraging others to buy Pathé, he was selling his first installment of 25,000 shares in small batches of 100 to 200 shares at a time through his brokers in Boston and New York. Some was sold under Kennedy's name. Some went into accounts in the names of Ted O'Leary and Eddie Moore. But the vast majority was listed under Pat Scollard. It was Scollard who handled the paperwork, passed on the stock certificates, and collected and double-checked the account receipts as they came in almost daily. There were few questions being asked about anything concerning the stock market, in spite of what, in retrospect, was cause for concern. More and more people were buying in, and ticker machines were everywhere, in workplaces, ocean liners, and, as Joe had, in private homes. Signs were hung in Hollywood offices warning, Don't talk to your broker on studio time. Over at Warner Brothers, employees caught buying or selling during office hours were shown the gate. Stock market fever was so intense that motion picture news claimed the principal cause for production delays, lack of concentration resulting in poorer pictures, is simply too much stock market gambling within the studio walls. The underlying assumption was that prices could only continue to climb, and therefore everything was saleable at a profit on a moment's notice. Stimulating the increase in buying was the propensity to purchase on margin, the practice of putting down only a small portion of the actual price, and borrowing the rest from the seemingly endless pool of money flowing into Wall Street. There were precious few voices of caution. The amount of money being loaned for buying on margin had soared from $1 million in the early 1920s to almost $6 million by the time Herbert Hoover celebrated his landslide victory over L. Smith in November of 1928. The first viable Catholic candidate for president had gone without Kennedy's support, and he implied to friends he had voted for the Republican Hoover— Yet, while Wall Street was celebrating, Joe knew that Pathé was not alone in having a stock price that wasn't tied to the actual value of the company. 
to the old bank examiner in him. The massive amount of loans translated into a dangerous rise in speculation, driven in large part by a mystique that Kennedy himself had fueled and profited from, but never bought into. Taking advantage of the fever that boosted prices was one thing. Holding out for the last dollar was another. Joe began to slowly sell almost all of his holdings. On November 21st, Kennedy signed off on the agreement to exchange his KAO stock options for RKO stock. A week later, RKO was up and running on the New York Stock Exchange, and on the opening day he sold 3,000 shares in a dozen small increments, netting himself $150,000 in profits. Over the next few weeks and months, using several different brokerage firms and accounts, Kennedy methodically sold off his RKO shares. Paying $21 to exercise his options on the 75,000 former KAO shares he earned from his five months as chairman of that company, he sold them for between $35 and $52 a share. He sold his 37,500 former FBO shares, for which he had paid a maximum of $6 a share, for the same amounts. Then there were the 12,500 shares of KAO he had received outright for fronting the purchase of the company, the 25,000 shares he committed to buying, and the 4,000 he received from Blair and Company as a participant in their block of stock. Those sales brought in another quarter million dollars. At a time when a brand new Ford cost $460, and the per capita income for Americans was $681 a year, Kennedy cleared a profit of at least $4,250,000 on the RKO deal alone. While his brokers were busy on Wall Street, Joe was still in California on the 1st of December, 1928. Every FBO film that had been in production when the studio became RKO had been completed, and nothing new was scheduled to begin. As a result, Queen Kelly was the only movie being shot on the Gower Street lot, and in their isolation they were running even more behind schedule. Yet there was still an upbeat and positive feeling surrounding the epic, and Paul Byrne was sent to the United Artists' sales convention in Chicago to report in person on Queen Kelly's glorious progress. Durr scurried to prepare a trailer to highlight important scenes, and Swanson and Stroheim sent off laudatory telegrams, praising each other and the excellent progress they were making. Evidently feeling the need to please the boss, Stroheim also spent an extravagant $75 on Christmas flowers for Rose Kennedy. Henri returned from Europe for the holidays, stopping in New York before moving on to Beverly Hills, just as Kennedy was packing up at his house on Rodeo Drive. At a stop in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Joe received a cable informing him of the results of the new FBO board meeting, operating under the RKO umbrella. Hiram Brown was chairman, and board members included David Sarnoff and Guy Courier. Joe Schnitzer was president, and Charlie Sullivan was vice president, with Pat Scollard, treasurer, and Tom Delahanty, secretary. Even if it was likely they would not stay on for long, Scollard told Kennedy that he and Delahanty had been disappointed that their resignations were not accepted on the spot. Kennedy arrived in New York, just as the news of his resignation from all his various roles at FBO and KAO was appearing in the press. Joe claimed that it was his own choice not to be an active participant in RKO, and, once again, instead of questioning why, the press used the opportunity to hail his genius at managing vulnerable companies. They heralded the splendid new offices being prepared for him and his personal executive staff at Pathé's New York headquarters. Kennedy took advantage of the attention to release new numbers for Pathé that claimed a net profit of $65,000 for the latest quarter— in contrast to the almost half a million dollars they had lost the quarter before he was in charge. That brought forth even more praise, 
with Film Daily calling his perseverance, hard work, and dogged determination proof that the apparently impossible can be overcome. At the same time, RKO was looking at just what they had purchased in FBO and KAO, and they were not pleased. They ordered a new audit, and after paying KAO dividends and putting the costs of the transition in the mix, they found that the two companies combined to lose over a million dollars for the first half of the year. It was a far cry from the balance sheets Kennedy had presented, but the public release of the numbers did little to tarnish his still glowing reputation. Still, he wasn't the major mogul he had been only months before. When fifty-four important executives of the film industry were polled for their opinions on the upcoming year, there was room for David Sarnoff, but not for Joseph P. Kennedy. Yet he was lauded in variety as a moneymaker for himself and others, and the proof was in the fact he was one of the only 20,000 millionaires in America. While there were rumors that he was on the fence for the future, it was assumed he would stay with Pathé and perhaps be elected president of the company. Undoubtedly more success lay ahead, because he was unique in having a duplex mind that runs equally smart in the show business as it does to banking. That duplex mind had indeed served to quadruple his personal bank account, but the ripple effect of his actions was now taking its toll on others. Frances Marion had returned home from her shortened trip to Europe in the early fall of 1928 to find her husband still in limbo. She brought him an English bulldog to add to their already large menagerie, but nothing seemed to energize Fred. If their hopes were raised by the creation of RKO, there were no cowboys on their roster, and KAO had already announced that because of low box office receipts, they were off westerns. Thompson, however, continued to believe in the genre so deeply, he took to writing syndicated newspaper articles on their power to teach clean living, and he reached out to Gene Tunney about the possibility of him becoming his producer. There were even some conversations with MGM. If there was one man in Hollywood willing to take on Kennedy, it was Louis B. Mayer. Still, it would mean legal wrangling and publicly airing their differences. So Thompson remained in a twilight zone of inactivity, vacillating between grandiose plans and despair, sitting at home, looking very depressed, holding his head in his hands, Fred's nephew Carson remembers. This was a Fred none of us had ever seen before. Fred Thompson died on Christmas Day, 1928, at the age of 38. The death certificate listed the cause of death as tetanus, but his wife would tell family members that she was convinced Fred had lost his will to live. Headlines throughout the country expressed the shock over his unexpected death, and accolades and condolences poured in. Fred Thompson was the finest influence who has ever touched the industry of motion pictures, wrote Harry Carr in the Los Angeles Times. Photoplay devoted an editorial to The Idol of Millions, claiming that none of the heroic figures he portrayed on the screen were ever cleaner or finer or more courageous than Fred Thompson in his own life and work. Nowhere in all the coverage was a mention of his association with Kennedy, or the fact that he hadn't made a film in more than six months. The tumult around Thompson's funeral was compared to Valentino's. Thousands of fans converged outside the Beverly Hills Community Presbyterian Church, where Harold Lloyd, Cecil B. DeMille, Sam Goldwyn, and Louis B. Mayer were among the mourners. Doug Fairbanks, Tom Mix, and Buster Keaton all sobbed openly. Even William Randolph Hearst, who detested funerals, came to show his respect. Yet Joe Kennedy was not in attendance. To Kennedy, this was no time for sentiment. Fred's death meant a new source of income, life insurance. The corporation had taken out a $150,000 policy on their star, and within days of Fred's funeral, 
Charlie Sullivan and Pat Scollard, the on-paper president of Fred Thompson Productions, set about collecting it. Always on top of the calendar, they wanted to move quickly before another premium was due. Then Fred's childhood friend, David Ferries, a lawyer who had been named executor in Thompson's deathbed will, wrote to Kennedy seeking information about the insurance and the money he assumed the family had coming to them. Scullard asked the Los Angeles-based Sullivan to inform Ferries that the corporation was the beneficiary. Thompson had no stake in that corporation, and that the only way he was to see a dime over his salary was if and when a film cleared over $100,000 in net profits. With Kennedy's approval, Sullivan gave Fred's attorney copies of financial statements showing that, with the exception of Jesse James, Thompson's Paramount Westerns were hopelessly in the red. Scullard and Sullivan decided in advance that, if pushed, they would contend that the $150,000 in insurance would just about cover the anticipated loss on Fred's films. They also agreed to omit the insurance money from the corporation's financial statements, because if the estate asked for an audit, they concluded in an understatement, it might give rise to controversy. Without the rights to his films or the corporation bearing his name, Thompson left an estate valued at $25,000. Yet even when Fred's estate was sued by Jesse James's granddaughter for breach of contract because she thought she had money coming from that film, Francis never asked for an audit. Fred had signed the incredibly one-sided contract, and even if there had been grounds to fight it, she was still too deep in mourning and too private a person to publicly air her grievances. Besides, Kennedy's name in Hollywood was still golden. It would be years before it was acknowledged, as Jesse Lasky's daughter Betty put it, that Joe always wore a wide grin on his face to camouflage the dollar sign implanted in his heart. Frances took several months off from MGM and spent her days inside the walls of her hilltop home with her children. It was not until the spring of 1929 that she made the decision to sell Enchanted Hill, move into Hollywood, and get on with her life and work. The forty-year-old Frances was left to raise their one- and two-year-old sons alone and go on to win two Oscars for writing The Big House and The Champ. She lived another forty-five years. Frances was so generous, recalled her daughter-in-law, Joan Thompson. She rarely said anything negative about anyone. But she hated Joe Kennedy with a passion. Francis's son, Richard, confirmed, if there was someone she didn't like, she said nothing at all. Except for Joe Kennedy. Charlie Sullivan was still at his Gower Street office, but now on the RKO payroll, and Pat Scollard was at Pathé in New York. Whatever their titles, or, for that matter, whoever was paying their salaries, their first and foremost loyalty was to Kennedy. For months following Fred Thompson's death, both men made time to collect Thompson's insurance, as well as press Paramount for a full accounting of the films still in distribution. Scullard and Sullivan exchanged dozens of letters, and, as necessary, sent updates to Kennedy. In the process, Sullivan discovered over 100 cans of Thompson's FBO movies in what were now the RKO vaults. We are shortly going to need all of our vault space. So he asked Scullard what Kennedy wanted done with the films. Trained over the years to look at the next quarter's balance sheet, Scullard instructed Sullivan that, unless there's some shots there that you think you could sell and get some money for, I think it would be the best plan to junk it all and send me a check for the scrap film. After all, that could bring as much as a penny per foot. In doing so, they destroyed 2,200 pounds of scrap film. Or, in other words, Fred Thompson's life work. Chapter 20 Gilding the Manure Pile Spring to Summer, 1929 
While the gang stayed busy on his behalf, Kennedy headed for Palm Beach, and by the end of the first week in January of 1929, he was back at the Oasis Club. Eddie Moore and Ted O'Leary had accompanied him, but soon Joe was enjoying the company of other old friends as well, playing basketball with Herbert Bayard Swope, poker with New York columnist Haywood Brune, and golf on an almost daily basis. He swam in the ocean at the Breakers Beach, where he was tossed by such a strong wave he was afraid his nose was broken. But the next day he was back on the links without any bandages. He was feeling better than he had in months. By the middle of January, J. John Murdoch and Pat Casey joined the group, and the third week brought the arrival of Rose, as well as Gloria's husband, Henri. He had left Beverly Hills after a brief visit, claiming Paris' business affairs demanded his attention. But he took the long way back and spent several weeks in Palm Beach. Yet just as the full roster of guests had unpacked, others began to leave. Ted O'Leary, along with Pathé cohorts Ambrose Dowling and Tom Gorman, cut their vacation short to arrange for the New York premiere of Pathé's new sound-added Godless Girl. It had been only a year since Murdoch was chasing Kennedy by phone to persuade him to join Pathé, and now they were confidants who had been through the wars together. They had emerged from the RKO negotiations a bit scathed, but much, much richer. Pathé was operating in the black, but without KAO they had lost their instant access to theaters. RKO was looking to expand their theater holdings, and William Fox was on a spending spree, rapidly accumulating the largest theater chain in the world. If Murdoch and Kennedy wanted Pathé to be a serious player, they needed theaters of their own. Murdoch still held an interest in a few theaters, and with those as a base, he and Kennedy decided to investigate putting together their own circuit. There were pockets of smaller chains unaffiliated with KAO, First National, or the major studios, and they were undergoing their own crisis. Audiences were demanding sound films, and that required an outlay of money many smaller owners simply didn't have. Even when they were able to invest, their order went on a six-month waiting list. All these factors combined to put the pressure on them to sell— so when the rumor went out that Kennedy and Murdoch were ready to buy, they didn't have to go looking. Theater owners in Texas, the Midwest, Michigan, and Illinois all came to them. Then there were the large theater palaces owned by Alexander Pantages that were reportedly on the block. With Elisha Walker's money, Kennedy planned to purchase 100 to 200 theaters throughout the country, up to $60 million worth of real estate. Pat Casey was to run the circuit. Murdoch, Casey, and Kennedy were deep into their discussions, but Joe kept being pulled away to take calls from Gloria Swanson in California, and the tone of her daily reports was taking a turn for the worse. Problems with Queen Kelly had been escalating since Joe had departed Los Angeles in early December. His protests against inhumane hours were quickly forgotten, and the daily schedules habitually ignored— Six workdays a week was the norm for studios, yet on Queen Kelly the cast and crew were routinely still on the set after midnight. Stroheim began keeping the company until two, three, and even six in the morning, and then starting again only a few hours later. It didn't take long for exhaustion to plague the entire company, and several of the crew fell sick. Everyone was tired, Paul Ivano remembered. Awful tired. Everyone, that is, but Eric von Stroheim. He alone seemed to be enjoying it. Stroheim's Teutonic tendencies frequently emerged. The cast was summoned to the set with a bugle call, and the crew informed the director all was ready by telling him the officer's attention was needed. He belittled almost anyone who questioned him, and yet considered himself the one who was put upon. He was appalled when he first saw the soldiers' helmets, screaming, I ask for silver gilt and you give me gold. Must I be a painter, too? His confidence was such that, with a straight face, he said, I am the best director in the business. And while executives such as Thalberg and Powers had come to the conclusion that vanity had sealed his fate, Gloria still trusted him. 
Slowly, however, doubt seeped in, as she watched him photograph a teacup this way, then that way, with a spoon and without a spoon, with lipstick without lipstick. While she preferred to concentrate on being the star, she could step in when she needed to. She was more than his leading lady. She was also his producer. And it fell to her to keep the peace, as he repeatedly, sometimes several times a day, sacked one of his cameramen, and Swanson rehired him. Peace was hardly the word for it when the epithets flew, but then an hour later a rapprochement would be reached and filming resumed, at least for a scene or two. Swanson continued to keep Kennedy informed, but he found it difficult to believe things were as problematic as she painted them. He had left the studio confident in LeBaron's and Glazer's ability to monitor Stroheim with an eagle eye and hold him down. Yet LeBaron's attention quickly turned to his transition to RKO. He left for New York and appointed his assistant, Louis Sarecki, to supervise Queen Kelly in his stead, which in reality meant that Glazer was left alone to watch the director every minute. Glazer might have been a very competent writer, but he had worked with Stroheim before in a subservient position, and he found it difficult, if not impossible, to stand up to him. To make matters worse, Gloria disdained weakness in others, and she had come to the conclusion she hated, loathed, and despised Glazer. If LeBaron had been unable to rein in the director, his assistant didn't have a prayer, and Glazer didn't know which way to turn. By default, it fell to E.B. Durr and Charlie Sullivan to step in, but they quickly found themselves feeling like boys at the dike, blocking one leak only to have three more break forth. There was no stopping the hemorrhaging of funds. Because of the huge quantity of statuary, Stroheim demanded, a special plaster plant was built to create columns, cupids, and statues under the supervision of experts who insisted on faithful copies of original pieces. Not only had tens of thousands of dollars been spent on costumes, but it turned out that duplicates had been made, and, in spite of Sullivan's best efforts, Western Costume Company had the order sheets to prove they weren't in the wrong. Stroheim was adamant that he was not responsible for the spiraling costs, and began sending memos to Durr documenting the inadequacies he had to endure. Dozens of people, most of whom he had personally hired, were at his beck and call, and yet Stroheim managed to find fault with almost all of them. The slow pace was due to the mistakes of everyone but himself, and he put the blame for the budget overrun on Swanson's salary and her personal publicity. It was true that there were now over fifty people on the payroll, but many of them were being kept waiting for hours on end. Charlie Sullivan declared that a magician or a crystal gazer was needed to foretell what Stroheim would complain about next— and placed the responsibility for the delays on the director's search for absolute perfection that was beyond any stretch of imagination. While Sullivan negotiated with vendors over the ever-increasing costs, Durr tried to reduce the number of scenes in the script. Filming had been allowed to begin on a script with 502 scenes, 200 fewer than LeBaron had grappled with in September, but still ludicrously over length. Durr might not have been an experienced producer, but he was learning, and, most importantly, he could do the math. The film had to be kept to ten reels, and it was already a picture and a half. On the night of December 5th, he met Stroheim and proposed various cuts. For instance, the plan to film the African scenes on Catalina Island meant higher and unpredictable expenses— and the director agreed to look for ways to shoot those scenes at the studio, using a trick water background. Durr then pointed out that the story called for two separate suicide attempts by Gloria's character. The first had her wandering to a turreted bridge and jumping in the river before a policeman came to her rescue and returned her to the convent. It had yet to be shot, and required an elaborate set that wasn't to be used again— couldn't the policeman simply pick her up outside the castle, a change that would save time and money, as well as make the later suicide attempt more dramatic? Stroheim said he would think about it, 
then decided that Kelly's jump from the bridge was a milestone that needed to be shot. In exchange, he agreed to abandon his plan to film the Queen lying in state, surrounded by hundreds of extras. These were small victories, and they didn't make a dent. While the details of the film's ending were still being slowly worked out in Vaughn's mind, Durr met privately with Glazer in an attempt to present a united front. Glazer was enthusiastic, until the director walked in. Then he melted in the face of Stroheim's insistence on his milestone scenes. Only a grand coronation was a fitting conclusion for his epic. It was a milestone. The banquet scene was a milestone. The suicide attempt was a milestone. There were so many milestones. Durr couldn't resist concluding. I wish he had one around his neck. Durr saw the script becoming increasingly convoluted, and in his frustration suggested that the only logical conclusion to the film was for Gloria's character to go into an insane asylum instead of being made queen. Believing he had done all he could on the first half of the film, Durr looked ahead to the African portion of the story, desperate to make cuts before the set decorators and the costumers ran up more bills. Glazer was working on a draft dialogue treatment for the sound version of Queen Kelly, and Durr asked him to simultaneously look for scenes to cut from the silent version. Together they reviewed the section of Stroheim's story where Kelly first arrives in Africa and found eight separate scenes that included bawdy details of drinking, gambling, dancing, and fighting, just between the time Kelly disembarks and when she arrives at the brothel. Glazer pointed out the obvious. Special precaution should be taken here with censorable mixture of whites and blacks. The blonde dancing with the buck nigger is certainly out. The fight between the United States Marine and a colored soldier over a harlot is unnecessary, as is also the homosexual inference of the two German soldiers dancing cheek to cheek. In a burst of logic, Glazer suggested that, instead of shooting these eight scenes and then throwing away the film— let us cut the scenes out now. Once again, Stroheim would only agree to think about it. Kennedy was being kept generally apprised, and he occasionally jumped in with his own ideas. When he read that the Prince of Wales was traveling to Africa, Joe asked Durr to check out the possibility of getting some shots that could be used in Queen Kelly. Durr immediately followed up with Pathé's newsreel division, but the Prince had already departed and no cameraman had accompanied him. How about something of the ship from the coastline? No, there was nothing that would meet their needs. Not willing to give up entirely, Durr asked them to search for any general newsreel footage of Africa. While they were at it, they should also look for file footage of fires, preferably German fire department film. Everyone was getting into the act. Paul Byrne suggested cuts that echoed Glazer's, but he could not resist adding a suggestion to make the characters more believable. Byrne proposed there be a time-lapse after Kelly's arrival in Africa, and we find Kelly not the resplendent, gorgeous madam, but that liquor and atmosphere have pulled her down. We must get over here, of course, that she has allowed no man to touch her. I would take it for granted that she has been drinking all along, and that when the prince arrives unexpectedly, he finds her a drunken sot. To me, that has infinitely more pathos. I think it is a mistake for the prince, who is supposed to have made a great sacrifice to come resplendent with guards and uniform on the warship. I think he should be a very simple, distraught figure, in a plain, ordinary uniform. Then I will believe that he has made a sacrifice for her. After six weeks of exhausting filming, Durr was not about to engage in a debate over the character's motivations. Realizing he was on his own, Durr decided he needed to see The Merry Widow. It was the last film of Stroheim's to make a profit, and Durr wanted to know the total footage and the exact number of title cards that appeared in each reel, as well as how many long shots, medium shots, and close-ups were used. When he couldn't find a copy of the film in Los Angeles— he wired FBO's New York office to search for a print, have an expert cutter view it, and send him the information he very urgently needed. It was a good idea. 
But after every effort was made, they couldn't find a print anywhere. In between his frustrating conferences with the director, Durr reviewed the contracts and found that it had been so long since Pat Powers had released Stroheim, an extension was needed. He also discovered that everyone's agreements covered sound and dialogue, except for Walter Byron's, and for that they had to go to Sam Goldwyn, from whom they were borrowing the actor. They might as well ask for an extension at the same time, since their current arrangement ran only until the first of the year. Durr was comfortable approaching Goldwyn directly, but he wanted Kennedy to sign off on it. He also warned Joe that if they didn't get Byron's contract straightened out quickly, they would be forced to complete all the prince's silent scenes out of order and then try to film his speaking parts in a vacuum, separate from the other actors. While he was handling these challenges at the studio, Durr was being questioned by Pat Scollard, who was sitting at his desk in New York, trying to make sense of the accounts. Why wasn't the word final appearing after any of the expenditures on the budget sheets? And then came pressure from the United Artists sales department. Did they have permission to start selling the film overseas? That was the only way to begin to recoup the money, so there was no choice but to give them the go-ahead. So far, only 700 theaters in the United States had signed contracts to screen Queen Kelly, adding up to less than $200,000 in potential income. That left a long way to go to break even. The situation might have come to a head sooner if filming had continued at FBO. But because of the RKO takeover, production was stopped, and everything moved to Pathé. The convent set, the palace's marble floors, and all the accoutrements, from fifty gold crowns to a dozen candelabras, were packed into thousands of crates for the trip from Hollywood to Culver City. The change also meant new contracts with Pathé, and this time the cost jumped from the $5,000 Gloria Productions was paying FBO to $10,000. Kennedy might be in charge of both companies, but business was business. Then there was the expense of reconstructing the sets, for which Gloria Productions reimbursed the Pathé crew's salary, plus ten percent. Meanwhile, new sets continued to be built. The move did not provide much of a breather. Retakes were filmed on Christmas Eve, and on December 26th, yet another conference was held from eight at night until 2.30 in the morning. Initially, Gloria couldn't have been more pleased with the move to Pathé, in large part because Joe had surprised her with the most elaborate bungalow in Hollywood— it was even more luxurious than Marion Davies's standalone abode at MGM, which was nicknamed the Trianon. Gloria's featured a private entrance and garage, as well as a living room large enough for a grand piano. The full kitchen and bedroom ensured her solace twenty-four hours a day. There is no indication that she was aware of the bugging system Betty Lasky says was discovered in the dressing room several years later— presumably installed during the construction. At the moment, solace was what Swanson needed, as she watched the move from FBO put Queen Kelly even more behind schedule. The original agreed-upon ten weeks was almost over, and they had yet to tackle a single scene from the second half of the story. Finally, on January 2, 1929, at nine in the morning, the cast and crew gathered at Pathé to begin filming the African sequences on a huge two-story set with a bar downstairs and a long hallway and bedrooms upstairs. Ten hours later, they had filmed one scene in the upstairs hallway. After four more full days of shooting, averaging eleven hours each, they had moved only from the upstairs hallway of the notorious resort into the aunt's bedroom. If this pace continued, they had four more months of filming in front of them. Decisions had to be made. On the first Sunday after they moved to Pathé, Durr called a meeting with Swanson and Stroheim to announce there was no more time to think about it. It was a clear case of conflicting goals. The director wanted a great, lush, extravagantly detailed epic. Gloria wanted a triumphant starring vehicle. And Durr, on Kennedy's behalf, wanted both— but with a tighter story on a reduced budget. According to the original storyline, they still had Kelly becoming queen of the bordello, 
her forced marriage to Jan and their trip through the jungle, the prince's arrival in Africa, his attempted rescue of Kelly, the two of them being tied together on an orchid-laden tree over a swamp filled with crocodiles, Jan's plunging to his death in the same swamp, the queen's death that elevates the prince to king, and, of course, the milestone coronation of His Majesty and Queen Kelly. Well, all that had changed. Durr told the director the boss had ordered him to cut the coronation and all the other excessive sequences to get it down to ten reels. Stroheim refused. After all, his entire outline had been accepted and approved months before. He was passionate that his character's motivations be realistic, and he needed time on the screen to play them out, or their actions would be reduced to pure melodrama. Stroheim's agony was real, and it must have been intensified by the awareness that he was personally pulling off a virtuoso acting job in his own daily life. Twenty-four hours a day he was a Jew pretending to be Catholic, a humble private pretending to be an aristocratic officer, torn between despising that class and yearning to be a part of it. The complexity and duplicity inherent in each of his waking hours is almost impossible to comprehend. He was also a brilliant artist, unable to fathom why others failed to appreciate his compulsion for perfection. To escape the pressure of the studio, Stroheim went to Glazer's house to work. Even Glazer was adamant that the script was much over length and should be cut to the barest essentials. Finally, Stroheim agreed. But only if the rights to everything they took out from the story reverted back to him, because... Some day this will make a great picture. Glazer knew enough to jump at the chance, and went to the telephone to place a call to Kennedy. Joe was at the dinner table, surrounded by guests, including a Catholic priest. But he had the phone brought to him, and he listened to Stroheim's proposition. By this point, Joe didn't care what it took. He just wanted the film wrapped as quickly as possible. He told the director he could have his swamp and his crocodiles and his coronations back as long as he satisfactorily completed the current film. Just finish the damn movie. Feeling confident he could have his own great picture as his next project, Stroheim promised to rewrite the end and prepare a rough cut of what had been filmed so far. Durr turned his attention to the dialogue portions that Glazer had written, but now Swanson didn't like his script any more than she liked Glazer. In search of a second opinion, she reached out to Edmund Goulding, a multi-talented bon vivant, and asked him to write his own version, or at least a new ending. The English-born Goulding had been in and out of America for the past decade, making a living as a singer, film editor, playwright, novelist, screenwriter, and director. Mentored by the likes of Francis Marion and the vaudeville star Elsie Janis, who were enthralled by Eddie's humor, attitude, and genuine talent, he had risen to direct Greta Garbo and Joan Crawford by the time he met with Swanson. Goulding lore includes tales of his brilliantly telling a story off the top of his head, being paid for it, going out to celebrate his good fortune, and awaking the next day not remembering a word. Bud Schulberg remembers him with a smile of admiration. In a land of magical bullshitters, he was the best. Eddie thrived on not being tied down, and danced between select, famous players Lasky, Fox, Warner Brothers, and MGM, where he had most recently written the script for their first all-talking and singing smash, The Broadway Melody. If he was known to be mercurial and someone who played as hard as he worked— he was also earning a reputation for bringing films in on time and under budget. Kennedy had put Goulding on Pathé's payroll back in December to write an original story for Gloria, presumably to put some pressure on Stroheim. But Goulding had turned out a treatment within a week, so he began directing screen and voice tests. He was so fast and so confident he was completing an average of twenty-five tests a week— and soon was consulting with Durr and Bill Sistrom on the next year's production schedule. Sistrom found Goulding's input so valuable, he credited him with helping to mold over half the films on the schedule. When Durr received Goulding's dialogue script, 
He did not want to be the one to choose between it and Glazer's version. To remove himself from the role of arbitrator, Durr brought in Eugene Walter, a prolific Broadway playwright who had caught the early talkie wave from New York to Hollywood, where several of his plays had been turned into movies. Gloria found Walter to be a very blasphemous character, but she agreed his help was needed. His assignment was to screen the rough cut, review both scripts, and then assess, without prejudice, where dialogue should be inserted. Two weeks after the Swanson Der Stroheim showdown over the script, they gathered again on Sunday, January 20th, to screen the assembled film. As they watched it unfold, it became obvious that while the title was Queen Kelly, Gloria's character was far from being the focus. In the midst of the scene-chewing histrionics of the Queen and the Prince, Kelly paled in comparison, and Gloria saw the picture slipping away from her. She had risen to fame as a glamorous clothes horse, draped in jewels, furs, and designer gowns, and now she found herself in a wardrobe that consisted of a novice's habit and a nighty. Sitting in the dark, Gloria sank into depression, realizing that the work of the past few weeks was utterly unrelated to the European scenes. They were rank, sordid, and ugly. Mr. von Stroheim's apocalyptic vision of hell on earth was full of material that would never pass the censors. She was worried for her image, as well as her financial commitment as a producer. Something was terribly, terribly wrong. LeBaron was gone, Glazer was useless, and the only one around at the moment she still had any respect for was E.B. Durr, and she was growing ever more resentful of the fact that Joe wasn't there with her. The next morning, Monday, January 21st, Gloria was filled with trepidation for the entire film as shooting began on her character's wedding scene. Surrounded by men and women of various colors in various stages of undress, Tully Marshall took Swanson's hand to begin the ceremony, and tobacco juice drooled from his mouth and onto her fingers. That did it. Gloria, nauseated and furious at the same time, screamed at Marshall, demanding to know how he dared do such a thing. When he calmly explained he was only doing what Stroheim had told him to do, Gloria pulled herself up to her full five feet, turned, and walked off the set. She went straight to the telephone and found Joe still basking in the Palm Beach sun. Joseph, you'd better get out here fast, she furiously informed him. Our director is a madman. Kennedy had cajoled Swanson before, but this time she was unappeasable. She detailed the most recent traumas and reminded him that he had tried to stop her from making Sadie Thompson, but that film was Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm compared with what Queen Kelly was turning into. She concluded with a question that was also an ultimatum. Are you coming out here and starting to make decisions, or aren't you? He promised to come as soon as possible, but Gloria demanded immediate action, and she got it. Only twenty minutes after she had left the set, Stroheim was called to the phone. It was Kennedy informing him he was off the picture. Joe put out a brief statement that Stroheim had been removed because of a controversy over production costs, but he remained in Palm Beach, hoping against hope that Gloria was wrong. He checked in with Durr, who concurred that it had reached the point where Kennedy alone could decide what to do next— to help formulate their course of action, Durr asked Eugene Walter to shift from reviewing the dialogue scripts and write an objective opinion of the current film instead. Swanson peeked into the screening room and saw Walter walking among the seats, pacing up and down and saying, Jesus Christ, son of a bitch, he's a paranoid. Two days later, Kennedy received a cable summarizing Walter's response to those first thirty reels. It was devastating. The director has been vulgar, gross, and fantastically impossible in the conception and execution of situations, character, incidents of narrative, and their relationships, Walter wrote. And more than that, he has utterly lost every element of human, natural characterizations. 
when it came to the African scenes. Here language fails me. I have never been so shocked and revolted. He produced the film lacking in the fundamental rudiments of story construction, and not coherent, believable in good taste, human, or acceptable from any possible angle. The production is magnificent, and the composition may be noteworthy and commanding, but in my humble opinion it is mostly gilding the manure pile. Walter's memo detailing the fiasco was six pages long, but what had to be the most distressing in terms of salvaging the film was his observation that during the entire thirty reels, Gloria never is given one situation for herself. She is either the most exasperating sap or a potential prostitute. Any third-class leading woman could play the part. Durr tried to soften the blow by telling Kennedy they were working on rewrites that might be ready to go before the camera as early as the next week. He also assured him it was the right decision to release Stroheim. If they had continued, they would have been criminally negligent in killing off Gloria as a star. Durr also warned Joe to be careful not to say anything publicly about problems with the film itself, because their only legal grounds for termination were the budget and the schedule they had agreed upon. It was his strong suggestion that Kennedy not pay the remaining $20,000 that Stroheim would be demanding. After all, he had already received $15,000 on signing his contract, $10,000 for the story, and over $40,000 for directing. Harry Eddington, still Stroheim's manager, cabled Kennedy directly to try to collect more money. Eddington was quite belligerent over the fact that Durr had not personally informed him of Stroheim's firing. Joe sent him back to Durr, who was shocked by how petty Eddington was being. But that was nothing compared to his reaction when the two men conferred in person to finalize the director's departure. Durr offered Eddington the choice of saying that the decision was mutual, or he could receive a legal notice of termination due to violation of contract. Eddington answered by asking a question. Which way do I get the most money? Kennedy knew he had to get to Culver City as soon as possible. Publicly, it was announced Queen Kelly was finishing. But questions remained. How much had been completed? Who would take over? How much had it cost so far? Speculation ran rampant, and articles appeared claiming that Stroheim had walked off the set after a quite heated argument with Durr leaving the crew and dozens of actors in the lurch. To draw attention away from Queen Kelly and on to his other various activities, Kennedy helped fan some rumors, both new and old. Was he coming to Los Angeles to meet with Alexander Pantages about purchasing his theaters? Was he buying a large interest in Universal? Was he investing in his own sound production company? Was Pathé merging with RKO after all? Denials from the other parties eventually appeared, but it was more than enough to keep everyone guessing. Kennedy added intrigue by refusing to talk to the press on the record for the moment, but promised them front-page stuff in the near future. As soon as Joe and Eddie Moore arrived at the studio, they went straight to the projection room, where, sitting alongside Durr, they watched the film Stroheim had edited. Joe's worst fears were confirmed. He had been so enthusiastic about the rushes he had seen two months before, but the results on the screen in front of him forced him to confront a new reality. What had appeared as brilliant in snippets was now a perverse fairy tale, complete with a wicked queen, a handsome prince, and Tully Marshall's ogre. The real star of the film was the sets and the costumes. There was Cena Owen as the queen— awakening to guzzle champagne in a huge round bed, encircled on the base and on the canopy above with dozens of sculptured cherubs. In spite of prohibition, Stroheim had insisted on real champagne on this and every scene where it was poured to ensure the proper spirit. When Owen wasn't walking around naked with a precariously placed white cat, she was in fabulous furs, 
Catching the prince and Kelly together, the queen grabs one of the half-dozen whips that just happen to be hanging near the door, orders the prince arrested, and lashes out at Kelly, chasing her down the ornate staircase and out the marble foyer, yelling, via title cards, "'He's mine! Mine! Mine!' As Walter concluded, the queen, with soap bubbles at her mouth indicating rage, can do nothing more than cause gales of laughter from any normal audience, providing the censors didn't remove her from the picture first. Stroheim had built up the characters of the queen and the prince to the point that Swanson was in fewer than half the scenes. The twenty-nine-year-old Gloria was supposed to be a radiant teenage virgin, yet her penciled eyebrows and false eyelashes belied that, and she looked downright dowdy in her nightgown under a bulky overcoat. This was the film that Stroheim had claimed would give Gloria a range of characterizations unprecedented in her screen careers. Swanson was in her bungalow when Kennedy rushed in, cursing Stroheim and LeBaron and Glazer. Stopping abruptly, he slumped into a deep chair. He turned away from me, struggling to control himself. He held his head in his hands, and little high-pitched sounds escaped from his rigid body like those of a wounded animal whimpering in a trap. Finally, Joe composed himself to the point he could talk, but all he said was, I've never had a failure in my life. When he stood up again, he was ashen, and went into another searing rage at the people who had let this happen. Then he yanked me into his arms, and soon my face was wet with his tears. Kennedy had experienced failures, but nothing this public or personal. He had been able to veil his loss of First National as a point of principle over his control. But what was he to do with this fiasco that the press had been following unabated for a year? According to Joe, it was Gloria who was prostrate in anger and anxiety. He wrote Henri that when he arrived in Los Angeles, he found Gloria in very bad shape in the hospital as the result of practically a nervous collapse. She was down to 108 in weight, and her attitude towards the picture and everybody connected with it was quite hostile. While Kennedy's report was from that moment, and Gloria's was in retrospect, they both had other agendas when they wrote their accounts, and there is little doubt each exaggerated the situation. Yet in neither version is there even a hint of self-reflection. Joe only questioned the people he had trusted to execute his orders, was furious at LeBaron and Glazer for deceiving him, and didn't want to see any of them again. The thought that any of this was his own fault doesn't seem to have occurred to him. He had simply been betrayed. Both Gloria and Joe were also partially right as well. Individually, they were frustrated— Furious and, of course, scared. Then, to add insult to Kennedy's injury, Swanson received a letter from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences informing her that Sadie Thompson had earned her a nomination as Best Actress under their new awards program. Two weeks later, Film Daily named Sadie Thompson one of the ten best films of the year. The movie, to which Kennedy had sold the rights— based on his unquestionable assumption that he and Gloria would create something much greater and more important, was now being hailed all over again. Any mutual support gave way to bitter accusations. Joe reminded Gloria how much money had been spent, who had loaned most of that money, and who owed it to him one way or another. In a fury, she looked around for someone else to turn to, and, since she couldn't very well run to Joe Schenck, she turned to the producer she had once viewed as evil personified, Jesse Lasky. He wasn't about to cross Kennedy or touch any of Gloria's financial woes. He had been burned once, and since she had left him over four years before, she had completed only two films. It is difficult to imagine why Gloria would think Lasky would want to work with her again, given their history— and when Joe learned of their meeting, he exploded. They had a drastic showdown. But when the smoke cleared, they were still in it together. 
They knew that they risked losing not only money, but the prestigious reputations they had both worked so hard to attain. It was in their best interest to put a positive public face on the situation, while privately looking for a new solution. That same winter, Douglas Fairbanks was grappling with a similar situation, having just spent almost a million dollars on the swashbuckling epic The Iron Mask. In order to take advantage of both theaters that were wired for sound and those that weren't, Fairbanks recorded a talking prologue to introduce each act, leaving the picture itself essentially a silent film. It was a compromise, to say the least, but the Iron Mask did manage to bring in $1.5 million at the box office. Kennedy couldn't decide what to do. As all this drama was being played out behind closed doors, United Artists was in its seventh month of promising that millions will be charmed by Queen Kelly, and urging theater owners to book it immediately. Unaware anything serious was amiss, UA kept asking for more pictures from the set to inspire their publicity department. Kennedy was careful to continue a dialogue with Joe Schenck, and even helped him with financial reorganizing at United Artists, but he wasn't about to share his problems with anyone. When they moved from FBO, expenditures had already exceeded $700,000. Only $50,000 of that had gone to pay Gloria, $15,000 less than had been paid to Stroheim for his story and direction. The sets and costumes alone had cost over a quarter of a million dollars, Yet Kennedy had to admit that the money was there on the screen, in the gowns, uniforms, and incredibly detailed sets. He had to find a way to save at least part of this film. With all his experience, Kennedy had never made a film, or dealt directly with talent before, and a multitude of decisions lay ahead. For instance, much care had been given to Stroheim's contract to ensure that bonus payments were made only if he stayed on schedule. But the actors had been signed on to run-of-filming contracts, and they remained on salary even though they hadn't been working for weeks. After almost six months of being paid for the services of Walter Byron, Sam Goldwyn decided he needed the actor back, pronto. There was one small bit of good news— MGM wanted to borrow Tully Marshall, and were willing to pay $1,000 a day for three days of work. Durr, along with Walter and Glazer, had been in intensive script meetings, seeking a story with characters who had more than one dimension, in which Gloria was no longer a whimpering sap, and the prince had motivations beyond his desire to conquer a virgin. They now proposed that instead of inserting dialogue in the middle of the African sequence, they open the film in Africa, where Kelly's aunt runs a bar with dance girls and gambling, but not prostitutes. Kelly would then be sent to a convent in Germany, which would allow them to lace in the old scenes with the prince and film new ones to establish their characters and palliate her eventual seduction. It was decided that if Jan— the repulsive cripple on crutches with slimy mouth-spitting tobacco juice, survived as a character, Kelly would not marry him. The entire film was to be rewritten and disinfected. Before they could move ahead, they had to find a new director. While Kennedy tended to keep everything as private as possible, Swanson was just the opposite. Before she had met Joe and was facing her potentially disastrous financial crisis— she had sought advice indiscriminately, and now she repeated that pattern in seeking a solution to Queen Kelly. She reached out to half a dozen directors, including her old friends Mickey Nealon, Raoul Walsh, and Alan Dwan. But she hung her highest hopes on Eddie Goulding. She wanted him to pick up where Stroheim had left off. But after Eddie screened the accumulated reels of Queen Kelly and read through all the scripts again— he pronounced the film hopeless. His advice was to shelve it, but whatever they decided, he told them in no uncertain terms that he didn't want anything to do with it. Unable by nature to kowtow, Goulding didn't even try to say nice things about the movie, but Kennedy and Swanson had no time to be offended because he immediately suggested that he write and direct something totally different for Gloria, 
a light-hearted talkie that could be finished by the end of the summer. The way Eddie presented it, everyone would win. Gloria would be back on the big screen, United Artists would have a film to distribute, and Kennedy would be given time to decide what to do with Queen Kelly. Desperate for a solution, they agreed that Goulding should get to work on a new script as soon as possible. Eddie envisioned a three-way partnership, but his attorney, Fanny Holtzman, was in London. No problem, Joe assured him. Eddie would stay on his Pathé contract for now, and the rest could be worked out later. Kennedy went to work putting a wedge between Queen Kelly and Stroheim. Joe's heavy hand was apparent in the negative pieces about the director that began appearing in the trades, alongside positive mentions of Kennedy's tolerance. One of the more blatant was Film Weekly's summation, It is so sad about Eric von Stroheim. The kind-hearted producers have done everything they could to help him turn over a new leaf. When, by all rights, they could have spanked him and sent him home to mother in disgust, they have found it in their hearts time and again to forgive. The article doubled the number of reels filmed and gave details that practically repeated the Eugene Walter memo verbatim. Stroheim had his defenders. The actress Louise Brooks was adamant that Stroheim was the one pure visual genius of film, and it was those two vulgarians, Kennedy and Swanson, who really destroyed Eric. The director Clarence Brown thought highly of his talent, but acknowledged Stroheim thought of every scene as a five-reeler. In the end, Stroheim went quietly. But when he eventually recorded his own defense, he painted himself as the victim, and almost as constitutionally incapable of self-reflection as Kennedy or Swanson. The director claimed any stories of friction on the set were entirely fictitious, and he placed the blame for invented stories of internal strife on the scandal-mongers. He said there was no other reason for stopping the film than the advent of sound. In his version, he had finished the first part, when Kennedy and Swanson saw the jazz singer. On the spot, they decided it was the death nail for silent films, and therefore reasoned it was better to stop the film then and there. Stroheim was right when he described the producers as panic-stricken over sound— but his protestations ring hollow, since the jazz singer opened in October of 1927, over a year before the cameras had started to roll on Queen Kelly. Kennedy faced other pressures besides Queen Kelly, the most immediate being personnel issues. He could always find slots for the gang for whom his own interests were their raison d'etre, Durr, Scollard, Sullivan, and more. Ted O'Leary and Ted Strybert were still in New York, covering Kennedy's other bases. Steve Fitzgibbon had been with Kennedy since the earliest days of RCNE and Columbia Advertising, and while he had never made it to the innermost circle, he was on Pathé's payroll as a production manager. Johnny Ford had continued as general manager of KAO after the RKO purchase, but he left in the spring of 1929. Joe was more than willing to find a place for him at Pathé, but Ford wanted to return home to Boston to run the enlarged Maine, New Hampshire theater circuit. Ford based himself in the Metropolitan Theater on Tremont Street. There he was also available to look after Kennedy's other New England interests. It was time to make decisions about the other executives who had come into his employ, such as Calvin Brown, Paul Byrne, Harry Eddington, Arthur Poole, and Barney Glazer. The LeBaron Burn Glazer fight for power had been alleviated somewhat by LeBaron's decision to go with RKO as their head of production. Burn and Glazer continued to butt heads, but after several months of back and forth, Burn resigned, publicly complaining that he was supposed to be production chief, but several other executives appear to have similar authority. Barney Glazer was shifted to writing dialogue for sound films and out of Gloria's way. Harry Eddington's rising star had crashed with Stroheim's firing. Joe didn't think he was wholeheartedly on our team. So Eddington promised to retire as a business administrator and devote himself exclusively to Pathé. However, Durr didn't want anything to do with him, so Eddington decided to take a long vacation to think about his future. 
Arthur Poole, on the other hand, had proved his loyalty and was promoted to the role of Pathé's comptroller. Kennedy sent Calvin Brown to Europe to assess sound film's progress there and to corral Pathé's stock that was in foreign hands. Other studios were facing other challenges. FBO RKO was still struggling after over a year of delivering and installing sound equipment. They had loudly proclaimed themselves the first all-sound studio, but successfully recording on location remained a challenge. With no westerns on their upcoming schedule, Tom Tyler's Horses, Flashlight and King, Bob Steele's Black Beauty and Babe, as well as Buzz Barton's Rags, were all put up for sale. Any films featuring animals were complicated because trainers could no longer give voice commands. So most of the dogs who had been so dependable at the box office were retired to their kennels. Flash, Ranger, Strongheart, and others were all off the screen, and only Warner Brothers' Rin Tin Tin stayed in front of the camera and the microphone. There were tribulations of a different sort over at MGM, where Irving Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer were shocked to learn that their company was being sold out from under them. Nick Schenk, Joe's brother, who had taken over for Marcus Lowe when the corporate chief passed away the year before, had gone behind their backs to sell his and the Lowe family's shares to William Fox. Thalberg had been appalled by how much time Mayer had been spending away from the studio campaigning for Herbert Hoover for president. Yet Mayer was able to raise the specter of monopoly with Hoover's Justice Department and stave off the Fox purchase of MGM. In comparison, Pathé was looking relatively calm, and Kennedy was convinced they had an excellent program lined up for the next year. He announced he was proceeding with a dialogue version of Queen Kelly, adapted from Eric von Stroheim's original story, and confirmed that Gloria was not only to talk, but to sing as well. Paul Stein, an Austrian who had written plays with Max Reinhardt and was already under contract at Pathé, was named the new director, with the explanation that, since he was European, he was uniquely qualified to film a story with a German setting. Camera work was scheduled to begin in the immediate future, and the picture was to be in theaters by late summer. Between his plans for Queen Kelly and Goulding working on his story for Gloria, Kennedy finally felt he was on track with a plan of action. He had been in California for five weeks, and he had not seen his children for almost three months. So when he received word that his 71-year-old father was in the hospital in Boston, Gloria could hardly blame Joe for leaving. She was gaining back some of the weight she had lost during the height of her Stroheim crisis, and her normal, more cheerful mood had returned. By the time Kennedy, along with Eddie Moore and E.B. Durr, boarded the train on March 7, 1929, Joe and Gloria were feeling much better about their relationship, both personally and professionally. Once again, it looked like blue skies ahead. Chapter 21 Give Our Love to Gloria Summer 1929 Pathé was suddenly a blaze of activity. The skeleton staff of the previous month was supplemented by dozens of new personnel, busy with pre-production on a variety of films. Contract players who had passed the first round of sound tests were in and out of vocal classes, and having Gloria Swanson at the studio added a prestige that had been missing since Cecil B. DeMille's departure. On the back lot, the Queen Kelly Convent Chapel and Dormitory, Music Room, Library, and Hallway sets were all being reconstructed. The latest scenario called for merging the most elaborate scenes into a story that took place entirely in the German kingdom— Tully Marshall's tobacco-drooling Jan was eliminated. A choir director from Kelly's convent was the prince's rival for her affections, and a local police commissioner, her bête noire. While dialogue was used intermittently, music was to be laced throughout, and the film opened with Swanson singing in the convent choir and soloing on Ave Maria. Optimism reigned. The new opening wouldn't take more than a week to shoot— 
and the plan was to have both a silent and a sound version ready in six weeks. It would cost another $200,000, but at the moment that seemed reasonable. Under the direction of Paul Stein, the cameras began to roll on April 1st, with Gloria and two dozen young women as the convent choir. Nine days later, however, it was apparent that the new film was too drastically different from the earlier version to merge into anything close to acceptable. To further complicate matters, Gloria had decided she didn't like the new ending. It called for her to fade out with tears in her eyes, pulled between her love for the prince and her devotion to the convent and its choir director. Between the inadequate sound portion and Gloria's dissatisfaction, it was decided once again to put Queen Kelly on hiatus. New writers were assigned, and Glazer was given the task of supervising the cutting of sixteen crates of film down to five reels, about an hour-long movie, for Kennedy to view before deciding on the next step, build it up into a full-length silent film, add dialogue, or scrap the misfit entirely. From the East Coast, all Joe could do was hope that Glazer had a magic wand and that Goulding was writing one fabulous script. Once given the go-ahead, Goulding took off as only he could. He was effusive in his excitement over the new dramatic value dialogue and sound effects brought to his storytelling, and he included Gloria in everything. He said his secret of working with strong actresses was to make them partners, consult with them, ask their opinions, learn their tastes and preferences, lead them, but lead them as partners, not dependents. Gloria certainly responded to his style, and their relationship became one of those rare collaborations where each person brought something unique and necessary to the table. In this case, literally to Gloria's kitchen table, where Eddie, Gloria, and Laura Hope Cruz sat pounding out the story. Laura was an actress and an old friend of Goulding's, and he claimed there was no one in the world with a better ear for the spoken word. Swanson decided that Goulding was akin to Charlie Chaplin in his ability to master any subject or skill in record time. There was nothing he couldn't do in the creative world, but the problem was to get him to put it on paper. He needed somebody to regulate the flow of his ideas. And that's where Gloria and Laura came in. Swanson was there to mold her character and highlight her own abilities— while Cruz worked on the segues between Eddie's gems of ideas for individual scenes. A secretary was added to their menage, and within days Laura moved into one of Gloria's guest rooms for the duration. One minute the three of us praised each other, the next we fought like savages, and the demure stenographer took it all down. Script dialogue, gossip, arguments, and sandwich orders, was how Swanson summed up their marathon sessions. When she and Laura became too much for Eddie, he would hide himself in the bathroom until Gloria went around through the backyard and knocked on the window to force him to come out. Yet, if it was a bit chaotic, they made excellent progress, and Gloria was having a wonderful time. She and Goulding shared a dry sense of humor, and he managed to dote on her while poking fun at the same time. For her thirtieth birthday, which could have been traumatic, to say the least, Eddie regaled her with over a dozen separately delivered telegrams, some within minutes of each other. "'Isn't she popular? What a lot of telegrams!' one of them read, and his exuberance blended with adoration was appreciated by Swanson. Their script was ready within a month, and Eddie came up with a title, The Trespasser. Gloria was to play a poor, honest secretary to a big Chicago lawyer who is swept off her feet by a rich man's son. Cut to a married and secretly pregnant Gloria singing, I love you truly, before walking out when her new husband keels to his father's wishes to have the marriage annulled. She tries to raise the child on her own, and then her old employer steps in to help. When he dies, he leaves her a fortune— fanning the flames of gossip. Tragedy looms at every turn, and multiple heartstrings are pulled over a threatened custody battle. But there is the proverbial happy ending. 
In between, Gloria's character was to sing several songs and leave those dreaded convent clothes behind. In The Trespasser, she showed off no fewer than ten evening gowns, stunning jewelry, and luxurious furred capes. In casting the film, they looked at a young actor who had been on the Broadway stage and already been tested at MGM, where the casting director said that his large ears reminded him of a giant sugar bowl. Though Swanson was impressed with Clark Gable, she thought he looked like a truck driver and spoke like a private eye and she needed someone at home in a white tie and tails. Instead, they cast Connecticut-born and bred Robert Ames, who had already made a talkie, and Gable would have to wait a little longer before landing featured roles in The Secret Six and Dance Fools Dance to catch movie audiences' collective eye. The men of United Artists were not at all pleased with the title The Trespasser. In his first letter of complaint, Al Lichtman called it the transgressor by mistake, and when he was corrected, he said he thought they were both equally bad. U.A. was unanimous that it was not easy to pronounce or easy to remember, and it had nothing to do with the story. Kennedy said he was happy to hear new suggestions, but the trespasser it stayed. Back in New York, Kennedy read the trespasser script out loud to Ted O'Leary, and we both cried tears of relief. Joe needed something to feel positive about. His confidence was further boosted when he consolidated his power at Pathé by being elected chairman of the board of directors. His salary of $2,000 a week was to continue, and he was given an option on another 100,000 shares at $7.50 a share. 20,000 shares were to be bought shortly after signing the agreement but the remaining 80000 could be purchased at any time over the two years. Once his new Pathé agreement was signed, Joe began chafing to return to California. But his father was still hospitalized with a degenerative liver disease, and so Kennedy was in and out of Boston, assuming the end was near. Another death was looming, one of a friendship. Guy Courier had had it. It had been less than four years since he had agreed to back Kennedy in his pursuit of FBO, and as Joe's name appeared with increasing regularity in the trades and in the national press, Courier had remained in the background. Yet the public coverage that Kennedy coveted was one of the sources of Courier's suspicions. Guy had continued to defend Joe to his friends, whose concerns were deeper than their anti-Catholic bigotry. They questioned the stories that whirled concerning how Kennedy had made his money and the conduct of his private life. When pushed, Courier would say, Joe's all right until he gets to believing his own publicity. And Kennedy had clearly been believing it for some time. It had been six months since Guy had told him he wanted out, and four months since they sold FBO. However, the Gower Street Company still had over half a million dollars' worth of holdings, and cinema credits remained an ongoing concern. Courier wanted to continue with some of his film-related activities. He was on the new FBO board of directors as a part of RKO, and he was working on labor relations with Will Hayes and Joe Schenck. He also looked forward to pursuing other interests— such as expanding his library and spending time with his family at his villa in Italy and his summer home in New Hampshire. Courier's patience was at an end. Kennedy kept hedging, so Guy turned the tables and offered to buy him out. Again, Joe asked for more time, but Courier had an answer for that, too. He sent over an agreement to be signed immediately for a sale to take place in nine months— stating he would buy Joe's remaining 155 shares of Gower Street common stock for a minimum of $298,505.29. It even stipulated that any profits from Joe's separate deal for Moon of Israel, which had been placed in the Gower Street Company, would continue to flow to him. Kennedy knew he was up against the wall. Until now, Courier had kept his own counsel regarding his concerns about Kennedy— but how long could that last? Still, Joe rebuked Guy for his proposal and accused him of calling his note 
as if he were a debtor no longer to be trusted. Courier's response was that of a man exhausted with playing games. Fine, he said, don't sign the agreement. Sign this letter instead. Courier replaced the impeccably legal five pages with a one-page letter effectively saying the same thing. On January 2nd, 1930, I will buy and you will sell your half of the stock in the Gower Street Company at its actual liquidating value. This time there was no minimum amount listed, but if there was a difference in opinion, an accounting firm was named to arbitrate. In the meantime, neither of them would sell their stock without consent of the other. Courier closed the letter with the gentlemanly agreement that my representatives on the board of directors shall act as if charged with a trust for the benefit of all the stockholders. The letter was hand-delivered to Joe, who, seeing no other alternative, signed it on May 6, 1929. Now, more than ever, Kennedy wanted to head west. But, as he told Henri, his father's illness was dragging on. P.J. appeared to rally during the second week of May, and Joe was confident he had plenty of time for a trip to the coast. Yet, within hours of disembarking in Los Angeles, he received the call telling him his father had died. According to Rose, Joe was in a sea of despair, racked with guilt over leaving his father's bedside, and it was a source of painful regret all his life. Yet instead of returning for the funeral, Joe stayed in Hollywood. More than a thousand other people, however, filled the Church of St. John the Evangelist in Winthrop to overflowing. P.J. had left public life long ago, but he was still widely beloved, and one of the reasons was epitomized by his request to his daughters during his final hospital stay. Over the years he had loaned or simply given money from his own pocket when he saw it was needed, and he asked them to burn the papers he kept in his desk at home. Alan Goodrich, the historian at the John F. Kennedy Library, assumes that it was because P.J. didn't want anyone, most likely his son, finding records of unpaid loans and trying to collect on them. Notes of sympathy poured in from acquaintances and film industry colleagues, and Joe responded with cables of appreciation, often including a variation on the line, The burden is lighter because of friends like you. The cables were all billed to Pathé. There is no question about the depth of Joe's respect for his father, or his regret at his inability to be two places at the same time. I was terribly disappointed not to be there myself. Kennedy wrote Joe Jr., now thirteen, after hearing lovely reports of his conduct at the funeral. I was more than proud to have you there as my own representative. He told his family he hoped to return soon after, I have finished the job I came out to do. Yet in contrast to his other Los Angeles arrivals, when he had to invigorate a studio, confront DeMille, or deal with an out-of-control production, Joe found a smoothly functioning pathé and a film about to go before the cameras. While it was reported that he was in town to make a final decision on Queen Kelly, his initial attention turned to the trespasser and his star. The difference between a Stroheim set and a Goulding set was night and day. After two weeks of tests and rehearsals, shooting began on June 3rd at the time called. Their workdays averaged nine hours, but they usually didn't start until eleven in the morning and regularly broke for tea at four in the afternoon. In his uniform of silk scarf, blue blazer and light pants. Goulding was dapper, yet casual, and always bubbling with ideas. When friends such as Noel Coward dropped by, they were welcomed, and if Goulding drank and partied excessively after hours, and he did, he was the picture of professionalism at the studio. Sound might have intimidated others, but it was made for Eddie Goulding. His stage experience, musical talents, and general faith in himself— all came together to blossom under the challenges of talking and singing pictures. The Trespasser was written with the use of sound at the very core of the story, not as a silent film with sound added as an afterthought. 
Goulding was allowed free reign, and his quick, if manic, decision-making process was exemplified by his search for music for Gloria to sing. Songs were used to set a tone and move the story along, not just to be inserted to buy time or show off talent. He wired his friend, the Welsh composer and performer Ivor Novello, asking for world rights to his song, Bless You. But the scene was to be shot two days later, and not hearing back, Eddie decided to compose his own song. The only problem was he couldn't write music. So when Goulding whistled an original tune Gloria and Laura loved, several frantic phone calls were made before a musician was found to come to the house and put the notes down on paper. His old friend Elsie Janis wrote the lyrics, and the song, Love Your Spell Is Everywhere, was created. One day on the set, while Goulding was busy filming, Eddie Moore showed up with a sheath of papers under his arm. Joe wants these signed, he said as he handed Goulding a pen and held the papers out in front of him. What is it? Eddie asked, still focusing on the actors and the cameras. We are publishing the song, replied Moore, and Goulding, visualizing the money pouring into his pocket, happily signed the documents without reading them. When Scollard reviewed the World Rights Contract for Love, he noticed that William Sistrom had signed as the seller and Goulding had signed as the purchaser. Scollard asked Sullivan to have both men initial the contract to acknowledge the mistake. So much for Goulding's concentration when it came to legal papers. Charlie Sullivan had been the last of the gang to leave RKO, where he had been a vice president and studio manager. All along he had continued, in his spare time, to serve Kennedy and Gloria Productions, and now, after a brief trip to Boston, he was given a new office at Pathé in Culver City. He was put in charge of the business end of all production, and while he kept tabs on every film, the trespasser quickly became his focus. He and Durr had learned the painful day-to-day -day realities of producing on Queen Kelly, and now they put that knowledge to work. Along with Pat Scollard, they handled everything from making sure the continuity and dialogue sheets corresponded to the film, to negotiating the payment schedules and overseeing distribution plans. With Kennedy's approval, they later arranged private screenings for influential friends, such as James Quirk, publisher of Photoplay, as well as Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst. Sullivan also took the brunt of the requests for studio visits from friends of Kennedy's or friends of friends and, frequently, friends of Mayor Fitzgerald's. Honey Fitz had talked so much about being an owner of a studio that it seemed everyone he knew who was visiting California wanted a personal tour. Sullivan was amazed at how many personal friends of Mr. Kennedy there were, whom he had never heard of before but he handled most of the intrusions with an easy grace. While he knew to draw the line when they started inquiring about employment, it was all part of the job. From New York, Pat Scollard oversaw the making of the trailer, learning as he went from the men at the lab who compiled it and the UA publicity people who picked their favorite scenes. E.B. Durr became the key man on publicity for The Trespasser, working with Gloria's publicist, Lance Heath, reviewing still photographs, poster ideas, and the press book. While Kennedy signed off on the final posters, it was Durr who was responsible for seeing that everything was of the proper caliber and moved along efficiently. He was also the liaison with United Artists, ensuring they had everything they needed to promote the film, and he supervised plans to syndicate the story in newspapers when the time came. Durr was becoming so detail-oriented that he even personally measured the back windows of various town cars to see which would be best for superimposing images. For the outdoor and panoramic scenes, he once again turned to Pathé's newsreel division. He sent the relevant portions of the script to the headman in Chicago, and then talked to him on the phone to fine-tune exactly what was needed. The silent scenes were relatively easy, but another sound truck had to be sent to Chicago since the two they had been using were out of service. The new truck arrived with flat tires, and after they were replaced, engineering problems developed. 
Permits were required, but the truck was ready and the police had been dealt with in time for a Saturday morning attempt to film the lakefront. However, weekend visitors made the shore too crowded, so they had to wait until early Monday morning. Most of the remaining background material was simply shot mute, and still it took another week to complete the long and medium shots of Lakeshore Drive Apartments, Michigan Boulevard, and a bird's-eye view of the city from the 36th floor of the Tribune Building. The newsreel photographers and soundmen had it a little easier in New York, because all they needed were shots in front of the plaza. The hotel was cooperative, but the police were not about to block off the street. So the sound trucks were ready, just as the sun rose, to record the doorman blowing his whistle, a taxi with squeaking brakes, and general traffic and noises, before the real traffic took over. The newsreel division was instructed to build the studio only for extraordinary expenses, and absorb the rest. Durr reviewed every inch of film, and was pleased with everything except the background shots to be superimposed in those car windows. They had been taken from a rooftop, and so didn't align to the viewpoint of a passenger in the car. He ordered them redone. All this support helped Goulding turn out the film quickly, but a large part of the credit went to the innovations he created as he went along. His sets walked into each other, so the actors could move from room to room, while the cameras, sometimes over a dozen operating simultaneously, recorded every move from every direction. Microphones were stationary, but everywhere. The setup allowed Goulding and his cinematographers, George Barnes and Greg Toland, to shoot scenes lasting up to ten minutes each. Because of the intricate planning, what normally would have taken three days was completed in one afternoon. More film was used, but it tightened the editing process. The trespasser finished ahead of schedule and under budget, wrapping on July 5th after only 21 days and setting a new record for sound films. As writer and director, Goulding collected $45,000, Gloria received $50,000, and even with the padded costs from Path A for the crew, set construction, and recording facilities, as well as adding $25,000 in executive overhead for Kennedy and Eddie Moore, the trespasser price tag came to $725,000 for both a silent and sound version. Joe also received his $2,000 a week salary from Path A, as well as billing them for his expenses when he was in Los Angeles which averaged $1,000 a week. Kennedy might have been down to one company, but he was going to let the world know about it as he oversaw a massive promotion of Pathé's 25th anniversary. Full-page ads in the trades and major sections in both Variety and Exhibitors Herald World featured Kennedy's name in bold print. Reiterating Pathé's history of firsts, First newsreel, first use of color, first serials, first hour gang comedies, and so on, Kennedy promised that the company was and would continue to be as virile and aggressive as its trademark rooster. Feeling virile and aggressive himself, Joe appeared more solicitous than ever toward Gloria. He was proud of her luxurious star bungalow, an outward and visible sign of her unparalleled rank, and was more than comfortable making himself at home there. For all the restrictions the gang had put on Swanson's spending, she was hardly being deprived. She even had her own personal masseuse. Sylvia Ulbeck was Hollywood's masseuse to the stars, and her client list included Marie Dressler, Ronald Coleman, and Norma Shearer. Massage was all the rage for fitting into a specific costume, general health, and relaxation— it was so popular that many of the most successful in the film business had designated massage rooms in their homes. When Gloria expressed an interest in signing Sylvia to an exclusive contract, the masseuse was tempted, but declined, because she had rebuilt her clientele after an unhappy exclusive experience with the petulant May Murray several years before. But it was Sylvia whom Gloria wanted, so Joe stepped in. He was impressed when she spotted his flat feet within minutes of meeting him, and he cut a compromise deal. 
Sylvia would have her own bungalow at Pathé to service the more important personnel, including executives, in order of priority. Gloria, needless to say, was first on the list. If she called, anyone else was to be left on the slab. Sylvia was free to see other clients during her off hours. For this, she was to receive $750 a week, more than most of the featured players, and certainly more than many executives, including E.B. Durr. The proven stage actresses Ina Clare and Anne Harding signed Pathé contracts that spring to great acclaim, yet it wouldn't have occurred to anyone to contest Gloria's standing as the undisputed star of the lot. That is, until Constance Bennett arrived in Culver City. Gloria later said she was the one who suggested to Joe that he consider signing the beautiful slim blonde who showed up everywhere with Hollywood's fast set. That at least had been the case back in the early 1920s, when Bennett was making films for Sam Goldwyn and MGM. But she had left Hollywood abruptly in 1925 after marrying Philip Plant, the heir to a railroad and shipping fortune. The couple moved to Europe and appeared in all the finest watering holes. But by early 1929 they had separated, and Constance let it be known she was ready to go back to work. Since she was in Paris... Joe sent Henri to investigate her interest in Pathé. It was apparent that Constance wanted more than a contract. She wanted the Marquis as well. If Henri knew about his wife's affair with Kennedy at this point, he wasn't saying anything. In their letters, Joe and Henri continued to treat each other with affable respect. Kennedy asked his opinion on various business questions and kept him abreast of Pathé's and Gloria's work. Joe implied Rose was with him when she wasn't. But if Henri knew he was being cuckolded, he chose the civilized reaction of turning his head the other way while holding it high. Yet he was not about to resist the beguiling Bennett. He signed her and bedded her and then sent her off to Hollywood in the middle of April 1929. Gloria might have known nothing about Constance's relationship with Henri, but her general suspicions had to have been aroused when she first ran into her, not at the studio, but at Kennedy's house on Rodeo Drive. Gloria walked in to find Constance leaning against the banister, smoking a cigarette. And while Gloria made small talk, she found her laconic answers meant either that she was embarrassed to be seen there, or that I had put her off by being so much at home. She reminded me of Frances Marion's great line about typical Hollywood females. I don't know why she doesn't like me. I never did anything for her. Gloria asked her if she was staying for dinner, and when she said no, Gloria went into the library, leaving Constance in the foyer. By the time Joe came bouncing down the stairs, Constance had left, but Gloria noted that Kennedy was in a particularly chipper mood. Trying to be nonchalant, Gloria asked him what Constance was doing at the house, and Joe told her, going out with one of the boys. He then volunteered with a wink and a laugh. She couldn't hook the boss, so she settled for one of the boys. With that, they went in to dinner. According to William Dufty, Gloria always assumed that, at some point, Kennedy slept with Constance, but it wouldn't be until later that she discovered that one of the boys Joe was referring to was her own husband. Constance Bennett's first film for Pathé, Rich People, had to be postponed for several weeks because, in contrast to most stars who had spent time traveling, Constance needed to put on some weight before she went before the cameras. Since their initial meeting at Joe's house, she and Gloria behaved cordially to each other in public, and when they were brought together again at Joe's home for a dinner he hosted, where the other guests included Laura Hope Cruz and Sylvia, the masseuse, who would be needed to help get Constance in shape. Yet to keep peace on the lot, Kennedy had Sylvia go to Constance's apartment for her treatments. If others noticed the chill between the two stars that summer, and they did, Gloria's preeminence was not about to be seriously challenged. Constance might have quietly had the marquee on a string, but Gloria had the head of the studio, and, at least until the end of June, he was in residence in California. 
Keeping it from Gloria, Joe posed for a portrait of himself that he proudly presented to her, assuming she would hang it in her home. More appropriate for the hall of a men's club, it pictured him as he wanted to see himself, she told her daughter, the strong, powerful film mogul, capable of handling whatever came his way. She wasn't about to display the portrait over her mantle, but Joe and Gloria's affair had been going on for well over a year and had reached the level of Hollywood common knowledge. She could talk about how discreet she was, but too many people from that time have tales to tell to believe it was much of a secret. In letters and cables, friends and colleagues told Joe to give our love to Gloria or remember me kindly to Miss Swanson, further evidence of their renown as a couple. Joe was proud of his relationship with her and wanted others to know about it. He immersed himself in Gloria's life and was particularly conspicuous strutting around the party he hosted at her house following her son's baptism. Since their first meeting, Kennedy had been bothered by the fact that the boy, now seven, had never been christened, and Gloria agreed to go through with the ceremony. Joe made all the arrangements, which included his own role as godfather. Brother, as the child continued to be called at home, had been named Joseph after Gloria's father at the time of his adoption. Now, at Joe's urging, he was given the middle name of Patrick, mimicking Kennedy's own first and middle names. Though the child was clearly too old to have been his biological son, Joe made sure the many Hollywood people, including Alan Dwan, Winfield Sheehan, and Lois Wilson, who were all at the party, knew of the boy's new name. It underscored his importance to Gloria, and fanned rumors still repeated today that Kennedy and Swanson had a child. One of the friends who accompanied Gloria and Joe on their nights on the town was Sport Ward, and during a quiet moment he leaned over to Gloria and said, You have to take your hex off this poor man. Joe was clearly proud of being with her, but at the same time, Ward felt the constant tension between the two of them. You had to be an idiot not to know they were together as a couple. Joe and Gloria were frequent guests at other people's homes as well, including J.J. Murdoch's. He had purchased a large estate on Foothill Boulevard, only a few blocks from their homes on Rodeo and Crescent. Murdoch's mansion was a resplendent example of the intersection of an abundance of money and exquisite taste. The three-story house featured arched entryways and a plethora of beautifully wallpapered bedrooms and sitting rooms. The piece de resistance, however, was below the ground. One-third of what in other homes would be a large basement was a spa and exercise area, including a steam room with walls, ceiling, and floors, all tiled in a soft yellow. There was also a ballroom that featured a stage and built-in projector. To the left of the stairs was a billiard room and a full-size bar area, complete with a private still. Outwardly, Murdoch was the antithesis of a party guy, but the house also came with a steel door that could close off the bar area with a flip of a switch from upstairs, just in case the authorities made an unexpected appearance. Marion Cooper a popular personality who had traveled the world before directing hits like The Four Feathers and King Kong, told Kevin Brownlow in a 1971 interview that he had been a guest at a most unusual dinner party at Kennedy's house on Rodeo. The large rectangular dining room jutted out from the rest of the house, with windows on three sides, looking out on the corner streets and the landscaped backyard with its pool and tennis court. Twenty people could easily be seated at the long dinner table, but since the downstairs rooms opened up into each other, many more guests could be comfortably accommodated. Company for dinner was commonplace, but this particular evening Joe decided to appear inspired instead of jealous when news reached him that Gloria might be seeing someone else. He got a picture of every man that was known to have slept with her. He had life-sized blown-up photographs all around the dining room. He invited everybody that was in, in Hollywood, to the dinner. In sweeps Gloria, and she looked around at these pictures and said, Joe, I'm glad you remembered my former life. She wasn't phased at all. 
she wouldn't give a damn, you know? Everyone thought it was hilarious, and Cooper remembered it as the funniest joke I ever saw. If Joe hoped the fact they were known as a couple would affect the way people saw him, it didn't help with the likes of Cooper. In his opinion, Joe was a mean old tough son of a bitch, and Gloria was a wonderful person. I love her. Others viewed Kennedy differently. Paramount's production chief, B.P. Schulberg, considered Joe one of the most intelligent men in the business, and always a gentleman. Joseph von Sternberg, the director who discovered Marlena Dietrich and was known for his discernment, if not outright arrogance, found Kennedy to be a brilliant and charming man. Hollywood society could have their disparate opinions about Joe and Gloria, individually or as a couple, but they would always be amateurs compared to the community's most prominent unmarried couple, William Randolph Hearst and Marion Davies. Their mutual activities were monitored by the fan magazines and some newspapers, if not Hearst's own. There, Marion alone was trumpeted, but photos appeared in photoplay and silver screen of the two of them together. The press walked a tightrope, treating the Davies-Hurst relationship as a professional, if very close, one. Gloria's twenty-two-room Beverly Hills mansion on several acres, while elegant and well-staffed, was half the size of Marion's fifty-plus-room beach house, and Kennedy's leased house was just one of many, while Hurst played host at the incomparable San Simeon. It was Joe who was the welcome guest at The Ranch, as Hearst called his massive estate on the coast, halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Hearst found him interesting and intelligent, and Marion thought he was charming and full of Irish self-assurance. While Joe was occasionally with Gloria, Marion was not impressed. Davies had little patience with what she considered Swanson's auteur and pretensions— and even parodied Gloria in show people. Marion's favorite foil was anyone she thought took themselves too seriously, and Gloria fell loudly into that category. The guest list for those San Simeon weekends was always impressive. Over a few short years, Albert Einstein, George Bernard Shaw, Presidents Hoover and Coolidge, even the King of Siam, were among their house guests, and Kennedy fueled his sense of belonging in such surroundings. Joe lived fully and comfortably in his new world in California, but it must have nagged at him that his family remained in what he would have considered an unsettled state at a rented home in Riverdale. Once again it was Eddie Moore who was sent house-hunting, and he found a six-acre estate in a plush New York suburb suitable for the Kennedy tribe. The large brick Georgian-style home, which the New York Times called one of the most imposing in Bronxville, boasted a tennis court, beautiful grounds, and a purchase price of $250,000. A quarter mile up the hill from the village, the house came with everything except a father. Now even more staff was needed. There were gardeners and chauffeurs, a cook, laundresses, and housemaids, along with nurses for the younger children and governesses for the older. Six of the staff lived in, and as Rose began to supervise the children's annual summer pilgrimage to the Cape, private physical education teachers and tutors supplemented the retinue. After almost two months in California, Joe returned east, bringing E.B. Durer with him. Their first stop was Pathé's annual sales convention in Atlantic City, where, now almost by rote, Joe took the stage and announced plans to release thirty all-dialogue films over the next year, in addition to their newsreels and dozens of short comedies. The numbers were never sacrosanct. It was the hoopla that mattered. His role was to electrify the men of Pathé with enthusiasm to go out and sell, sell, sell. Chapter 22 Having Tea with His Wife and My Husband and the Vicar Summer and Fall, 1929 Kennedy watched the rough cut of the trespasser in the privacy of his own screening room, and he was thrilled. He told Gloria, If this isn't the greatest motion picture that anyone ever shot, 
I want to go back to stock manipulation. He was genuinely pleased for her, because he knew it had been a painfully protracted two years for her between films. For Joe himself, the best part had to be that, finally, up there on the big screen was the phrase, Joseph P. Kennedy presents Gloria Swanson. When The Trespasser was previewed at New York's Rialto Theater at the end of July, they knew they had a hit on their hands. Joe wanted a grand and lavish premiere, but because the film had been completed so quickly, theater availability became an issue. Both of the United Artists' New York theaters were booked through the fall, and while Joe Schenck personally stepped in to give the trespasser preferred treatment, there was little he could do. No one wanted to wait for the revenue stream to begin, so when it was suggested there be a European premiere with an American opening to follow, Joe enthusiastically embraced the idea. He jumped into the planning with UA's foreign representatives and publicists, which London theater attracted patrons to both evening screenings and matinees, how many showings could be scheduled each day. Henri was asked to select the most worthy theater in Paris. Since that premiere would attract Americans, should the English-talking version be used for the first night only, and the silent version shown for the remainder of the run? What about Berlin or Brussels? Kennedy's zeal for his European plans made him more daring on the personal front. He would take both Rose and Gloria and meet up with Henri. All would be well with the world. Needless to say, Gloria balked. Joe, she firmly stated, you and I cannot travel on the same boat going over, even if we're going to meet my husband. Kennedy countered with a plea that Rose had... Never been to Europe, and I've promised her this trip. Rose had been to Europe half a dozen times by then, but Gloria wouldn't necessarily have known that. She had yet to meet the woman. All she could think of was that Joe was asking her to throw a shawl over my scarlet letter and have tea with his wife and my husband and the vicar, doubtless, not to mention the press. She thought she resisted, but soon gave in because... When his mind was made up, there was not a big enough lever in the world to move him. Leaving the children at home, Gloria boarded the train in Los Angeles on July 17th. Her publicist, Lance Heath, finally had something to promote, so he arranged for interviews at stops along the way. In Chicago, she picked up a friend, Virginia Bowker, who had agreed to come along as a traveling companion, but was soon aware of her dual role as a beard. Once in New York, Gloria recorded her Trespasser songs for release on RCA's Victor label, the music and record company Sarnoff had purchased earlier in the year, further expanding his entertainment reach. She also made appearances on his NBC radio. Gloria was one of the few pieces of gold Joe still held that could be of use to Sarnoff. The original plan was for Gloria and Virginia to leave for Europe on the 2nd of August, but Joe pressed them into making a weekend visit to the Cape, where he could show them off to both family and friends. Gloria had refused to go to Riverdale, but if she was going to travel with Rose, she might as well meet her now. Ted O'Leary and Eddie Moore met Gloria and Virginia in Manhattan, and they headed to the Hudson River, where they all boarded an amphibious airplane for a flight to Hyannis. Joe, his family, and even his father-in-law were all there, to give the appearance of propriety to their dramatic arrival. The glamorous star visiting the home of their own movie mogul at the height of the summer season was big news. Gloria's appearance at the beach club made a sensation worthy of front-page coverage in the local press. Gloria and Virginia were to board the Olympic for La Havre. Kennedy had booked a deluxe suite on the Ile de France the following week. The cost of the one-way voyage was $1,175, billed to Gloria Productions. Lance Heath arrived in France two days before Gloria, giving him time to arrange for hordes of photographers to be on hand when Henri greeted her at the pier. Off they went to the Plaza Athene Hotel in Paris, where Virginia could make herself scarce while Gloria and Henri became reacquainted. They had not seen each other since the previous Christmas, and Gloria later wrote that there was awkwardness between them. 
Her rationale for why neither of them said what they really felt was because of their separate relationships with Kennedy. Henri had gone from being Gloria's employee to being Joe's, and was hardly in a position to rock that boat, personally or professionally. The genteel and politic thing to do was nothing, and soon enough they were off to England. The Kennedy party reached London on Saturday, August 31st, and three days later Gloria and her entourage joined them at Claridge's. The coterie must have been something to behold, Gloria with Henri and Virginia, Rose and Joe and his sister Margaret, who had come along to keep Rose company, while Joe was occupied elsewhere. In addition to Gloria's publicist, other Pathé and UA employees were in and out helping with arrangements. Never before had a major American film been shown in the capitals of Europe before making a home appearance, and that piqued the press's interest. Everywhere the first world premiere was billed as a Kennedy Swanson production. Joe was the impresario presenting his wares, and to promote Gloria's first talking and singing film, he wanted to showcase her voice. He scheduled her for radio appearances and even a short singing performance during a concert at Queen's Hall, where he walked on stage to introduce her to the crowd. He subjected her to various promotional stunts, such as having her host a tea party for several hundred waitresses. During the event, and almost everywhere they went, she was called on to sing Love, proving over and over again it was her real voice in the film. American-style publicity had backfired in the past in England, but this time Gloria could do no wrong, except with the drivers caught in the hours of traffic jams caused by her public outings. The Trespasser premiere at London's New Gallery Cinema on Monday night, September 9, 1929, was, according to Variety, a sensational smash. Uniformed police linked arms for over two blocks along Regent Street to hold back the near riot of over 5,000 fans. The hordes were primarily female, and the image of sedate English matrons was called into question when eight burly policemen were literally swept off their feet by the throngs. As Gloria put it to a reporter that night, I thought this kind of thing only happened in America. Swanson was cheered for over fifteen minutes as she entered the theater, and when she went on stage after the screening, again escorted by Joe, the applause lasted at least as long. Looking out at the packed audience, bathed in adulation, Kennedy couldn't have been more pleased. Swanson described him as being so proud and happy that his mouth was perpetually half-open in an ecstatic smile and the long-term box office prognosis was fabulous. Reviewers raved that the trespasser was the best talker seen here yet, and as natural and fluid as the best silent film. At that moment in London, Clara Bow was talking in dangerous curves, and Norma Shearer was doing the same in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. While both were doing enormous business, the London Chronicle proclaimed, Gloria Swanson has taught them all how to do it. The combination of Gloria singing like a prima and Goulding's direction and technical wizardry were hailed as showcasing the true possibilities of sound. With articles trumpeting Gloria's personal triumph and declaring her even more accomplished in talkies than in her silent films, the group left London feeling elated. They went en masse to Deauville for a few days before hitting Paris, where Kennedy made time for meetings to have Pathé become a 50% partner in a limited corporation to make foreign versions of American films. He had been discussing the plan with Bob Kane for almost a year, and now he committed Pathé's sound equipment and cameras to be shipped to France and Spain to begin production as soon as possible. While Joe was in conferences, Gloria introduced Rose and Margaret to the joys of haute couture. Rose had shopped in Paris before, but now she took to the pleasure of having gowns made exclusively for her, and maintained the practice for the rest of her life. Everything seemed to be going along smoothly when there was a sudden explosion. 
The fuse was a cable Gloria opened by mistake because of an E added to the title of Marquis. It was a love letter to Henri from Constance Bennett, still in Culver City but preparing to leave for France in a few weeks to finalize her divorce. Cold, royal rage surged through Swanson, according to Rose, who came running along with Joe when he was summoned. Gloria announced she was suing for divorce on the spot, and there was absolutely no way she was going to be seen in public with Henri again. Farce or high drama, it must have been quite a scene, with Gloria claiming outrage that her husband was sleeping with another woman when the man she was cuckolding him with was sitting opposite them. Henri could hardly call her on it with Rose there as well, so he simply withdrew to another room while Joe went into action, calming Gloria by reminding her how much was at stake for both of them. She was a great actress. Surely she could get through the next few days pretending they were the devoted, happy, and glamorous couple the public expected. And after much coaxing, that is what Gloria agreed to do, calling Henri back in and negotiating the arrangements for the remainder of their time together. Finally, after what had to be an exhausting three weeks of roller coaster emotions, Gloria, Joe and Rose, Virginia and Margaret boarded the Ile de France on September 18th, leaving Henri on the pier waving goodbye for his farewell performance for the photographers. If they had kept up pretenses by taking separate boats to Europe, there were no such restraints on the return crossing. However, Rose, Joe, and Gloria all gave very different versions of the voyage. Joe claimed in a letter to Henri that Gloria remained in bed on the boat the whole trip, with the exception of one night. Rose, on the other hand, said that she was the one who was tired from the emotion of the trip, so I stayed in my stateroom. And in her memoir, Gloria recalled that when they were all on board together, Joe Kennedy behaved in an alarmingly possessive or over-solicitous fashion toward me. She was bemused by Rose, who was also overly attentive and almost maternal. Even though she was less than a decade older, Rose treated Gloria and Virginia like a pair of debutantes it was her bounden duty to chaperone. Rose took on a condescending air over Gloria's apparent need to be constantly attended to. The recurring adjective Rose used to describe Swanson was poor, as in poor little Gloria. William Dufty said that it was Rose's appellation of poor Gloria, and painting her as an empty-headed star, in her book Times to Remember, that was the catalyst for Gloria writing her own memoir after years of vowing she never would. Still, Rose never publicly wavered from her deep-seated belief that Joe's relationship with Gloria was purely professional. Obviously, the best adviser, manager, financier in Hollywood was Joe Kennedy, so it was natural that poor Gloria turned to him. Everyone seemed to have a fully trustworthy adviser, but she had none, and really needed someone like Joe. Rose told Doris Kearns Goodwin that, Reporters mistakenly decided that something was going on between the two of them, and from that moment on all sorts of rumors began to fly. But I knew I never had a thing to worry about, and I only felt sorry for poor little Gloria. Goodwin was incredulous about Rose's strange solicitude, and concluded that it is impossible to believe that Rose did not know, yet she had willed that knowledge out of her consciousness. It was better, perhaps, to follow the pattern set by her mother long ago, to suffer in silence, rather than take the enormous risk of shattering the entire family and bringing public disgrace upon herself and her husband. Many others have speculated over Rose's state of mind. Hedda Hopper, who had great respect for Joe, and believed he possessed one of the best sets of brains in the country, said she often wondered how Rose weathered the affair which she simply refused to acknowledge. Gloria, too, was shocked at Rose's failure to see anything untoward in her relationship with Joe. If she suspected me of having relations not quite proper with her husband, or resented me for it, 
she never once gave any indication of it. Was Rose a fool, I asked myself, as I listened with disbelief, or a saint, or just a better actress than I was? Swanson's autobiography is exceedingly well written, thanks in part to ghostwriters, including Wayne Lawson and William Dufty, and it has been taken verbatim by many biographers ever since. Yet when her accounts are compared with newspapers of the day, other witnesses, or, most convincingly, her own papers, events are occasionally out of order, and her actions are slanted to position herself as an otherwise intelligent person, overwhelmed by Kennedy's strength and sincerity. However, she doesn't create events out of whole cloth, and that is what makes her account of what happened shortly after their return to the States so intriguing. After disembarking, Rose returned to Bronxville, and Gloria was installed at the plaza where Ted O'Leary called her to say there was an important person she needed to meet. There was nothing unusual about that. Names were rarely used, and she just assumed Joe had given Ted his instructions, until she was escorted into a hotel suite and found herself face to face with Cardinal O'Connell of Boston in full clerical garb. He wasted no time with small talk. I am here to ask you to stop seeing Joe Kennedy. Swanson suggested he'd take it up with him, but the cardinal informed her that Joe had sought permission from the church to separate from Rose, after being told he could never have the marriage annulled. Gloria's silent fury built to a fever pitch as the prelate continued to entreat her to make the break, saying, each time you see him, you become an occasion of sin for him. I repeat, Gloria responded, it's Mr. Kennedy you should be talking to. And with that, she rose to leave. When the cardinal blocked her way, she stood her ground without saying another word until he finally stepped aside and she left the room, taking the stairs down to the lobby, where she confronted a nervous O'Leary. Ted apologized profusely. She pushed him to tell her who had instigated the meeting, but all he would confirm was that Joe knew nothing about it. The cardinal had approached Ted personally and directly. The thought of O'Leary, who at this point had been with Kennedy for almost a decade, doing anything not previously approved by a boss who demanded total loyalty, is difficult to believe. Yet the cardinal may well have been the lone higher authority in the Catholic O'Leary's personal hierarchy. Whether or not they knew it at the time, an incredible level of hypocrisy was added to the equation by the fact that the cardinal's nephew was a Boston priest, living a double life as a married man in New York. According to his biographer, O'Connell allowed his nephew to continue his charade because he threatened to expose evidence of financial chicanery with the church funds and proofs of the cardinal's sexual affection for men. Cardinal O'Connell had been in Joe's life for several decades, had married him and Rose, and was a source of information as well as the spiritual leader of Boston Catholics. Yet around this time, Joe switched his private allegiances from the cardinal to Bishop Spellman. Kennedy was living in New York, but in the Boston Bishop, he found a churchman who met him on his own terms. Spellman's biographer believed that neither man minded being used by the other, as long as they both benefited. Whether Kennedy's shift of focus from O'Connell to Spellman was precipitated by the cardinal's visit with Gloria, it certainly didn't help cement the relationship. Doris Kearns Goodwin doubts Gloria's story of meeting the cardinal because he was known to hold himself aloof from the everyday problems of his parishioners. She also wondered if Joe was seriously thinking of leaving Rose, since he had just purchased the home in Bronxville. Yet Kennedy was hardly a typical parishioner. He was one of the richest and most public Catholic figures in the country, and buying the estate could have been seen as a settlement just as easily as a commitment. Gloria's detailed recounting of the cardinal's appearance, down to his beautifully manicured hands, the setting and the extensive dialogue, all add veracity to her story. 
While she never publicly recounted whether she discussed it with Kennedy directly, she did tell several friends that Joe wanted not only to marry her, but to have children with her as well. What he wanted more than anything was for us to have a child. In a burst of devotion, Kennedy proclaimed he had been faithful throughout their relationship. But the very concept stunned Gloria. After all, they were both married to other people, and she had certainly continued to have relations with Henri. Joe, however, was indignant, and pointed to the fact that he and Rose had not had a child since February of 1928, shortly after he and Gloria had begun sleeping together. That was Joe's definition of faithful. Another witness corroborates Kennedy's discussing leaving his wife for the star. Rose's niece, Geraldine Hannon, said she overheard Joe arguing with his father-in-law, who threatened to tell Rose everything if Joe did not stop seeing Gloria. Hannon said that Joe's response was to call Fitzgerald on his bluff, telling him to go ahead because then he would simply marry Gloria. Various other, less immediate sources, told similar stories, such as Hedda Hopper, who always believed that it was Honey Fitz who ordered Joe to drop Gloria, or certain secrets would burst out into the open. It makes sense that it was John Fitzgerald who asked the Cardinal to intervene. While Alan Goodrich of the Kennedy Library says Fitzgerald was not one of the Cardinal's favorites, Honey Fitz was used to going to the source to get things done, and he would have done anything to protect his eldest daughter— if, indeed, he thought her future was in jeopardy. This was the daughter he had ordered to return to her husband almost a decade earlier, and he was not about to sit by and let her be divorced. To be married and carry on an active and separate life was one thing. To divorce was out of the question. During that late fall of 1929, Joe appeared more enamored of Gloria than ever and part of his joy stemmed from the success of their film. Five weeks after the London opening, the trespasser was still going strong, and the critical response was as overwhelming. Brilliant. Swanson gives better performance than Sadie Thompson, and she transcends perfection, were just a few of the quotes pulled from reviews. Both Kennedy and United Artists wanted her at the Trespasser New York premiere, but that was scheduled for a month after their return from Europe. The film was being released throughout the country as theaters became available. It opened in Detroit, and then a dozen other cities, before it opened in New York. The children and their governess came east to join Gloria, as did Laura Hope Cruz, who, along with Virginia Bowker, helped with the various activities, such as the series of afternoons when Gloria opened her hotel suite to reporters. Even though she wasn't feeling well, and both the children had sore throats, Swanson charmed her audiences as she made radio appearances and fielded dozens of phone calls from writers in the towns and cities where the trespasser was about to open. Gloria fell comfortably into answering the same old questions as if hearing them for the first time, and never giving a hint that her personal life was in turmoil. If Kennedy was near euphoric that October, almost everyone else who had anything to do with Wall Street was becoming gravely concerned. Joe would later tell self-deprecating tales of getting out of the stock market on a hunch, saying if shoeshine boys were giving him tips, clearly everyone was an expert and he should give up. While Joe had sold most of his film stocks, he still held a wide-ranging portfolio. Yet Kennedy listened carefully to the few people he respected. He had tried to see J.P. Morgan, Jr. earlier in the year, but was rebuffed by the great man's secretary because, according to Morgan's biographer, Ron Chernow, Kennedy bore the double stigma of being a Catholic and a stock market operator. Guy Courier, however, was still speaking to him, and in the spring of 1929 he was predicting a business depression and warned, it is not an attractive time to go into new matters. Courier, along with Frederick Prince, were among the few to counsel that stocks were too explosive to be dependable much longer. 
Joe also appreciated the concentrated effort stock profiteering required, and with his attention distracted by Hollywood, he knew it was the wisest course to remove himself from the market. He made his decision and stuck to it. But it could not have been easy when stock prices continued to rise over the summer and word of his moves spread among his former colleagues. It made him even more of an outsider on the street. Yet he reassured himself with his doctrine, only a fool holds out for top dollar. On October 2, 1929, Kennedy exercised the remaining portion of his KAO-RKO options, cashing in the final 15,000 shares he had purchased at $21 and clearing almost half a million dollars in the process. He kept most in cash, but put some into bonds. At the same time, he finished divesting himself of the 100,000 shares of Pathé he had received in quarterly segments over the past year in payment for running that company. Blair and Company had bought some of them, passing the profits back to him, but the remainder was sold in dozens of transactions, usually in increments of 500 or 1,000 shares at a time. Only a few thousand shares were sold under the name of Joseph P. Kennedy. All the rest initially went into accounts of E. E. Moore and C. J. Scollard. When the columns were all added up that fall, between KAO and Pathé, Kennedy had made a pure profit of more than a million dollars. Only a few weeks later, after several months of roller coaster prices, came the crisis days of late October 1929. As Variety headlined it, Wall Street lays an egg. Over $10 billion of value vanished in a single day from just the New York Stock Exchange. Yet the next week, Kennedy was able to tell the lawyer handling his father's probate, The crash in the stock market left me untouched. I was more fortunate this time than usual. Fortunate was an understatement. Any remnant of hope that much heralded organized support by bankers could prop up the market had disintegrated. Newsboys waved their papers, shouting, Read em and weep! While men who had been millionaires the week before were now facing the unthinkable, Kennedy's attention was riveted on the New York opening of The Trespasser, scheduled for Friday, November 1st. Working with the publicity director for the Rialto Theater, he arranged with the Irving Berlin Company, which was publishing the sheet music, to have banners plastering the city's music stores. Copies of the score of Love Your Spell is Everywhere were sent to local orchestras and played on national radio. Swanson singing the song, along with dialogue from the film, were used for promotion on the radio as well. While the European premieres had been exhilarating, this was Kennedy's opportunity to regale his old friends and former colleagues with his greatest success to date. He sent letters with tickets to key people in his life, back to Vera Murray, the producer C.B. Dillingham's secretary, who had taken him in hand during the teens when he was just learning the joys of Broadway and chorus girls. Then there were those still in important positions to help, such as Doc Giannini and a contingent from Blair and Company, as well as the editors and publishers of the major newspapers and magazines. David Sarnoff and Joe Schnitzer, Bill LeBaron and Lee Marcus, all now with RKO, were not forgotten. Altogether, Kennedy and Swanson had over 100 special invited guests for the New York premiere. The crowds began gathering on the corner of 42nd Street and 7th Avenue in the afternoon, and by the time Gloria and Joe arrived, the throngs broke through the police barricades and pushed Gloria to the point she had to be picked up and carried into the theater. When the film finally unspooled, the sound was uneven and occasionally muffled, but the opening night crowd didn't seem to mind. She was greeted with a standing ovation at her curtain appearance. The film had been screened for critics several days before, and the sound had been perfect for them, so they could vouch for Swanson's clear as a bell speaking voice and her most pleasing singing. New York's premier reviewer, Mordant Hall of the Times, gave it a rave, proclaiming the film gifted with originality from beginning to end. Positive comments continued to flood in, and they were highlighted in full-page ads in the trades and newspapers throughout the country. 
Gloria left New York for Chicago to attend that city's trespasser opening, but Joe stayed behind and made several impromptu visits to the Rialto, checking on the ticket sales and the crowd's reaction. When the first week set a theater box office record, he made sure everyone knew it. Kennedy didn't sit back and count the money. He shook the bushes for more. He sent cables to salesmen in areas yet to be booked, reporting the Rialto take, and telling each one, This picture is entitled to the best terms a house can pay, and you are the boy to get it. He wrote letters to the owners of the smaller theater circuits who had bought the film, and told them that he had a lot of money tied up in the Swanson picture, and I will appreciate it if you would see that it gets a pretty good break. An advertising push and prime scheduling could make them both more money. He then wrote notes of thanks to theater managers who really got behind this picture. Everywhere the crowds were turning out in droves, and the film was proving to be a huge financial success. After her protracted absence from the screen, Gloria had to be tremendously relieved. And Joe couldn't have been prouder. Even if the trespasser, while billed as a personal production of Joseph Kennedy, had come to life only as an afterthought while deciding what to do with Queen Kelly. And so it was back to Culver City with a vengeance, for Joe was all the more determined to finish that film in a blaze of glory. Rumors of a rift in the Swanson Falaise marriage began appearing in the trades shortly after Gloria's return from Europe. While no sources were given for the stories, Kennedy privately cautioned Henri that, with Constance Bennett in Paris, he should behave yourself and keep out of trouble and don't gallivant around too much. Whether or not Henri appreciated the irony of Joe giving him advice on how to conduct his affair, he did not heed it. He and Constance were constantly seen together in Paris— Soon they were telling friends they planned to marry, as soon as they both secured divorces. Gloria was hardly in a position to be shocked, but what had to gall her was the press lumping her with Pola Negri, because she too had married European nobility, as part of the short vogue of silent film stars of Hollywood, to annex a title. It was none too kindly pointed out that Pola was now losing her prince by the same route. While Swanson was not ready to face divorce court at the moment, all these questions about the state of her marriage put her more on edge than usual. Instead of dealing with her personal life, she joined Joe in trying to salvage Queen Kelly, and, once again, she turned to Eddie Goulding for help. Eddie genuinely liked Gloria, but he reiterated that he thought the film was beyond repair. She should just forget Queen Kelly— and make another film with him from a script he had just finished about a manicurist who marries into wealth and has to prove her worth. This was not what Gloria wanted to hear, and, according to Goulding, she became peevish and generally hoty toty Goulding might have been surprised by Swanson's attitude, but others weren't. Her contemporary, the actress Louise Brooks, later claimed— I watched Queen Swanson abuse Alan Dwan, her director on the set, abuse Hank de la Falaise, her husband, at the dinner table, and abuse her secretary in her drawing room. So I was particularly anxious to learn what kind of abuse she would fire at Edmund Goulding. Eddie tried to be sympathetic, and wondered if Gloria wasn't suffering from an underlying insecurity, questioning whether it was her talent or his that was responsible for the success of the trespasser. Joe and Gloria had been the ones in the spotlight with the film. Goulding had not gone with them to Europe, and Joe had insisted he not even go to the Chicago premiere because of the work piling up at Pathé. Eddie had done what he was told. He stayed at the studio writing and producing the musical The Grand Parade, a film the New York distributors called Excellent, and just what the territories are demanding. Goulding was disappointed over Gloria's reaction, but he had been putting up with her airs for months, and at times just considered them part of her charm. But what happened next truly shocked him into a new reality. He had remained under contract with Pathé at $2,500 a week, 
and signed over the rights to the trespasser and his other stories, as was the practice of writers on salary. He considered it a clever way to save money. He was a notorious spendthrift, and assumed he had a big payout coming from his partnership with Kennedy. Both Kennedy and Fanny Holtzman, Goulding's lawyer and confidant, traveled frequently, but even when they were in the same city, Joe found reasons to postpone their meetings. Holtzman had heard enough whispers about Kennedy from her Wall Street friends that she had cautioned Eddie from the beginning that Joe was a personal promoter, glib and dangerous. Goulding had dismissed her warnings and assured her that the film was fabulous. It's the contract I want to see, Eddie, Holtzman told him, not the picture. Yet she had no reason to doubt the director's story that Kennedy had promised a partnership. So when she and Joe finally met over lunch to discuss Goulding's deal, she was astonished when he announced he didn't owe him another penny beyond his Pathé salary. But that was just expense money, Joe, Fanny protested. Something to tide him over. After all, Eddie provided you with a great story, and he put the whole project together. Why, he gets more money than that for— Joe interrupted her in mid-sentence. Listen, I did the bomb a favor. He was on the skids in Hollywood. No other studio would touch him. I gave him a chance to get back on the screen. I can't believe my ears, Joe. Eddie had a deal with you, a clear verbal contract. You were partners. What contract? Kennedy asked with a steely smile. Lunch was clearly over. When Holtzman broke the news of the betrayal to Goulding, it was slow to sink in. Eddie had thought of Joe as his savior, allowing him the creative freedom to produce innovative films they would all benefit from. He couldn't fathom that Joe would so blatantly lie to him, and decided to approach him directly. Kennedy repeated that he didn't owe the director one penny, and Goulding, now desperate and realizing that what he considered his life savings wasn't there after all, told Joe he would see him in court. An icy cold Kennedy, Eddie had never seen before, turned on him and said, You have that Jew girl go after me, and I guarantee you'll never be on a screen again. I'll tell a federal jury about some of those wild goulding weekends, and you'll be deported for moral turpitude. Goulding was stunned into silence. He knew he wasn't about to subject Fanny Holtzman or himself to public slurs, and while deportation seemed an unlikely possibility, he wasn't going to risk having his bisexual ways discussed in open court. Eddie decided Kennedy's duplicity was beyond my earthly powers to comprehend, and determined the best thing to do was to dismiss the incident as one of those things in which shrewd business had triumphed over my credulity, and move on. Swanson wasn't much comfort. She was wrapped up in her own world, and Goulding had little patience for temperament in others or idleness in himself. It was obvious he couldn't continue at Pathé, and when the studio announced that he wouldn't direct Queen Kelly because he didn't want his individuality impaired, he privately told Gloria, To hell with it. He took himself and his script to Paramount. Within a matter of weeks, both her husband and her director had publicly left her. Gloria was more dependent than ever on Joe Kennedy. Chapter 23 Things are bad enough here. Late 1929 to early 1930. At home on Rodeo Drive, Kennedy received daily cables from Ted O'Leary reporting the Trespassers' box office take. After a month and a half at the Rialto, the film had grossed more than $250,000, and it was Al Lichtman, the United Artists' executive who had predicted disaster with that title, who reported that the Trespasser had broken all UA records. The New York totals were spurred by the fact that screenings began at 10.15 and played continuously through 1.30 in the morning, with an extra show on Saturdays. Still, at 50 cents for most tickets, a quarter of a million dollars was an incredible achievement. 
Kennedy had put the word out that Queen Kelly required only a couple of dialogue sequences to be finished, but priority was being given to releasing and promoting the trespasser. Now he had Charlie Sullivan review the Queen Kelly books to reduce the amount of money allocated to the film. The last thing they wanted was for it to publicly go over a million dollars. With a little shifting, Sullivan decided that almost $100,000 could be allocated as advances on the trespasser, and he came up with an actual cost of $648,611 for Queen Kelly to date. Charlie was also assigned to finalize the agreement with Stroheim to give him back the African portion of the story. Durr suggested the negotiations include the right to use his name on the credits of Queen Kelly, whatever version they ended up releasing. And once again, requests were sent to the Pathé Newsreel Division to find shots of Africa. Efforts were underway to reunite the cast. Swanson was right there, ready and waiting, and she signed another release to her own company stating that the $50,000 she had received for the first version was all she was going to get. Cena Owen was put on half salary until filming began. Walter Byron remained under contract to Sam Goldwyn until November 10th, but gave Charlie Sullivan his assurance he would be available then. The contracts were testimony to the gang's omnipresent control. Cena Owens was signed by Sullivan as vice president of Gloria Productions, and then, when it was time to renew their agreement to lease studio space at Pathé, Sullivan signed as vice president of Pathé, and Gloria Productions was represented by its new, on-paper president, Kennedy's old friend Chris Dunphy, who had left hotel management and was now working on Wall Street. The script for Queen Kelly had been revised yet again, this time by Laura Hope Cruz. The film sets, which had been struck, recreated, and then dismantled again, had since been altered for use in other films. Now they were reconstructed as best as possible, with the studio charging Gloria Productions for all the work. Pathé had been dark for a month when the Queen Kelly cast and crew came back together on the otherwise empty lot on December 9th, this time under the direction of Richard Boleslawski. The Polish-born Boleslawski had spent 15 years with the Moscow Art Theater before coming to New York in 1920. He had only just arrived in Hollywood, yet another stage director experienced with actors who spoke their lines, but who had never made a movie before. On the second day of filming, Kennedy was optimistic that the end was in sight when he received a call informing him of a catastrophic fire at Pathé's Manhattan studio. Still struggling to bring efficiency to their sound operation in Culver City, they were leasing a studio at the corner of Park Avenue and 134th Street to produce short sound films. Pathé had bought the building in 1915, converting it from a saloon and dance hall into a movie studio, a relatively easy transition, since there were already dressing rooms upstairs and a large stage below. Pearl White filmed some of her serials there, but the studio had been sold and used by many others since then, and at times stood dormant. New York had emerged as a hub of sound film activity, in part because it provided easy access to performers who could appear before the cameras during the day and on stage at night. Pathé had been operating there for over a month and were just beginning to turn out a film a week. At 9.30 on the morning of Tuesday, December 10th, a full panoply of cast and crew gathered to film a musical number for The Black and White Review, under the direction of Harry Delmar. Upstairs, the studio manager, Henry Lally, and John Flynn, a Path A vice president, inherited in the merger with producers distributing and now in charge of all short sound films, were in their offices. Costumed chorus girls were readying in their dressing rooms or sitting in small groups at the top of the stairs waiting for their call. Musicians were warming up as electricians, cinematographers, and the lighting men completed their checks. From his perch on the upstairs railing, an electrician thought he saw one of the large arc lights, located above the cameras and surrounded by reflectors, spit a glowing crumb of carbon and land on the stage below. 
Just the day before, one of the dancers' feather headdresses had caught on fire as it grazed a scorching incandescent light, but a quick-thinking crew member had pulled it off her head and stamped out the fire. This time, however, the thick black velvet drapes that served as a sound-muffling backdrop touched the lights, and in a few seconds were in flames. Two crew members tugged at the drapes in a futile attempt to limit the fire, but it quickly spread to the props and crates stockpiled behind them, and to the stage itself. Calls of everyone downstairs were mistaken to mean it was time to go before the cameras, so a few of the young women were in no hurry until they smelled the fire. Then there was a rush for the flight of stairs, with everyone being pushed by those behind them. The wardrobe mistress escaped by jumping from a rear window and into the alley below. The janitor in the basement climbed up and out of the coal chute to scramble to safety. On the phone at his desk, John Flynn smelled the smoke and started to leave the office when his secretary, Frances Walsh, stood up and then collapsed. Flynn picked her up in his arms and headed to the stairs. Seeing the flames, he returned to his office and scrambled out the window to the second-story ledge, where they were rescued by the firemen who were arriving in droves. Henry Lally escaped the same way. But four chorus girls and six assorted electricians, makeup men, and crew members didn't make it out of the building in time. Most of the bodies were found piled on top of each other at the bottom of the stairs, just yards from the main doorway. A dozen others were injured, and several were hospitalized with burns and broken bones. Front-page stories the next day featured pictures of scared, scantily-costumed young women huddled outside the burning building. As questions and accusations began to swirl, Flynn and Lally were arrested on the charge of technical manslaughter in the second degree, held, and then released on $15,000 bail. Flynn spent a sleepless week for after going through the booking process, he joined Pat Scollard crisscrossing the city to attend the funerals of the victims. From Culver City, Kennedy and Durr were in constant touch with New York, and arrangements were immediately made to move production to RCA's Gramercy Studios. From his desk at Pathé's main office, Terry Ramsey told Durr that both Flynn and Lally conspicuously kept their heads and maintained their poise— and Scollard's sober judgment and firm hand have been very much in evidence. They had shown decided discretion in handling as painful and complex a situation as I have ever seen arise. Discretion was an understatement, for they needed to remove hundreds of thousands of feet of film from a studio where the law required a permit for storing over 5,000 feet. While the notoriously flammable film did not play a part in the fire, the 45th Street headquarters might well be checked next. So Ramsey reported, With respect to incendiary activities, this building is sweet and pure, as he had supervised the removal of approximately one million feet of film. New York newspapers were soon clamoring for new fire safety regulations, Hearst's papers were in the forefront of a savage campaign against Pathé, as they accused the company of spiriting away thousands of feet of film on the night of the fire. Will Hayes stepped in and tried to quiet the furor, but by the end of the week everyone from Mayor Jimmy Walker, the district attorney, the fire commissioner, and on down, was falling over one another to claim the mantle of outraged reformer. The studio had been served with notices to install a sprinkler system in 1919, and again in May of 1929, but the order had been appealed. Kennedy's own man, Steve Fitzgibbon, had paid $500 to the Croker Fire Prevention Engineering Company to grease the wheels, with a promise of another $500 when the appeal was granted. Edward Croker was the city's former fire chief, who had set himself up in a business that sounds very much like a protection racket. Yet he was the tip of the iceberg in the corruption-riddled New York of the late 1920s. In spite of the fact that Kennedy was chairman of the board of Pathé, his name rarely appeared in connection with the fire or the company in the literally hundreds of articles on the disaster and its repercussions. He remained in California— where, by the third day of Boleslawski's attempt at filming Queen Kelly, it was all too obvious that the film could not be rescued with a combination of retakes and inserts. Stroheim's version was so lush and detailed, so intricately lit, 
that as enthusiastic as the handsome, blonde Boleslavsky was, his results were blatantly amateur in contrast. Once again, production was suspended. The only beneficiary of the aborted attempt was Pathé, because the studio billed Gloria Productions for the sound and electrical equipment and prop construction, as well as the salaries of those such as Boleslavsky they had under contract. Kennedy could no longer hide the delays from United Artists. In mid-December, after a year of advertising and selling, UA formally notified exhibitors that, because of the failure of the producer to deliver Queen Kelly, they were canceling their contracts. Instead of giving Joe pause, the announcement reinvigorated his determination to finish the film, and everyone seemed to have ideas on what to do next. Even Ted O'Leary put in his two cents, suggesting some slapstick comedy be written into the story. While Kennedy had come to the conclusion that the film had a gypsy curse on it, he now decided to turn it into a musical operetta. He sent Henri to Vienna to sign Franz Lehar, the composer of The Merry Widow, to write a great waltz as the big feature of the film. The exclusive contract for The Queen Kelly Waltz cost Gloria Productions another $60,000. But Joe made the most of the announcement, giving the impression he was moving forward. On December 19, 1929, Boleslavsky handed Kennedy a little Christmas present, a new four-page treatment for yet another version of Queen Kelly. This one took place entirely in the German kingdom and opened with a queen entering the city with bands playing, as Kelly, a small child, is being deposited by her father at what is now a convent academy. Cut to fifteen years later when Kelly, still at the convent, and now the beautiful Gloria Swanson, is teaching the other girls to sing songs of love and future happiness, instead of the dull songs they learn in school. This time the prince meets Kelly because he is inspired by her glorious singing to look over the academy wall. Stroheim's scenes of the queen in the palace discovering Kelly and the prince, and the whipping sequence that followed would still be used. But when the queen announces that she will marry the prince, it is proclaimed throughout town on placards, which Kelly histrionically tears down. The prince sneaks out of the palace, takes Kelly from the convent, and they have a love scene in the forest before the prince is arrested. Here the story took a dramatic shift, with a cruel queen revealed to be an impostor, and on Kelly's father's deathbed it is discovered that Kelly is the rightful heir to the throne. The crowds rush the prison, free the prince, and the queen escapes like a beaten dog. As the people sing their national anthem, the prince and Kelly reunite. As Bowley put it, it was a conventional story, yet it was the cheapest solution and saves all that can be saved from the original production. It actually was the first treatment that gave Gloria a three-dimensional character with both a backbone and a backstory. Its structure also provided the basis for a full-fledged musical. Boleslavsky was excited and feeling in a fighting spirit with his new storyline, but what he didn't realize was that at that moment, Joe was trying to replace him with MGM's Sam Wood. Laura Cruz had already supplied Wood with the various scripts. Joe and Gloria agreed that he was their new savior, and the director was willing to take it on if they made the necessary arrangements with his studio. That set the wheels in motion, and, learning that Irving Thalberg was in New York, Pat Scollard called him at the Sherry Netherland. Missing him, he sent a telegram, dictated by Sullivan, and signed with Kennedy's name, pleading for Wood as a personal favor, because I have to finish Queen Kelly, period. It included the promise that the director's work would be completed within the next six weeks. To underscore the seriousness of the request, Swanson left a message for Thalberg as well. When at last Scollard reached him by phone, Thalberg said he couldn't make a decision before knowing what plans the coast had for Wood, but promised to get back to him soon. Yet almost a month passed, and E.B. Durr was still sitting by his phone to confirm an appointment. The production chief, long back in California, 
always seemed to be in conference. The call finally came on January 8th, and Durr went over to MGM to meet with Hulberg. The two men expanded these negotiations to include the possibility of loaning Gloria to MGM. Durr wanted $300,000 for that, but Thalberg thought that was too high, and he claimed he couldn't commit because the director has complete authority on everything, including casting. Durr knew better, but admired the way Thalberg played poker. The production chief agreed to loan Sam Wood at cost, but not until April 15th, and Kennedy wanted to start shooting within the next week or two. In the end, they agreed to talk again the next day. Durr had to report to Kennedy that he had tried, but to keep the Queen Kelly cast on salary for three more months while waiting for Wood to be available was ridiculous. He told him that, if it were my money and my picture, he would trust the directing to Russell Mack, who was already on Pathé's payroll. And whatever Joe decided, he shouldn't reduce his price on loaning Swanson to under $250,000. Nothing more was heard from Thalberg, so Gloria stayed put, and Joe reached out to her old friend, Alan Dwan, to salvage Queen Kelly. The three of them spent several hours reviewing the most recent versions, but in the end, Dwan candidly told Kennedy, I can't quite get the storyline. It's either the story of a nun who turned whore, or a whore who turned nun, and I can't figure out which it is. But it's one or the other, and... In any case, it stinks. In addition to the stress surrounding Queen Kelly, Gloria's emotions were strained by her son's illness that December. Both children had contracted strep throat, potentially life-threatening in those pre-penicillin days, but in the end only brother was hospitalized to have his swollen glands removed. Yet Gloria had everything else taken care of for her, including her Christmas shopping, her secretary bolted from toy store to toy store, looking in vain for the billiards game she wanted to send to the Kennedy children. She eventually settled on a large horse game, quite expensive, but suitable for all six children. For the youngest, she sent Bobby a toy ambulance and a doll for baby Jean. Ted O'Leary was in charge of Swanson's professional gifts and arranged to send gold pencils to all the United Artists' branch managers and other employees, engraved with their initials, followed by, From Gloria Swanson. He then sent a sample to Gloria, so when she received letters of thanks, she would know why. It was typical of the gang to take care of each other. They had become so close-knit that, while they kidded each other mercilessly, they were always there for each other— be it to recommend insurance brokers or bankers, to loan each other money, or take care of gift-giving. Scollard on the East Coast took responsibility for getting holiday flowers and candy to the families of the other men, and handled their Christmas presents for the office personnel. Joe turned to Scollard and Ted O'Leary to arrange for presents for Rose and the family, but Durr was in charge of purchasing the personal gifts given out under Kennedy's name to the West Coast Press and studio employees, and he was allocated $5,000 for the largesse. It was time to put an eye to Pathé's end-of-the-year books, and so more cuts were made. Reaching for a positive spin, they announced that Pathé reduces to enlarge, with plans to make fewer but more elaborate productions— Contracts were reviewed, and a few actors, such as Anne Harding and Helen Twelvetrees, had theirs extended, but a half-dozen others were released. Among them were Goulding protégé Carol Lombard and Alan Hale, who chose not to have his weekly guarantee cut from fifty-two to forty weeks a year. Kennedy was back east in time for Christmas with the family, but this year it was Rose who went to Palm Beach. Joe stayed in New York and was there on January 6th for the Pathé board meeting held in Walker's office. They discussed at some length the business outlook, but no mention was made in the minutes of the fire the month before. On the same day, prosecutors were gathering a few blocks away to begin giving evidence into the technical homicide allegations against John Flynn and Lally. 
There was a cloak of solemnity, if not outright depression, in Kennedy's end-of-the-year communications. While he told Henri that, in spite of Queen Kelly, the Pathé fire, and various and sundry other items, it is still a great life. Joe's frustration was growing over things large and small not going at all smoothly. As he put it to Bob Kane in Paris, "'Things are bad enough here now without having trouble over there.' But there was trouble over there, and the plans to make films in Europe had become yet another black hole draining funds. Kane blamed everyone else, but after reading the balance sheets, Pat Scholar decided that the whole thing is a bust, and the sooner we close it up, the better. Yet that was just one of the panoply of questions Kennedy was facing. It was time for some serious thinking. So, in sharp contrast to his usual annual schedule, Kennedy headed to the Ritz-Carlton in Boston for a few days before spending a week alone in the middle of January at Hyannisport. The film business wasn't fun anymore. It had been exciting when he was layering company upon company and cutting deals left and right. The Trespassers' premieres had been invigorating. He loved being a showman. But since then, Queen Kelly had stopped and started and stopped again, and the Pathé fire was devastating. The cost of transitioning to sound, combined with their lack of theaters, made it a struggle to keep Pathé above water. Other smaller studios were laboring as well. But what was he doing spending time just buying time? Looking ahead had always been his forte, and what he saw was not encouraging. The industry had changed dramatically over the past year. The upheaval caused by the conversion to sound and the spate of mergers needed time to shake out. He had been the leading advocate of those changes, but since selling FBO and KAO, he had been on a path of steadily reduced influence. Joe knew that for his talent to prosper, opportunities had to be there. That simply wasn't true anymore. There had been more than a hundred film companies operating when he had entered the business, and now, a decade later, there were only a handful of successful studios. If he wasn't willing to wait around as a second-rate player, the only alternative was to lay the groundwork to leave the business entirely. He had already made a small fortune, but he was determined to make even more on his way out. Once that decision was made, the only major question left was what to do about Gloria. Living his divided personal life had been one thing when they were both married to others, but their relationship was bound to change now that Gloria's marriage was headed to the divorce court. The names of Swanson and Kennedy entwined on Marquise was heady stuff. Marrying the mayor's daughter was good by Boston standards, but the queen of the movies was fuel for international acclaim. There were the children to consider— but he was used to seeing them only intermittently and staying on top of their activities from afar. His two oldest sons were already at boarding schools. As his son John described it later in life, when asked why the Kennedy children had turned out so well, compared with those of the Roosevelts and the Churchills, well, no one can say that it was due to my mother. It was due to my father. He wasn't around as much as some fathers— but when he was around, he made his children feel that they were the most important things in the world. That impact could continue to be felt, whether Joe lived in the same house with Rose or not. But his role as patriarch was a crucial part of his own identity. And then there was the tremendous importance of the family in the abstract. His image as a family man had been an inestimable boost to his public persona. As much as he loved the spotlight, he knew that if he was at Gloria's side, he would always be in her shadow. Hollywood was her world, not his. No matter how many companies he ran or how powerful he became, it was Swanson whose every move was followed by local reporters. For all he had accomplished, for all the column inches his stories took up in the trades, Joe Kennedy was never mentioned in the society columns. In Hollywood, Joe was still the outsider and Gloria was one of them. If he became her fourth husband, the balance of power in their partnership would shift to her. That he could never tolerate. 
Physically, he had paid a heavy price for the way he had been living for the past several years. The first time he had been out with Gloria, he had fumbled to find a light for her cigarette. He had picked up not only a lighter, but a smoking habit as well. He was more than twenty pounds underweight, and the ulcers that intermittently plagued him were back again. Yet there was no way he was going to see the Glendale nutritionist, Swanson swore by. She had even gone so far as to suggest Dr. Henry Beeler might help his daughter Rosemary's slowness, and that resulted in one of the few times she saw the full force of Kennedy's temper directed at her. He was quick to return to his usual solicitous self, and Gloria never knew if he had been upset at her suggestion or at his frustration over Rosemary. It didn't matter. She still believed he adored her and would do anything for her. By early February of 1930, Joe was back in Los Angeles in time to see four Pathé films going into production. He was planning on staying for two months, but he turned over almost all decisions to E.B. Durr. More than ever, Kennedy was delegating authority to the gang. But he did step in when Constance Bennett returned to Hollywood from her Paris fling with Henri. Joe thought it best just to keep her off the Pathé lot— and arrangements were made to loan her to Warner Brothers at $5,000 a week, and follow that with a film at Fox. He could keep the peace and make a profit at the same time. Elisha Walker came to San Francisco in early March to meet with A.P. Giannini, who offered him the presidency of his Transamerica, now a billion-dollar company that included Bank of America and Bank America Blair, created when Walker's company became the securities affiliate of Bank of America the year before. Giannini was turning 60 and planned to remain on the board, but he wanted Walker to take over active management of the company. Walker grabbed the opportunity and headed to Los Angeles, where Kennedy hosted dinners for him, and the two men went behind closed doors for one-on-one -on -one meetings. It had been over two years since Walker had brought Kennedy into Pathé, and since then Joe had not made any major moves without Walker's support and counsel. To Walker's mind, between Pathé and RKO, he still had too much money tied up in movies. Back in early 1928, they had talked of getting Pathé in position to be sold, and at best it had been treading water since then. Others had told Walker they believed Pathé was in a tenuous state, because Kennedy had essentially been absent from the company— and always given Swanson Pictures precedence over Pathé's interests. Walker knew it was much more complicated than that. He had no illusions about Kennedy, but he thought he had a brilliant business mind. While others found Walker to be a cold fish, he and Joe spoke the same language. He assured Kennedy that he wanted them to continue to work together, but it was time to get out of the film business. John Murdoch agreed— he was looking at his seventieth birthday, and the idea of running around to create a new theater chain had lost its luster. Leave that to the young and the hungry. His fortune was secure with the sale of his KAO RKO shares, and he had a beautiful house in Beverly Hills, along with a wife, a son, and a daughter he wanted to spend more time with. One of the reasons Kennedy and Murdoch had cooled on the idea of their own theater chain was that even with Walker's backing, the prices were proving prohibitive. They could pick up smaller theaters in less populous regions, but almost all the movie palaces in the big cities were already claimed by other studios. One of the last of the major independent theater owners was Alexander Pantages, a vaudeville magnate with all the self-righteousness of Ed Albee, but without his pious veneer a Greek émigré who claimed never to have learned to read or write English, and yet built a multi-million dollar fortune over twenty years in vaudeville, Pantages had earned a reputation for double-dealing, taking kickbacks, penny-pinching, and breaking contracts. More complaints were filed against him than any other circuit owner. His shows, however, continued to do blockbuster business, in part because he showed a decided preference for cheap girl flash acts. Pantages had switched from live performers to a preponderance of films in his theaters in the summer of 1927. 
So Kennedy did not have to convince him of the power of the movies when they first met in early 1928. Yet the impresario proved to be contrary at best, appearing amicable one minute, and then claiming he already had an offer of three million dollars, just for his Los Angeles theater. Even his theater in small-town Fresno had cost over a million to build. Once Kennedy took over KAO, he discontinued their discussions. But he was back a year later when he and Murdoch were looking to buy. There had been spates of interest in Pantages's holdings from Fox and others, but he had yet to sell. He owned or had leaseholds on twenty-six theaters in practically every key city in the West. Joe found him an obstinate customer, holding meetings and then claiming, via the trades, that the circuit is not for sale. Back and forth they went during the early months of 1929, arguing over a price tag estimated between fifteen and twenty million dollars. By the time Kennedy decided against moving ahead with his own chain, RKO was interested in the Pantages houses, and they soon shared Joe's frustration. From March through August, there were half a dozen different offers on the table, which Pantages would then pull. In between, he was in talks with other potential buyers. When he finally signed on the bottom line, it was for RKO to buy six of his largest theaters, with Warner Brothers purchasing the San Francisco and Fresno houses. Pantages's plan was to keep the rest for his sons to manage when he ran into a very nasty mess that would haunt him for the rest of his life and tie his name to Joe Kennedy's until this day. A month after the sales had been finalized, Pandagius was arrested in his Los Angeles office on Friday, August 9, 1929, by policemen responding to the screams of Eunice Pringle, a 17-year-old dancer reportedly in his office seeking work. Pantages was charged with criminal assault, spent the night in jail, and then was released after posting $25,000 bail. Headlines were soon reporting every possible scenario from a violent rape to a total frame-up. Los Angeles District Attorney Burren Fitz personally argued the case, and over 25 witnesses testified, including an emotionally distraught Pringle. In the process, several of Pantages's witnesses were charged with perjury, with one admitting that the impresario had promised no financial worries for life if he lied for him. The 62-year-old Pantages was convicted and sentenced to up to 50 years in San Quentin. After trying and failing to gain a release on medical grounds, Pantages hired the attorney Jerry Geisler, who arranged for a new trial, and, after dragging Pringle's reputation through the dirt, an acquittal. Kennedy's off-and-on meetings with Pantages had been reported throughout 1928 and into early 1929, but several decades passed before the men's names were bound together in Hollywood Babylon too. Kenneth Anger reported that Kennedy had bribed Pringle to frame Pantages in order to destroy the man, and then buy his theaters for a song. The plot had been revealed, the story went, in Pringle's deathbed confession, as she lay suffering from a suspicious illness in 1933. A series of books and articles followed Anger's opus, each embroidering the tale. Kennedy had paid Pringle $10,000 and promised her a movie career. District Attorney Fitz was also in on the scheme, and poison was suspected in her death. One book went so far as to simply state, It had all been Joe Kennedy's idea. By the time Ronald Kessler wrote The Sins of the Father in 1996, he had Pringle as violently ill and red in color, a sign of cyanide poisoning, on the night she died in 1933. Kessler asked, Did Joe have Pringle poisoned to silence her? He answered by saying the charge rings true because no autopsy was conducted. No autopsy was conducted for the same reason there was neither cyanide nor a deathbed confession. Eunice Pringle did not die in 1933. After the trial, she became an executive secretary, moved to San Diego, married, and gave birth to a daughter. Pringle died in 1996 of natural causes at the age of 84. 
Joe Kennedy may have done some despicable things in his life, but bribing and murdering Eunice Pringle was not one of them. All this was far into the future, and Kennedy's reputation was still sterling as he continued to search for stories for Swanson to film. He asked her to look into the possibility of a golf story for her, evidently forgetting her mishaps when she tried to play tennis. He bought the World Sound motion picture rights to the book Purple and Linen, and then presented Gloria Fet Accompli with a bound script he had commissioned just for her, entitled What a Widow. The only problem was, according to Swanson, it was absolutely terrible. Alan Dwan had agreed to direct her next film, and together they ran the script past several writers, including James Seymour. The former publicity man from Harvard, whom Joe had brought out to Hollywood after his lecture series, was now under contract as a Pathé writer at $350 a week. Kennedy continued to be nothing but optimistic about What a Widow, and assumed personal charge of the production approving the cast and monitoring the changes Gloria, Alan Dwan, and the writers were making in the script. Joe called in the press to announce they had filmed a dress rehearsal as a unique and experimental method for working out problems before going into production. The film did undergo changes as a result. Lou Cody replaced Ian Keith in one of the key roles, and the plot and dialogue were modified as well. But the flurry of attention on What a Widow was also a guise for Kennedy to quietly release a statement saying that work on Queen Kelly will not be resumed. After all the column inches that had been devoted to the saga over the course of two years, a short item in Variety reported it had been scrapped in spite of the estimated $800,000 spent to date. Settlements were made with the actors who remained under contract— and when pushed, Joe implied that the problem was that his plan to make it into an operetta was just too much music too soon for Gloria. It was to be the last contact Kennedy had with the press during his California stay. He had made his arrangements with Walker, finally bitten the bullet on Queen Kelly, and prepared to leave town. After charging Pathé almost $10,000 in expenses for their recent stay, Joe and Eddie Moore boarded the train on the morning of April 11, 1930. Only a few people knew that this time they were leaving for good. The Rodeo House lease was allowed to lapse, and Moore cabled Durr from Arizona, requesting that the two suitcases and anything else they had left behind be sent to them in New York. Chapter 24. A Good Trick If You Can Do It. Spring 1930. Kennedy had been back in New York for several weeks when a one-page, three-paragraph press release with no headline went out on Pathé's Rooster Stationery. The Pathé Exchange, Incorporated announces the retirement of Mr. Joseph P. Kennedy from active management of the company. The first sentence read, Mr. Kennedy will, however, remain as chairman of the board of directors. It went on to claim that the marked improvement of Pathé under Kennedy allowed him to turn the active management over to E.B. Durr on the West Coast and Pat Scollard in New York. Keeping his future vague, the release concluded by noting that Kennedy had come to Pathé at the request of Elisha Walker and, after a brief vacation, would continue his association with Mr. Walker. For over a year, there had been inklings in the press that Kennedy might leave show business for banking. As early as January of 1929, it was rumored he had been offered the presidency of a new bank, as well as receiving invitations to join Blair and Company or rejoin Hayden Stone. However, there was really no question where he would go next. Being with Walker gave Kennedy a proven financial backer, and put an honorable and admirable face on his departure from Hollywood. As if on cue, a variety of newspapers and the trades ran summations of Kennedy's miraculous accomplishments. Several gave his business acumen an aura of philanthropy by claiming he had never billed Pathé for his expenses. Rumors of a possible sale to RKO, Warner Brothers, or Fox were bandied about, 
but it was reiterated that Pathé was not planning any mergers or changes in policies or personnel. No one believed that Kennedy's retirement meant the end of his activities. As one report put it, Lon Chaney, the man of many faces, is a piker compared with Joseph Kennedy, the man of many plans. As always, Joe took the time to send personal letters of appreciation to reporters and editors who were particularly admiring, such as Syme Silverman of Variety, thanking him for being a loyal friend and confidant, as well as his many, many kindnesses during my stay in the business. As soon as the release went out, Kennedy headed for White Sulphur Springs in West Virginia to spend several weeks putting on some weight and regaining the strength he now believed Hollywood had sapped out of him. His secretary informed anyone trying to find out more that Mr. Kennedy was on an extended vacation, and she didn't know when he would return. Soon, however, Elisha Walker joined him in West Virginia, and together they went over their plans for Transamerica and, most immediately, the Pathé board meeting the first week of June. Just before Kennedy had joined Pathé in early 1928, the company had raised $800,000 by selling what was called 8% stock, because it was supposed to pay dividends at the rate of 8% a year. However, to hold on to all available cash, they had not paid dividends for two years, the entire time Joe had been in charge and that opened the board to a new vulnerability. The stockholders had no standing unless they failed to receive dividends for eight quarters in a row. That now being the case, disgruntled shareholders went into action. Leading the charge against Kennedy was Richard Rowland, the former head of First National Studios, who had retired when Kennedy took over. Rowland, who did not own any Pathé stock himself, was fronting for a group of bankers, stockbrokers, and shareholders concerned they would never see their investment returned. Rowland's dethroning was remembered, and he was billed as an experienced film man, ready to bound back into the picture business. Rowland was listed as chairman of the Pathé Preferred Stockholders Protective Committee in the newspaper ads urging shareholders to join in their right to elect a new board. However, they stumbled from the beginning, claiming in their first letter that Kennedy had resigned as president and Murdoch had resigned as chairman of the board, offices neither of them held in the first place. When the trades and many newspapers, including the New York Times, simply reprinted their release in quotation marks, including the errors, it gave Kennedy an opportunity to demand retractions and set the record, as he saw it, straight. Since neither Roland nor the other three names listed in the leadership were stockholders, and they were not ready to name the slate of officers they were proposing, it was easy to cast doubts upon their plans. The Protective Committee quickly became the Alleged Committee and the So-Called Committee, and the press dismissed them as disgruntled and antagonistic. The Wall Street Journal reiterated its confidence in Kennedy. While the protective committee were spinning their wheels explaining themselves, Kennedy and his group were buying up available stock and gathering proxies. They were soon confident they would go into the board meeting holding control of at least 70% of the stock. Joe wasn't overtly worried, but the protective committee was a public thorn in his side. Over 250 people poured into the Pathé offices on 45th Street in the early afternoon of Monday, June 9, 1930. Pat Scollard stepped forward with a gavel to call the meeting to order at 2.30, and after the reading of the minutes of the last two board meetings, the business of the day was addressed. Two different slates of directors were put forward, one by the Rowland faction, the other by the current board. In spite of the impressive number of stockholders who were present in the room and the public attempts to rally support, the Protective Committee's slate received only 991 votes to 5,960 for Kennedy's. Once it was clear how the numbers fell, there was a call for a vote of confidence in the current management. This brought forth long speeches from the opposition, but to no avail. Not only did the vote of confidence pass, but it was followed by a motion 
that all of the acts of the directors and officers for the past year be approved and ratified. That, too, was carried. The meeting would last until almost seven that night, but in the end, Kennedy not only survived, he triumphed. The protective committee's sorry showing was reported so as to discourage anyone else from questioning the powers that be. Kennedy's big majority brought more public praise for his handling of the situation, and letters of congratulation poured in, including one from Irving Rossheim, Richard Rowland's old boss at First National. On Wednesday, less than 48 hours after the stockholders' meeting, the new Pathé board quietly met in Walker's office at 44 Wall Street and elected officers. Kennedy was re-elected chairman, Durr replaced Murdoch as president, Pat Scollard was vice president, and longtime Pathé attorney, Louis Innerarity, was elected secretary. Arthur Poole was treasurer, and Tom Delahanty, who had been with Kennedy longer than anyone but Eddie Moore, was elected assistant treasurer and assistant secretary. With Joe's financial allies, Elisha Walker and Jeremiah Milbank, among the remaining dozen board members, his control of Pathé was tighter than ever. As was his habit, Guy Courier had spent part of the winter at his villa in Fiesole, Italy, and returned to Boston, assuming he would be able to finalize the agreement, made the previous spring, to buy Joe out of the Gower Street Company. Contact between the men had dropped to a bare minimum. The mandated annual corporate meeting had been held in October, and the three board members, Guy Courier, Joe Kennedy, and Ted Strybert, were re-elected. But that could be done in absentia. Whether or not Courier knew it, Kennedy had made their sale agreement moot by having his attorney, Benjamin DeWitt, prepare an agreement between Joe and RKO that half of all the monies still owed to Gower Street would go directly to Kennedy as of January 10, 1930. What Courier did learn when he returned from Italy was that Cinema Credits Corporation had been stripped of its assets. While there were still several hundred thousand dollars worth of stocks and bonds held under Gower Street, Cinema Credits housed the original $500,000 and another $100,000 plus that had accumulated through interest and investments. Cinema Credits had been created to finance FBO films, and that need had dissolved with the sale of FBO. The investors had continued to receive their quarterly dividend checks through March of 1929, and now Courier thought it was time to return the investments. According to his family, Courier was furious and mortified when he discovered the money was no longer there because his primary concern was for the friends who had invested with his assurances. He had trusted his own instincts and taken a chance on Kennedy when no one else of his stature was willing to, and he had put his own money and reputation on the line for him. The genuine shock Courier suffered and his desperate attempts to repay his friends out of his own money took a physical toll. He was literally made ill from what he saw as blatant treachery. Exhausted and weak, Courier suffered a heart attack, and at his doctor's insistence went to his summer home in Peterborough, New Hampshire. It was there on the morning of June 21, 1930, he suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 62. A dozen prominent Bostonians were honorary pallbearers, including Courier's close friends and fellow investors, Louis Kirstein, Colonel Taratha, and Frederick Prince. Courier was praised for his intelligence, dignity, and contributions to his community in the lengthy and laudatory obituaries. Nowhere was Joe Kennedy's name mentioned. He was on the East Coast and available to attend Courier's funeral if he had wanted to or been welcome. But for the Courier family, his five children, and their children, Kennedy's name became synonymous with betrayal. To them, Kennedy's actions were the cause of the illness that had felled their father and grandfather, just as Fred Thompson's descendants always believed that Kennedy had been responsible for Fred losing his will to live. Two very different families on opposite coasts but both kept their burning hatred of Kennedy within their family circle for years. 
Kennedy told reporters who were still following his activities that he planned to spend his summer in Hyannis with his family, but he shuttled in and out of New York, occasionally flying in to the Cape for a day or two. He rarely attended Pathé board meetings, but the minutes came to him for his approval, and he handled other investments for Transamerica, including notes held on Fox Film Corporation. The May press release that had announced Kennedy's departure from active management of Pathé also contained a one-sentence middle paragraph reading, Gloria Productions, Incorporated" also announces Mr. Kennedy's retirement from the active management of that company. If others had been suspecting that Joe was ready to make a move, Gloria later claimed it came as a complete surprise to her. The version she told in her autobiography was that she caught him using Gloria Productions' money for his own aggrandizement, and when she called him on it, he got furious and left town. Once again, her facts were right, but the timing was off. She would be shocked to learn how much the relationship had cost her, but that would come later. Initially, the transition of the finances was relatively seamless. Her accountant, Irving Wakeoff, rose to be both treasurer and vice president of Gloria Productions, and although the communications between Sullivan, Scollard, and Wakeoff were less frequent, they continued to flow. Kennedy maintained his control, and it was reinforced by the fact that if there were papers to sign, they were passed to Chris Dunphy as president of Gloria Productions. Swanson was immersed in filming What a Widow at Pathé, where the Kennedy-Swanson split was the talk of the lot. Who had left whom? Had Kennedy given her special breaks to Pathé's detriment? Gossip and hearsay were rampant, reported Ed Tambert of the studio accounting office, and some of the remarks overheard were to the effect that concessions were being allowed to Gloria at the expense of Pathé. Because of it, Tambert, on my own initiative, reviewed all the Gloria Productions invoices. He obviously didn't know that the studio manager, William Sistrom, had already gone over all of the bills and removed duplications, corrected errors, and reduced some of the more outlandish charges. Now Tambert reversed all of those credits and put together a bill that included everything ever charged to Swanson, whether accurate or not. Going to work on his project just after Joe's retirement was announced, Tambert was clearly trying to ingratiate himself with the company, even though, as he stated to Sullivan in passing the invoices to him, he was not familiar with the exact services rendered and was not in a position to pass on the merits of the charges. Sullivan, however, was in a position to judge the merits of the invoices. He had to know how much Pathé had already made off of Swanson. Still, the pressure was on to show a profit, and Sullivan figured billing Tambert's invoices to Gloria would be a good trick if you can do it. Using some discretion, Sullivan instructed Tambert to remove the expenses of Mr. Kennedy and his staff for half a dozen California stays, since those were entirely in the interest of Pathé. Sullivan didn't mention that Pathé had already reimbursed Kennedy for all those expenses, or that Gloria Productions had paid him an additional $25,000 for executive overhead. With that one caveat, Sullivan gave his approval to send the invoices to Wakeoff for payment. Swanson and her company had hardly been given a free ride. As Bill Sistrom put it, the studio always gets the best of it when outside producers work out of a studio— and Gloria Productions had been a lifesaver to Pathé, providing a cash flow when no one else was working. He estimated that Pathé had made a clear profit of $150,000 from Gloria Productions before Tambert's billing of an additional $150,000. The contract between Gloria Productions and Pathé called for a payment of $10,000 per film. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. During the time Swanson had been working on Queen Kelly, The Trespasser, and now What a Widow, at least $650,000 had gone through her books and into the studio's accounts. Directors, editors, and crew members under contract to Pathé had been loaned, often with a 10% overhead added to their salary. 
For instance, Eddie Goulding's entire Pathé salary for five months had been reimbursed by Gloria, even though he was working on many other Pathé films besides The Trespasser during that time. She had paid over $200,000 for construction of sets that Pathé would strike and use again. Where the padded costs really added up was in the rental fees for the recording studios. Gloria Productions was billed $700 a day and $400 a night for using facilities that actually cost Pathé $200 every 24 hours to run. These figures were particularly onerous for the trespasser, since Goulding's practice of working from 11 until 7 or 8 in the evening allowed the studio to charge $1,100 for a day of recording. Over the course of a year and a half, Gloria Productions had paid over $40,000 for recording, enough to purchase two complete recording studios. Other charges might not have been as discreditable, but nothing was overlooked. Every time Pathé arranged a screening of the trespasser for the press or influential visitors, Gloria Productions was billed $20. Having been trained over the past two years to do what Sullivan and Scholard instructed, Irving Wakoff had paid all those invoices without a question. But not this time. He sent the Tambert invoices back, along with a formal complaint to Pathé's in-house auditor, Barney Fox. The new charges were a hodgepodge. Thousands were listed as compensation for the salaries of Barney Glazer and Laura Hope Cruz, but without stating what they were working on or when. Gloria had already paid the outrageous recording facilities charges, yet Tambert added charges for days when the equipment was broken and for the repair of that equipment. In spite of the fact Gloria's contract with Pathé made it clear that was all the studio's responsibility. He even billed $130 to tune the studio organ. Yet the most audacious item had to be the $19,000 for the building and furnishing of Gloria's bungalow. It was, after all, studio property, and their contract called for Pathé to provide suitable housing for their stars— the fact they had to build it underscored the increase in status Gloria's presence brought to the studio. Barney Fox went back over the Gloria Productions contract with Pathé, compared it to the invoices in question, and agreed with every one of Wakeoff's contentions. In his letter to Sullivan, Fox concluded, We made a very substantial profit off Swanson before these new invoices, most of which were inappropriate attempts to be reimbursed for general overhead. Fox practically warned him that if Swanson hired outside auditors, they would likely find even more charges that she should not have been responsible for. We attempted to get as much as we possibly could get out of Swanson, Sullivan told Durr after reading Fox's report. But it seems to have failed to work all the way. They knew Fox was right about what an audit would find, so Sullivan recommended they cancel the invoices without any hesitation. Wakeoff agreed to give Pathé all the sets, free and clear, in exchange for erasing the contested charges. Fox estimated that the value of the sets was at least $75,000, and if those could be official studio property, it would boost the bottom line of Pathé's value. Within two days, Sullivan turned around a final agreement to cancel all additional charges for Wakeoff's signature. But the damage had been done as far as Gloria was concerned. The extra invoices were the catalyst for her to look at her books for the first time in years. And now she realized that Gloria Productions had been a sieve through which Pathé paid its personnel and covered its overhead when they had no productions of their own. Kennedy had loaned her money, and then used it to pay expenses at his own studio, leaving Gloria responsible for paying back those loans. Besides the $700,000 borrowed from Kennedy, a $500,000 line of credit at 6% interest had been established with Bank of America. Minimum payments had been made, and the loan had continued to be renewed, but they held Swanson's UA contract as collateral. While she had hardly been deprived, 
Swanson had personally been paid only $50,000 for each of the three films she had made under Kennedy's tutelage. It was a far cry from the million dollars a year Jessie Lasky had offered her. That independence she had so desperately wanted when she left Paramount had carried a heavy price tag. Now she was a million and a half dollars in debt, triple the amount of when she first sought Kennedy's help almost three years earlier. Gloria was outraged seeing all the figures in one place. It was unprecedented to have the head of the studio also being in charge of the outside production company. Yet in spite of the rumors to the contrary, it was Pathé that had benefited at the expense of Gloria Swanson. Later in life, Gloria said, Joe Kennedy operated just like Joe Stalin. Their system was to write a letter to the files and then order the exact reverse on the phone. Clearly, her harsh judgment reflects her bitterness, but she was not alone in her assessment. Doris Kearns Goodwin sums up Kennedy's approach by saying, He saw the world as a never-ending battleground, and he could plot and make use of people without compunction, including the woman he professed to love. What really infuriated Swanson was finding herself being treated like any other business investment, a property to be profited from. She had given Kennedy total control with total trust. She had watched as he had cut off a series of her previously close associates and witnessed him betraying his own colleagues. But now that it was happening to her, she was truly stunned. She had been blinded by their personal relationship. After all, hadn't they spoken of love and even marriage and children? At a minimum, she had assumed they were in it together. They weren't. He had arranged to loan the money, and it was incumbent upon her to pay it back. By this time, the profits from the trespasser were flowing in, yet they did not replenish Gloria's bank account. They went to pay back her financier. She would never fully recover. There was a silver lining to her experience, William Dufty says. You should have seen that woman read a contract. She made sure she understood every single word. Chapter 25 I am now definitely out of the motion picture industry. Mid-1930 to early 1931 Gloria Swanson was not the only one left on her own when Kennedy departed California that April. Joe and his gang had worked together for years like a tight-knit family, but that relationship was about to undergo a seismic shift. In a cable from the train, Eddie Moore told E.B. Durr, Up and at em, kid. Do the best you can without me. I'll do the same by you. That might have been taken as a typical farewell, but the response Durr received the next week, when he ran questions past Kennedy, was different from anything he had heard before. Joe wasn't even available to talk to him, and it was Eddie who relayed the message. He told me to tell you, and to tell you in no uncertain terms, that you two were running things there, and this was one of the problems that you would have to straighten out yourselves, for he would not talk with anybody any more about it. Best and good luck. Durr and Charlie Sullivan had served long apprenticeships, and when Durr was elected president of Path A in June, he had no choice but to step out of the shadow. It didn't take long for him to be comfortable in his new role, and he was soon making major changes. He began personally supervising all productions, increasing budgets on films he deemed worthy, and reorganizing the writing department under Eugene Walter. For almost four years, Durr had been commuting between coasts, but now his wife and daughter Betty finally made the move to Los Angeles. The biggest shock Durr gave to the industry was his decision that Pathé would no longer sell films sight unseen. Since losing their access to most KAO theaters, they had to sell to exhibitors again, and Durr was convinced they were getting so little for their films because of their history of second-rate features. He knew the only way to convince buyers he was serious about improvement was to let them see the films first, and then, hopefully, 
pay top dollar. He announced a 200% increase in production costs and was soon credited with revolutionizing Pathé's production and sales. He dropped several actors' long-term contracts, concentrating on only a few stars, and then filling in with single-film deals for character actors, such as Hedda Hopper and Zesu Pitts. The first big hit under his reign was the Philip Berry play Holiday, starring Anne Harding and Mary Astor. While Durr obviously had faith in the film, even he was surprised when it grossed one million dollars. His second success was Her Man, starring Helen Twelve Trees, which brought in eight hundred thousand dollars at the box office. The gang were now the front men to the point that photographs of Durr, Sullivan, and Scollard appeared in ads in the trades promoting Pathé's films. Yet it was Durr the Doer who was receiving the concentrated, positive press. He was labeled solid, silent, and sensible, and a proper heir to DeMille and Ince, who had previously overseen the same lot. Durr was credited with knocking them over with distressing regularity and keeping his tight little organization on its collective toes. According to the trades, he was bringing glory days to his studio, which had been on the skids a few months back. When Holiday premiered in early August, Durr was on the red carpet alongside every celebrity in Hollywood, and he was there at the microphone being interviewed as the president of Pathé and producer of the picture. It was heady coverage for a man used to operating behind closed doors, and while Kennedy had been the one to push him out front, it had to give Joe pause. While Durr handled the creative side, Pat Scollard monitored the minutia of the finances and learned an appreciation of the nuances that made a difference on the bottom line. Too much blank film left at the end of a reel was a waste of money. So were too many copies of a film in distribution but too few cut into profits. It was a delicate balance, to say the least, and it was Scollard who stayed on top of it all. Arthur Poole stepped up to help keep the records, and he knew the per-print earnings of every film, including the shorts and the newsreels. But it was Scollard who questioned the costs, down to a one-hundredth of a penny on a foot of film. He even factored in the cost of transportation in choosing where to develop film. Invoices had to be matched, credits given, and charges allocated. It wasn't unusual for a dozen letters to go back and forth over only a few dollars. At a moment's notice, Pat could tell Joe how many prints were out and exactly where they were, in America and throughout the world. It had been almost three years since Kennedy had sat in Cecil B. DeMille's office and threatened to sell the company— but now that he was really under pressure to sell, the stock price was becoming an issue. The sharp rise earlier in the year had been caused by manipulation and merger rumors, but there was little left in Joe's bag of tricks. The insurgents could be blamed for only part of the beating the stock took after the June meeting. Joe had everyone looking for income anywhere they could find it, selling stories to other studios and loaning out contract players— they even made a deal with an accounting firm to review their past tax returns to see if there was any chance they had overpaid the government. There was no initial fee, but they would split any refund. While reporting a profit, Pathé's published financial statements were as vague as possible. Kennedy and his minions had used every bookkeeping device to put a rosy sheen on the company— he pushed much of the loss into the period before he had become chairman of the board in mid-1929, but it was getting increasingly difficult to blame the previous administration or sing the praises of a turnaround. Film properties were moved between Pathé Sound Pictures Incorporated and Pathé Exchange Incorporated, and money was shifted among Bank of America, Bank America Blair, and Jeremiah Milbank so that it was close to impossible for an outsider to get a real picture. Categories were adjusted so one balance sheet was not easily compared to another, and a special reserve fund was created to absorb costs that had been underestimated. Between set-asides, transfers, and special reserves, 
Even Price Waterhouse had to keep coming back for clarifications in order to do their in-house audit. The trades had given up trying to analyze Pathé's finances and reported their accounts shed little light on the company's condition. In spite of, or because of, the lack of transparency, Bank of America gave Pathé an adverse report. The fact was that Pathé had no cash reserves, nothing to mortgage, and a negative earnings record. On top of that, the mortgage on the studio was due to be paid in full in a few months, and they either had to extend it once again or come up with over $400,000. Only Joe, Arthur Poole, and a few others knew they were in the red by $1 million for the first three quarters of 1930. It would have been possible, if challenging, to save Pathé, and there were a few encouraging signs. Under Durr, the image of their feature films was improving, yet that would take time to make a real difference in the income flow. Turning the company around would also require a desire to make that happen, investors willing to stay in for the long haul, and an administration dedicated to building up the company. None of that existed anymore. While Durr was putting in long hours in Culver City, Kennedy made only token appearances at the New York office that summer and fall. He wasn't even in attendance at the special meeting of the board in August when Durr flew in from Los Angeles to act as chair and give a several-hour presentation on where the company was, production-wise, and what could be expected through the end of the year. Pathé had over 1,000 employees throughout the world and over 13,000 stockholders, but Joe Kennedy was no longer one of them. Few, if anyone, outside of the gang, knew of the tremendous personal profit he had made from selling his Pathé stock. He did not brag about his wealth, or of dodging the stock market bullet of 1929. Instead, he downplayed his fortune, and talked about trying to hang on to what money I have. His tack also made it easier to dismiss the innumerable letters he received, asking about employment. He had already made his killing, so now Kennedy's focus was on his reputation and the holdings of Walker, Milbank, and Murdoch. They were the ones with the most money remaining on the line, and they wanted out. Howard Hughes expressed an interest in buying Pathé, and he spent some time around the studio he also met with Joe Schenck about the possibility of joining U.A., and then bringing Pathé and their stars with him. But Schenck didn't believe the value was there, and he was particularly concerned at the moment about theaters. United Artists had managed to put together a small chain of their own, but the last thing he would advocate was buying a studio without a theater circuit attached. If there was a company with a compelling reason to purchase Pathé— it was RKO. They were already intertwined through agreements that caused much annoyance to both companies. RKO was obligated to distribute films over which they had no control, while not paying Pathé enough to warrant higher production values. Buying Pathé would nullify that contract, as well as increase RKO's studio holdings and their star rosters. But even with that logic— and a price tag Variety assumed to be something of a bargain, Pathé was not an easy sale to make. RKO already had their collective hands full with reorganizations and cutbacks, while having over two million dollars riding on big-budget films such as Cimarron, with its six thousand extras. In early June, Kennedy and Walker sat down with RKO's president, Hiram Brown, who told them in no uncertain terms he wasn't interested in most of Pathé's assets. But he was willing to offer $1 million for the studio and the star's contracts. That was assuming they first paid off the studio's $400,000 mortgage. Even then, Brown said he was willing to bail them out entirely on account of his friendship with Mr. Walker. Bail them out? Kennedy wasn't about to admit they needed that and he didn't want to sell Pathé piecemeal. The exception might be their newsreels, which both Paramount and Fox had expressed an interest in. As Durr was busy promoting the 25th anniversary of the oldest trademark in newsreels, 
Kennedy was debating whether he could get more for it as a separate entity or as part of a larger package. Hiram Brown might have been hesitant, but David Sarnoff was serious about buying Pathé, and Walker was serious about selling it. So Kennedy, along with Sarnoff and Walker, met with Brown in his office in late September to see if they could all get to the same page. They agreed that Joe would present a proposal listing all of Pathé's assets, and within days Brown had the financials on his desk. Kennedy put a total value of $12,714,000 on the company, almost half of which came from their 49% ownership of the DuPont Pathé Film Manufacturing Company stock. DuPont Pathé was paying dividends of $40 a share, or around a 3% return on their investment. Brown wanted nothing to do with DuPont Pathé. Kennedy could put a $6 million value on it, but the fact was that it was bringing in less than $200,000 a year. Brown was looking to grow RKO, but he wasn't interested in long-term investments, let alone any white elephants. His balance sheet also included $1 million of goodwill attached to Pathé News and the contracts of Pathé's stars and directors. Their completed but unreleased films were valued at $1,750,000, and the same amount was given for the land, the studio, and all the equipment housed there. Brown quickly went to work making his own notations on Kennedy's calculations. The half million Kennedy estimated for the equipment at the home office and branches was easily scratched because many, if not all, of the branch offices would be valueless to RKO. Nor did they need Pathé's laboratories in Jersey City and Boundbrook, or their British exchanges, because they had just opened their own foreign distribution unit. Kennedy's other values weren't questioned, as they could easily be confirmed or reduced through an outside audit. He didn't even put up much of a fight over the $1 million for goodwill, as long as it covered the entire company. He was ready to move ahead with the caveats that they could arrive at a fair price for the assets that remained on his list, and Pathé would accept payment in RKO stock, because all the working capital is necessary for continued operations. Kennedy, on the other hand, wanted cash. What was Brown worrying about? After all, Lehman Brothers was there to back the purchase. But he refused to budge. And just as Kennedy had taken off for Palm Springs during his negotiations with DeMille, Brown now left on a hunting trip to the Adirondacks, where he would be out of reach for at least a week. This time it was Joe's turn to cool down. Time was of the essence. Production-wise, Pathé was hedging its bets. They continued producing short films and made new deals for serials, such as one with Newt Rockne to collaborate on One Real Football Shorts, Otherwise, the studio was now featureless, with nothing new planned to go before the cameras. The major players, such as Constance Bennett and Anne Harding, were on loan to other studios, keeping the cash coming in, but leaving the lot empty. Durr was playing the good soldier, walking a tightrope as all decisions were now put through the filter of the potential sale. Almost anything he did impacted areas they might not be controlling for long, including his own salary. Durr had ascended to the presidency of Pathé without a raise from the $700 a week he had been receiving for years. That was way below that of other studio heads. Yet knowing of the need to keep the costs low, Durr now asked Kennedy to increase him to $2,000 a week on paper until the sale went through. That way, once he was with the new company— his remuneration would be more in keeping with the Hollywood norm. Joe, however, took it to Hiram Brown, who was in no mood for hearing about any new expenses. The parties gathered again at the end of October, and by the 1st of December the boards of both Pathé and RKO had approved the deal at a price of $4,500,000. They settled on half a million in cash, and the rest in six percent notes, to be paid in five equal installments. At 6.45 on the evening of December 4, 1930, Kennedy signed the contract 
to sell the agreed-upon portion of Pathé to RKO. Later that night, Joe cabled Elisha Walker that he thought the deal was a magnificent one for us. I am happiest because I know you will like it. Within days, letters went out to various interested parties, including Pathé stockholders, giving them twenty days' notice before they met to ratify the sale. Another letter was sent to Pathé's employees, and it had a familiar ring to it, assuring everyone that RKO planned to keep our entire present staff, and promised that you need have no concerns. Kennedy also wrote to John Murdoch, at home in Beverly Hills, I can't tell you what a relief it is to me to get this cleaned up. It was so loaded with dynamite over the past three or four years that anything could have happened. Murdoch had been riding the Pathé roller coaster with Kennedy, and so he understood when Joe, uncharacteristically and dramatically, proclaimed, I believe this has probably taken another five years off my life. Kennedy was relieved and exhausted but he needed to stay in New York for another month for the stockholders' meeting in early January. Joe could call the deal magnificent, because it was for the financiers such as Walker, whose loans to the company were about to be repaid. The thousands of shareholders, on the other hand, were being asked to approve the liquidation of the company, and therefore their chance at future profits. Two-thirds approval was needed, so the push was on to gather proxies. Obviously, Walker, Milbank, and Murdoch were among the largest shareholders, but others came through as well, such as Cecil B. DeMille, who still held 26,000 shares. In the meantime, lawyers and accountants were going over everything with a fine-tooth comb. The Protective Association, which had sought to replace Pathé's leadership six months earlier, came out in force once again. It had been a little over a year since the crash— and the stock market had continued to slide. People were desperate to find something of worth in their portfolios, and for many their Pathé stock was their last hope. This time there was no stock swap. Pathé shareholders would be left with an investment that consisted of little more than DuPont Pathé stock. Kennedy spent the first two weeks of December in and out of meetings with disgruntled stockholders, but his patience with calls for audits and company records was running out. He found such demands perfectly ridiculous, but he told the Pathé attorneys to tell me what to do and I will do it. The lawyers drafted a letter for Kennedy's signature, claiming that any outside audits at this time would seriously hamper the officers of the company in the performance of their duties. The best they were going to get was a meeting with Arthur Poole, and, perhaps, a representative of Price Waterhouse. Scollard took some of the heat, fielding calls and holding meetings, such as one with a Mr. Wickham, who worked for a hundred dollars a week in the escrow department of Citizens National Bank in Los Angeles, and had used most of his savings to buy sixteen thousand dollars worth of Pathé stock. Even after spending two hours with Scollard, Wickham was not placated and vowed to use his last two thousand dollars suing to stop the sale. He joined others who refused to be mollified, and filed a suit against RKO, Pathé, and a dozen individuals, including Kennedy, Walker, Durr, and Scollard, to stop the sale. The New York Federal Court gave the defendants twenty days to respond, a date coinciding with the Pathé board meeting of January 5th. Those dissidents— seeking relief in court, were only a small portion of those questioning the sale. Some who wrote Kennedy expressed their concerns very politely, such as Dan Sullivan, who had worked with him at Columbia Trust. Sullivan had put $1,000 into Pathé stock, buying when it was near a high point, but believing Kennedy's business ability meant the speculation would prove profitable. Sullivan still had enough faith to include his proxy— and Joe responded by saying, while he made a firm practice never to prophesy, he hoped that the liquidation of the company would result in the stock being worth more than he had paid for it. How that could be possible, he didn't explain. He assured other shareholders who wrote him personally that he would never urge any of my friends to buy securities in any of his own companies. But— I honestly believe that this proposed trade will be of great benefit to the corporation— 
and I urge you to send your own proxies with those of your friends. He never actually said it would benefit the shareholders, but he made it sound as if it was his idea not to include the DuPont Pathé stock as part of the sale. He claimed that RKO was buying only losing assets for a substantial amount of money, and that keeping DuPont Pathé gave them equity interest in a company that is very prosperous. Other letters were pleading and desperate, but a handwritten and unsigned letter he received bears reprinting in full and unedited. Mr. Kennedy, we are going to put you on the spot. You have fair warning. We are not going to be like you, sell Pathé Inc. out on the stockholders and then push them out with nothing. We are not going to plug you, or we are not going to stick you in the back. But we are going to cut your throat from ear to ear as a warning to others what pulls the same deal. Now you can go to Europe or any other place, but we will get you anyway when you least expect it. You know, Kennedy, the stockholders of Pathé are all poor people and nothing else. And you ruined them to make yourself more richer than what you are. You have Rolls Royce cars, a house full of servants, all with your crooked work. But you are at the end of you rope. This is one time you made a mistake. We were very careful and went and found out who sold out the stockholders and pushed them out with only a piece of paper to hold. And we found out that you are the one that pulled the deal. Well, so long till we see you, the sooner the better. You will have a note pinned on your cloth to tell why you passed out. The letter obviously had an impact on Kennedy because he kept it in his permanent files. Perhaps he took the threat seriously enough that, in case something did happen to him, evidence would be there. Yet it didn't dampen his determination to go through with the sale, and it certainly didn't make him more empathetic. It had been over a year since the fire at New York Pathé's studio had claimed ten lives and injured dozens— Insurance settlements averaging $15,000 each had been negotiated with most of the families of the deceased. John Flynn and Henry Lally would persevere through over two years of trials and multiple grand jury hearings before finally being cleared by the New York Court of Appeals in the spring of 1932. If Flynn thought he would have support from Pathé, he was mistaken. Initially, he had been reassigned to Culver City— with trips back and forth between the coasts for court appearances. But the board decided that when his contract came up for renewal, it should be allowed to lapse. The Flynn children and grandchildren grew up knowing how his need for years of legal counsel had drained his savings, and aware of his belief he had been betrayed by the company. John Flynn III, still in the family business as an Emmy-nominated cinematographer, remembers that at just the mention of the name Kennedy, the look his grandfather gave told the entire story. For Joe Kennedy, it was back to the Pathé offices on 45th Street on January 5th, 1931, for the stockholders' meeting to approve the sale of the company to RKO. This time there was plenty of warning of possible trouble. So when he entered the room, he was surrounded on both sides by private detectives, with their uniform jackets pulled back to reveal belts laden with cartridges and big revolvers. Joe was greeted with jeers that could be heard throughout the building, and the detectives stood near him and the ballot box throughout the meeting. The armed men didn't intimidate Joseph Kahn, a Rhode Island theater owner and Pathé investor, who committed on the spot to buy Pathé for one million dollars more than RKO was paying. He even waived a certified check for $25,000 to seal the deal, and claimed he had money men waiting at the Astor Hotel for word of his success. However, when Khan refused to name his backers, he lost the momentum of the gathered throng. Still others yelled out that Pathé was worth three and four times the selling price, as much as $25 million. The hordes were obviously going to continue to be rowdy as long as Kennedy was there, so he left the room. The New York Independent Theater owner Sidney Cohen then announced that, after careful examination, he was supporting Kennedy and the sale. The crowd booed louder than ever and accused Cohen of being paid off. 
Another voice charged that it was an inside deal, since some men were on both the RKO and Pathé boards. In spite of the vocal and at times menacing howls, when the ballots were counted, the insurgents found themselves with fewer than 10,000 votes, compared with 668,000 for the Kennedy regime. Joe went home to pack for Palm Beach, but just as it looked like nothing could jeopardize the sale, Constance Bennett made headlines that did exactly that. For almost a year, the actress had been threatening to cause trouble. Since spending the holidays in France with Henri, Constance had been encouraging rumors of their impending marriage. Yet Gloria had not filed for divorce, and Constance was not happy about being tied to the studio where her lover's wife ruled the roost. After being loaned to Warner Brothers, Bennett found that studio more to her liking— when she went directly to Kennedy with her complaints, he called Henri in Paris to discuss the situation. Henri was still in Pathé's employ, but he was hardly crucial to their operation. Bob Kane told Joe he found Henri absolutely useless. He would like to give the impression he is a big guy, and when he does not succeed in giving this impression, he runs away and sulks. Kane assured Kennedy that many others in Paris shared his opinion— but Joe knew exactly what Henri brought to the table. He had been hired originally to get him out of Gloria's bed. And while that was no longer necessary, he required tending. His affair with Bennett was part of the problem. But so far he had been the proverbial perfect gentleman, waiting for Gloria to make a move. No one needed to say out loud whom he could name as co-respondent if he was the one to file the divorce papers. Now Henri advised Joe that it would be best for all concerned if Pathé released Constance immediately, because she wouldn't be happy otherwise. It was, as he none too subtly put it, the only way to quiet everything and avoid unpleasantness. There was little doubt that Constance could make matters much worse. Her own sister, the actress Joan Bennett, called her quixotic, turbulent, stubborn, and aggressive. Yet Constance had become one of Pathé's biggest moneymakers, and Joe wasn't about to release her. If that was the case, she demanded changes in her contract. It fell to E.B. Durr to handle the negotiations, and after much discussion it was decided Bennett would remain under contract to Pathé through 1934, at the increased rate of $2,750 a week for 42 weeks a year. She was also given a $10,000 bonus— and the rare right to share in the profits made by loaning her to other studios. Durr signed off on the new contract in early September of 1930, but it is impossible to believe he and Kennedy did not discuss it, let alone that Kennedy wasn't the one who urged him to placate her in the first place. Durr had always done everything Kennedy had asked him to do, and for years Joe's had been the only opinion that mattered. Durr's loyalty was proven yet again that year when he cleaned up another loose end for the boss by sending Gloria Swanson a legally laced letter claiming that he had never had her power of attorney. But if he ever had, he had done only what Miss Swanson, or the Gloria Productions Incorporated, authorized me to do. And he had not used it during the year 1930. With her contract changes in the offing, Bennett was back on the Pathé lot, and her film, Sin Takes a Holiday, gave Durr a third solid smash hit. Shooting had begun in July, just as Swanson was rapping What a Widow. Gloria threw herself into promotion plans for her film, posing for pictures to promote a contest for trips to Paris, where the lucky two dozen winners could follow the route taken by Gloria's character in the film. Then the release date was postponed a month in order to shoot a new ending, featuring her flying home on a Dornier airplane to coordinate the film's release with the airline's first transatlantic passenger flight. Even Swanson's costumes were packed up to be displayed in a tour of department store windows as What a Widow was screened in various cities. If the picture wasn't all she had hoped for, the attendant publicity was the biggest and most unabashed yet. 
When Gloria stopped her whirl of activity, it was hard not to notice that Henri had returned to Los Angeles, moved into a hotel, and was frequently out and about with Constance, even occasionally attending the same parties as Gloria. Finally, in October, Swanson filed for divorce on the grounds of abandonment. She set the date of Henri's desertion as September 18, 1929, the day she and the Kennedys had sailed from Europe after the explosion in the Paris hotel room. Her attorney was none other than Milton Cohen, the lawyer so abruptly dropped several years before. Constance Bennett was now able to enjoy her stardom and her new contract, alongside her now formally announced fiancé. Still, that wasn't enough for her. She saw her opportunity to publicly declare her bank ability when Warner Brothers offered to pay her $300,000 for those ten weeks a year she wasn't working for Pathé. That price tag resulted in the headlines that January of 1931 that threatened to throw a wrench into the Pathé sale. Bennett was considered a Pathé asset, and her value raised new questions about Pathé's actual worth. That $300,000 worked out to be over $1 million a year, more than RKO had paid for all of Pathé's contracts with actors and directors with the newsreel division thrown in. Had Kennedy devalued the company just to pay back Pathé's biggest investors? Some dropped their jaws at a salary that was the equivalent of $800 for each working hour. But Pathé's board of directors was not amused. As the members turned apoplectic, Kennedy knew he had covered himself at a special behind-closed-doors meeting the month before, where he suggested that perhaps the making and modifying of contracts needed to be more clearly defined. In the past, Contracts had simply been reported under miscellaneous business, without being ratified. But Joe proposed that no officer of the company had the power to alter contracts without the express authority of this board. The motion passed unanimously. And to seal the potential blame on Durr, Kennedy added a line declaring that this did not constitute approval of any such action heretofore taken by any such officer. Pat Scollard was assigned to investigate Bennett's Warner Brothers contract, and a week later the board held another special meeting. For the first time since Kennedy had taken over the company, neither he nor Scollard was present. However, Scollard's report was there, and it put the responsibility for the changes in Bennett's contract directly in the lap of E.B. Durr and, to a lesser degree, Charlie Sullivan. The board voted to send letters to both Bennett and Warner Brothers, informing them that a secret attempt to establish an alleged supplement agreement to her original Pathé contract was totally void. If they moved forward, Pathé would file a complaint with the Hayes office. The board also voted to inform Durr that his attempted modification of Bennett's contract was invalid because he totally lacked authority to enter any such agreement. They needed a fall guy, and Durr was it. Kennedy had provided the rope, Scollard tied the noose, and the board pulled it. Frantic that the contract dispute not derail the sale of Pathé, the board decided it was best to fully explain the situation to RKO, and then follow their wishes. Hiram Brown said he did not think that the revelation should hinder the agreement, but he put Pathé on notice that if Durr and Sullivan remained employed beyond their next board meeting, any unauthorized acts would have to rest upon the company. Brown certainly had no love lost for Durr after he had taken his best films out of RKO's distribution channels and sold them to the highest bidders. Brown was not that enamored with the entire Pathé deal, but he wasn't about to go against Sarnoff, Walker, or even Kennedy— Yet if Durr thought anyone, including Kennedy or Scollard, was going to stand up for him, he was sadly mistaken. Kennedy and Scollard became silent and unavailable, and were absent again at the next board meeting two weeks later, where it was affirmed that an officer of the company could be removed, with or without cause, 
by a majority of the board. It was resolved that Mr. E. B. Derby and hereby is removed from the office of President of the Corporation, and his employment forthwith discontinued. Effective immediately. Pat Scullard was put in full charge of all the corporation's business and property in California, and was assigned to notify Durr of the board's action. It was also left to Scullard to inform the banks that Mr. Durr no longer has the power to sign checks. Charlie Sullivan was not an officer of the company, but his firing was implied, and that too was left for Scullard to handle. Durr had witnessed Kennedy turning against and cutting off close associates before, exercising his sanguinary actions without a qualm. He had seen the shock and pain inflicted on the likes of Fred Thompson and Guy Courier. Durr had helped Joe to strip Gloria Swanson of her employees and watched as she became totally dependent upon him, only to be dropped herself. Yet the gang had seemed sacrosanct and the thought that the boss might betray one of them had never entered the equation. For years they had served Kennedy without question, whenever and wherever he needed them. But without Pathé, let alone the rest of his companies, he didn't need all of them anymore. While none of the specifics of the Durr situation were made public, it was reported that he and Kennedy were no longer on friendly terms— Scullard, who had spoken with Durr and Sullivan on an almost daily basis for five years, had to make a choice, and he chose Kennedy. Pat had remained in New York, and therefore was physically closer to Joe, and less susceptible to hearing the criticism or seeing the impact of Kennedy's actions. Not that outside opinion had ever seriously influenced the gang. The fact was that Durr and Sullivan had served their purpose and were now disposable. Just as he had shoved the baseball into his pocket and walked off the field at Harvard, leaving behind the shocked players who had thought they were a team, Kennedy had turned and walked away from those who believed they were his partners, Fred Thompson, Guy Courier, Eddie Goulding, Gloria Swanson, and now E. B. Durr and Charlie Sullivan. It was as if a steel curtain went down and they all ceased to exist. Without emotion or introspection, Joe had become a man capable of insulating himself in self-justification. After all, they had all let themselves be put in a situation where they could be taken. If there was any fault to be found, it was with them for being naive. Kennedy kept those he needed. Eddie Moore and John Ford were still on the payroll, and Arthur Poole stayed with Pathé, where he could monitor the financials and keep Joe apprised of information before anyone else. From the beginning, it was obvious Poole had a grasp on more than just numbers, and Kennedy had grown to depend upon him for analyses of people as well as accounts. Scullard's responsibilities shifted as he fronted property holdings and stock sales for the boss, as well as serving as the overseer of Kennedy's diverse investments. Pat's loyalty was rewarded by being elected treasurer of Pathé, and he picked up an extra $200 a week with the title. He was also elected to the board of directors of Columbia Trust, where Ethel Turner was still serving as the hub of activity for various bank accounts, including Scholard's. Both Poole and Scholard continued to operate out of the Pathé office at 35 West 45th Street, but the company went from filling nine floors of the building to a total of nine employees. Hiram Brown moved quickly to announce that the resignations of E.B. Durr and Charlie Sullivan have already been accepted, and that RKO was challenging Constance Bennett's contract with Warners. What remained of Pathé was now referred to in the trades as the other Pathé, the shell of the former company that held the DuPont stock and minor miscellany such as the New Jersey Film Laboratory they hadn't been able to sell to RKO. The Pathé name continued to appear on the screen and operate separately as Pathé RKO until October of 1931, when David O. Selznick was brought in to supervise the merger of all RKO's production units. Kennedy had left for the Oasis Club in Palm Beach shortly after the stockholders' meeting in early January. 
For the rest of the month, opponents continued to challenge the sale, taking out ads and requesting support from shareholders to press our fight more vigorously through lawsuits and at the annual meeting. They were of little enough concern to be left to Arthur Poole to monitor, and he dismissed their attempts as unimportant and too vague to induce anyone to part with hard cash. When the sale to RKO was official on January 30th, 1931, Poole told Joe they celebrated by drinking a toast to the old Pathé. Joe was ready for some serious relaxation, and in his correspondence, it was clear a weight had been lifted. As he put it to B.P. Schulberg in declining his invitation to become a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, I am now definitely out of the motion picture industry. Kennedy always said, the only real place for a vacation is Palm Beach. And he wasn't so exhausted that he cut down on his socializing. Gloria's old friend, Sport Ward, reported to her that he had seen Joe out and about with a woman he thought, at first glance, was Gloria. But upon closer inspection, it turned out to be the actress Nancy Carroll on Joe's arm. Of course, Sport told Gloria. Joe and I had a good laugh over it afterwards. Chapter 26 The Richest Irish American in the World 1931-1935 Joe Kennedy was one of the few people laughing in early 1931. With the sale of Pathé, he had completed his mission taking care of himself, his family, and the few other men who mattered to him at the time. He was not only an isolationist politically, but personally as well. He had become a man who had friends and cronies, but none he considered an equal. There was no one he respected who could look him in the eye and say, No. He was forty-two years old, and the basis of his fortune was firmly established— as the rest of the world sank into the Depression, he was worth at least fifteen million dollars, and was declared the richest Irish American in the world. The Boston Globe calculated he had made as much as twelve million dollars from the film business. Fortune magazine conservatively estimated that Kennedy profited personally some four million dollars by his FBO dealings, three million from Pathé and KAO, one million with RKO, and, very probably, half a million from sidelines, a total of eight million five hundred thousand dollars. And that was profited personally. A New York Times reporter later concluded that when Joe left Hollywood, he already had so much money that making the rest of it, which must have been many, many millions, was almost a routine affair. Kennedy's departure was perfectly timed. Initially, the Depression did not affect the movie business, for films were the one cheap form of entertainment people could afford, and needed more than ever. And the moguls seemed impervious to the world's reality. While bread lines were forming across the nation, Louis B. Mayer's daughter, Edie, was receiving gold demitasse spoons from Tiffany's as a wedding present. Yet once the Depression circled the globe, it hit Hollywood with a wallop, and box office receipts dropped by almost 50 percent. Over 12 million people were unemployed, with little money for food, let alone movies. The glamour films that Swanson had perfected were no longer in vogue. Now it was the broad comedy of the matronly 60-year-old Marie Dressler that packed the theaters. MGM, with the help of Men and Bill, Tugboat Annie, and Emma, was the only major studio operating in the black. Paramount, RKO, and Fox were either in receivership or on the verge of bankruptcy. Universal shut down, citing national emergency. No one was safe, and even bosses such as Joe Schenck suffered tremendous losses. When Kennedy finally submitted his letter of resignation as chairman of Pathé in May of 1931, due to the condition of his health, it was accepted by the board with deep regret. By then he was back at the Cape, enjoying his first real summer at the beach in years, and Rose welcomed him back with open arms. 
photographs from the time are witnesses to Joe's presence and Rose's radiating smile of relief. Her stoic perseverance during his long affair with Gloria Swanson had paid off, at least in her mind. Joe's return to the family hearth was further testified to by the arrival, in early 1932, of their ninth and final child, Edward Moore Kennedy, four long years after the birth of Jean. As he sat back and assessed the world around him, Kennedy was more concerned than ever about the state of the world's economy. He saw the growing international depression as genuinely threatening capitalism. The haves were fewer than ever, and millions of have-nots were mired in poverty. He believed there cannot simultaneously and successfully exist in the same nation a political democracy and an economic oligarchy, and therefore came to what he considered the practical conclusion that he preferred to hand over half his fortune to taxes rather than to lose all of it to a socialist revolution. He also understood that, with the crash and the depression, power was moving from the financial centers to Washington. Kennedy joined the presidential campaign of Franklin Roosevelt, contributing his own money and soliciting others with such fervor that he was soon labeled one of its key financial fathers. Joe and Eddie Moore flew to Warm Springs, Georgia, for a weekend of meetings with Roosevelt, and then Kennedy made a trip to San Simeon. While he couldn't resist placing calls to a variety of former colleagues to drop the fact he was in residence, Joe was there to talk to Hearst about supporting Roosevelt. The publisher continued to hedge his bets for the moment, but it was Kennedy's phone call to him from the Chicago Convention that many credited with swinging Hearst and the California delegation Roosevelt's way. Joe and Eddie spent several weeks that fall campaigning by train with Roosevelt. Just as he had stood out in a room of studio moguls, the remarkably handsome and charming Kennedy was noticed among the politicians and top advisers as an affable raconteur. He worked his magic to bring old acquaintances, such as the banking Giannini brothers, into Roosevelt's sphere, and was also appreciated for his generosity when he provided buses for the group to visit the Grand Canyon and tickets to the World Series so his fellow travelers could witness the New York Yankees defeat the Chicago Cubs. Kennedy's involvement in the campaign was so well publicized that when Roosevelt won in a landslide that November, Joe was inundated with letters of congratulation. Will Hayes simply referred to him as Mr. Secretary, assuming he would receive a cabinet post. Joe responded by saying that returning to the picture business would give me much more pleasure than anything in government. He continued his practice of sending Christmas presents to his film contacts. In spite of his protestations, there was nothing Kennedy wanted more than to be Secretary of the Treasury. Yet he was hardly the typical New Dealer, the phrase Roosevelt had first used in his nomination acceptance speech, and was soon applied to his supporters. Other Roosevelt insiders were suspicious of Joe, but the President-elect loved a good give-and-take, and and was hardly above setting his advisers against each other. While he valued Joe's broad reach and insights— Roosevelt didn't know what to do with him. So Kennedy simmered as he sat in his leased Palm Beach home from January through April of 1933, and, as his disgruntlement grew, he used his time to continue to profit in the stock market. After mild fluctuations, prices had dropped even more severely over the two years since the crash, but he managed to benefit just the same. Using Eddie Moore's name for some accounts and working out of various brokerage houses, Joe entered a few well-chosen stock pools and perfected the practice of selling short, borrowing stock at the going price, selling it when the price dropped, then returning the stock and pocketing the difference. Any company he thought was vulnerable was fair game. One of his prime targets, and personal profit makers, was Paramount which continued to fall. 
While he hadn't heard from the president directly, Joe continued his friendship with the Roosevelt's son, Jimmy. James Roosevelt had graduated from Harvard, married the beautiful Boston socialite, Betsy Cushing, and started in the insurance business in Massachusetts, where his success had grown in direct proportion to his father's importance. Kennedy had befriended the 26-year-old Jimmy during the campaign, and soon Joe was being billed as one of the first and biggest discoverers of Jimmy. Kennedy underwrote some of his travels and put money directly into young Roosevelt's account at Columbia Trust. Now, Jimmy acted as his father's conduit, asking Joe if he would be interested in being a trade minister to Uruguay or ambassador to Ireland. Kennedy was insulted and more determined than ever to profit from his campaign support. If Roosevelt was not going to take advantage of him, Joe would take advantage of Roosevelt. Communicating through the president's son and his secretary, Missy Lahand, Joe was soon the proud possessor of two enormous permits, allowing him to import alcohol for medicinal purposes. Providing the alcohol for doctors' prescriptions was a huge market by itself, but there was tremendous potential profit in having liquor at the ready when Prohibition was repealed. Joe and Rose took the young Roosevelts with them to London, where Jimmy was seen as the American equivalent to the Prince of Wales. His star power opened the doors to Haig and Haig and Dewars, where Kennedy locked up most of the whiskey output of the British Isles. He returned to New York, just before Utah became the 36th and final state necessary to ratify the 21st Amendment, ending Prohibition. He formally incorporated his liquor importing company, calling it Somerset, presumably taking the name from Boston's preeminent and exclusively Protestant social club. Ted O'Leary and Tom Delahanty were still in Joe's good graces, and they were given the job of running Somerset Liquors. By the time Prohibition was officially lifted, a significant amount of Kennedy's liquor had already crossed the ocean and been distributed throughout the country, ready to supply a thirsty nation. Christmas of 1933 found Joe back in Palm Beach, where he finally bought a home of his own. Once again, his timing was perfect. Having resisted jumping into the Florida land boom of the 1920s, he now picked up a seven-bedroom, Addison Meisner-designed oceanfront estate with a pool on two acres, on Millionaire's Row, at the depression-induced price of only $100,000. Kennedy was becoming convinced that any governmental appointment of merit was going to elude him, and told friends he was seriously considering going back into the picture business. Yet when others reached out and tried to get him, or at least his cash, involved again, he claimed, When I retired from Pathé and the Swanson thing, I'd really washed up my entire interest in the picture business, and conditions, to me, look so unsettled today that I am still of the opinion that I want to remain on the sidelines. Then, once again, Jimmy Roosevelt stepped in, facilitating an invitation for Joe and Rose to visit the White House. Kennedy joined the president at the gridiron dinner, and Rose began her practice of writing each of her children, individually, on White House stationery. Their scrapbooks would reflect the tangible evidence of their parents' importance. After a year in office, Roosevelt was deep into revamping the economy through regulations, creating federal programs to put people to work and rebuild the country's infrastructure. The Securities and Exchange Commission was still in the process of being created, but its purpose was to reform Wall Street and to eliminate fraud, to eliminate misrepresentation, to eliminate concealment of information, and to make members of the exchange, members of the market, accountable for what they did. Would Kennedy be interested in heading up the commission to abolish the market's most blatant abuses that he had so handsomely profited from? The president was under attack by the business community for trying to overturn this society in a fundamental sense, and certainly no one could question Kennedy's knowledge of the stock market. 
He was a capitalist to the core, knew where the loopholes were, and, as Joe himself put it in classic understatement, I had a technical training, and I had some years of experience, which gave me knowledge of a very intricate business. Roosevelt was said to have told intimates with a smile that it takes a thief to catch a thief. In a private meeting, Kennedy swore to Roosevelt that the bulk of my money had been made by business acumen rather than Wall Street operation, and promised he would be a credit to the country, the president, himself, and his family, clear down to the ninth child. The president might have been convinced, but he still waited until the night before he left for a month-long vacation cruise to announce Kennedy's appointment. Wall Streeters saw Joe as a traitor, and New Dealers saw the appointment as a sellout. Once again, he was the outsider on the inside. But this time he was on the national stage, and he knew what he had to do. In Hollywood, he had studied how people became personalities, and now he applied that art to himself. He had been working the Washington press since being on the campaign trail, and now he turned to the likes of Herbert Swope and the financier Bernard Baruch to solicit their support in reaching out to reporters willing to give him a good start in his new job. One of the most important was Arthur Kroc, the Washington-based correspondent for the New York Times. Kroc was charmed from the start and believed Kennedy was a man who had so much money that his only concern was repaying the debt he owed the country where he and his family had thrived so extraordinarily well. Kroc began trumpeting both Kennedy the man and his appointment, further refining the biography Joe had so carefully cultivated. Now the New York Times was giving its imprimatur to the story that he had been a star on the baseball field at Harvard, had turned down offers from professional teams to enter banking, and that it had been only because of his ability so extraordinary that he was invited to become president of Columbia Trust. His time as a business administrator of various film companies had earned him the admiration of both Hollywood and Wall Street, but he retired from the movies because his health was impaired. Still, Crock's claim that most strained credulity was that Kennedy had never been in a bear pool in his life or participated in any inside move to trim the lambs. His Wall Street operations have been with his own money, in the interest of his own holdings. After a tumultuous first meeting behind closed doors with Roosevelt's other commission members, Kennedy emerged as chairman of the SEC. He beamed as he met with reporters and announced that the days of stock manipulation are in the past. In answering the barrage of questions, Joe assured his new public that any success I ever achieved was in administrative work and not in market operations. His next step to elevate his persona was to give his first major speech as SEC chairman to the National Press Association, complete with a nationwide radio hookup. His message was one of hope for economic recovery, going hand-in-hand hand with market reform, assuring investors that no honest man need fear the regulations. At work at his $12,000-a-year job, in an office that he personally paid to have air-conditioned, Kennedy reestablished his relationship with the president. It wasn't unusual for Joe to be at the White House several times a week. He took to his role as the market's regulator with a vengeance and set about hiring a staff that was young, smart, and unaffiliated with Wall Street. He reached out to future Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, then a professor at Yale, who in turn brought in his prize student, another future Supreme Court Justice, Abe Portis. Eddie Moore was there as well, as confidential assistant. He stayed on Kennedy's private payroll, but was also made a government employee at one dollar a year to allow him access to all government documents. There was some talk of the family moving to Washington, but they remained in Bronxville while Joe leased a 33-room Maryland estate known as Marwood, overlooking the Potomac River. 
several miles northeast of Washington, Marwood stood on over 100 acres and featured a dozen master bedrooms, a pool, and a basement made over into a 100-seat movie theater. The three-story mansion came completely furnished and with a full complement of household staff. With only Joe and Eddie in permanent residence, it quickly became a party house, or as the frequent visitor Arthur Crock called it, an amazing chateau. Joe regularly entertained press lords and reporters, senators and congressmen, and even the president and Missy LeHand. Dinners on the terrace for twenty or more were common several nights a week, and while Joe would occasionally go north to visit the family for the weekend, more often he stayed at Marwood. He made full use of the theater, arranging to show films before or just as they were being released, keeping up the impression that as his power grew in Washington, his connections to Hollywood were as strong as ever. Joe was in touch with someone near or at the top of almost every studio, and they were perfectly willing to cooperate with him. But instead, he went directly to Will Hayes to ask him to arrange with all the companies to make available pictures for showing at my home. It was a micro-example of Kennedy's methods of operation, in which little was not calculated. If he asked the studios for films, they would be doing him a favor— if Hayes made the gentle suggestion, providing Kennedy with films became the fulfillment of a request from the MPPA. The result was that his position of power was reinforced, without any chits accumulating in his column. Hayes was suffering some slings and arrows, primarily from Catholic and other reform groups, leading a renewed charge for censorship. Crime movies such as Public Enemy and Fallen Woman films, such as Red-Headed Woman and Blonde Venus, had provoked their wrath to the point that Hayes asked Kennedy to talk to Boston's Cardinal O'Connell about toning down his protests. Yet after years of assuaging the zealots with lists of don'ts and be-carefuls for film content, a full-fledged, unwavering production code was now to be enforced. Hayes tried to put a positive face on it, claiming that, at last, we had a police department, and its new chief was the very Catholic Joseph Breen, a former public relations man who had transformed his push for the code's enforcement into a well-paying job. Questions were raised whether Hayes had negotiated himself into a position where he was a mere Hindenburg, with Breen as the new Hitler of Hollywood. But Hayes held on. Kennedy kept up with all the latest by corresponding regularly with his old friend Arthur Houghton, now at the Hollywood office of the MPPA. Joe stayed in touch with Nick Schenck, Sidney Kent, and other studio executives, lunching with them when he was in New York. One of Eddie Moore's tasks was to ensure that Kennedy's lifetime subscription to Variety was changed with each move, from Cape Cod to Washington to Palm Beach and back again. Joe almost couldn't help himself from looking at possible ways to re-enter the film business. He made sure he had prints of the films he had produced, and had not been scrapped. He double-checked that he retained the rights as well, just in case he wanted to remake them. Yet no one was clamoring for his services at the moment, and, as he wrote to Houghton in early 1934, while there were plenty of companies needing a steady hand— I still see no signs of any sanity in the picture business. The members of the gang who remained were now part of a more decentralized operation, yet they were still the traffic cops, making sure everything ran like clockwork. Pat Scollard oversaw Joe's remaining Wall Street investments and in various Delaware corporations, while Johnny Ford was in Boston, supervising Maine and New Hampshire, as well as Kennedy's other New England properties and investments. Arthur Poole had remained at RKO, but available for special assignments, and Isidore Kressel had replaced Benjamin DeWitt as the primary attorney. Ted O'Leary and Tom Delahanty were at Somerset Liquors, headquartered at 230 Park Avenue, where business was booming for the exclusive importers of Dewars and Hague and Hague. Eddie and Mary Moore took an apartment at the Park Chambers on West 58th Street, 
Joe had his suite at the Waldorf, but he needed a New York base and someone to oversee that operation. To fill that role, he promoted Paul Murphy, who had been taking care of small details for him since the late 1920s and would be depended upon for decades to come. Murphy continued to work out of Pathé on 45th Street until Joe took a suite of offices at the newly opened Rockefeller Center in late 1934. Loyalty was still key to survival, and the overall purpose was the same, to keep everything running smoothly and profitably with a minimum of Joe's involvement. Travel arrangements and the coordination of the various Kennedy homes fell to Murphy, down to keeping the inventory of the liquor at each abode. But it was Johnny Ford who made several trips to Bronxville to check on how their electric bills could be lowered and what trees needed to be removed. Murphy and Ford also handled the hiring of the household staffs down to the chauffeurs. The giving of gifts to family and friends continued to be delegated. Some employees and extended family members were simply sent cash from the New York office where a holiday gift list was maintained. Rose relayed her wishes to the office, and then Paul Murphy sought Joe's approval for her requests. Rose also used Murphy to communicate with her children's schools and doctors, and the older boys grew dependent on Sir Paul, as Jack called him, to meet their personal needs. The Kennedys' twentieth wedding anniversary was celebrated by sending each other loving cables, as Joe stayed home and Rose went to Paris. Roosevelt appreciated the image Kennedy projected, photographed with his wife and nine children, yet the president knew full well of his philandering. In private, he advised him to be more discreet, but Joe wasn't about to change his ways. Kennedy continued to work hard and play hard, averaging twelve hours a day at the office when in town and chalking up 65,000 air miles over the course of a year. Still, he rarely missed his morning horseback ride, a swim in his pool, or an outing that would serve his interests, such as the White House Correspondents' Dinner. In addition to his relationship with Arthur Croc, which showed its presence regularly in the pages of the New York Times, Joe befriended the columnists Walter Winchell and Drew Pearson, and publishers such as Colonel McCormick of the Chicago Tribune and Sissy Patterson of the Washington Times-Herald. Joe also made frequent appearances in newsreels that showed him in shirt sleeves behind his desk at the SEC. Kennedy made time to socialize with a few like-minded men within the administration, such as Jean Vidal, Roosevelt's director of air regulation over at the Commerce Department. Gore Vidal remembers his father speaking fondly of Kennedy, and the days when they were, unencumbered by their marriage vows, two young guys on the make, both chasing girls. After 14 months as chairman of the SEC, Kennedy resigned in September of 1935, and reporters and cameras packed his office to review his accomplishments. The number of stock exchanges had been reduced. They all operated under the same rules, and stocks had to be registered before they could be sold. The response to his departure was just as vocal as the one that had greeted his appointment, but this time it was overwhelmingly positive. He made the cover of Time, and Kennedy's SEC was generally conceded to be the New Deal's most successful reform. What had not even existed a little more than a year before was now a going concern on a firm foundation. As was his practice, Joe sent several dozen letters to reporters, editors, and publishers from the New York Times on down, graciously thanking them for their coverage. The letters were slightly personalized, but each began with the phrase, I am leaving public life for good, and then went on to express his appreciation and best wishes. Words like fairness, most helpful, and deeply grateful were sprinkled throughout. He knew how to leave them smiling. Certainly there had been bigger and more famous Wall Street wolves, but none made a more dramatic turnaround Kennedy had done what he did best, go into a new territory with his figurative guns blazing and make an impact in record time. Years before, he had told a fellow broker they had to make their killing before someone passed a law against it, and now Kennedy was the public face of those changes. 
It was emblematic of his perfect timing. He had been in there with the best of them when the going was good, but hadn't spent an ounce of energy resisting what he knew was inevitable. Instead, he embraced the shift and claimed it as his own. Chapter 27 Wall Street Awaits Kennedy's Findings 1936-1937 After leaving the Securities and Exchange Commission, Kennedy took off for a European vacation. But by November of 1935, he was back in New York, profiting from a bear market, catching up with old associates, and looking for new opportunities. His Hollywood experience came back full force in an unwanted way when he was called to testify before Congressman Adolph Sabbath's committee. They were investigating real estate transactions in corporate reorganizations, and since theaters were deemed to be real estate, several film company executives were subpoenaed. Johnny Ford had been called before the committee in October, and his testimony was a primer on how to answer without saying anything. He responded yes or no or I don't know to questions that were often based on misconceptions that Ford did not correct. He could honestly say that Kennedy didn't own any film company stocks, because if he did, they were held under the names of Delaware corporations. Kennedy had already had several run-ins with Congressman Sabbath over the SEC, and testifying in private at the New York field office, he put the committee on notice that the whole transaction savored of persecution. Then, just days before Christmas, he was recalled from Palm Beach to testify again. And this time he didn't wait to voice his complaints. He opened by informing the committee that any questions about Pathé were outside their proper scope because it had not been in receivership nor reorganized prior to its sale to RKO. Technically, he was correct. Pathé stockholders may have been severely short-changed, if not downright defrauded, but they never had been bondholders of real estate subject to bankruptcy. And the last thing Kennedy wanted was a microscope put on that sale. It had been almost five years since RKO had bought Pathé, and the changes in Hollywood since then had been substantial. The tremendous cost of transitioning to sound was just beginning to be recouped, when the bank closures of early 1933 strapped the studios for cash. The studio heads responded by slashing salaries up to 50 percent, and that became the catalyst for the formation of unions, so long successfully doused by Louis B. Mayer and his fellow moguls. David Sarnoff, still president of RCA, had faced a variety of crises of his own, but the company had grown to be a behemoth, with subsidiaries larger than many corporations. RCA was a leader in almost every area of communication, and before the crash the stock was over $500 a share. But the company had been hit hard since then. Antitrust action forced General Electric and Westinghouse out of RCA, and in spite of Hiram Brown's confidence that selling movies was just the same as selling anything else— he was proven to be in over his head when RKO went into receivership. By 1935, RCA was millions of dollars in debt and in desperate need of reorganization. Sarnoff may have parted with Kennedy under strained circumstances, but he had always respected Joe's abilities, and now he needed him again. RCA had solicited three different recapitalization plans, but there were conflicting interests. Each favored one of the three types of RCA stock, and Sarnoff wanted an impartial viewpoint that emphasized the long-term health of the company. Kennedy had just left the SEC, who better to ensure that its revised structure was on proper legal and fiscal grounds. Would Joe consider coming in for a month or so to study the plans and make his own recommendations for recapitalizing? For his time and trouble, he would be paid $125,000. It was the type of assignment that was perfect for Kennedy. He had a clear task he was uniquely qualified to carry out, with complete access to all the books. He agreed to Sarnoff's proposal, and by early December 1935, Joe was in residence in Palm Beach, 
quietly going over the company's accounts. He made a quick trip to New York, interviewed a few key people, and took the promoters of the various plans to lunch. In less than a month, he submitted his 23-page report, recommending that all three of the proposals be rejected in favor of his own Kennedy plan. Joe told David, and it was once again Joe and David, it was equitable and, most important to Sarnoff, management retains the goodwill of its stockholders and the confidence of the investment and speculative public. Kennedy personally reviewed the printer's proofs of his proposal, which was accepted by both the board and the shareholders. He spent the rest of the season in Palm Beach, basking in the praise generated in the press over the RCA recapitalization. Sarnoff announced earnings were projected to be over $1 million for the next quarter, and all three levels of RCA stock saw an increase in value. Did this foreshadow Joe's re-entry into the film business? Variety reported that various approaches had been made to him, but predicted that if Roosevelt was re-elected, Kennedy would be named Secretary of the Treasury. No announcements should be expected until after the election. The source for the speculation was obviously Joe himself, as he seems to be the only one who consistently put his name forward for that cabinet post. But as he looked around in early 1936, there were several studios temptingly ripe for a takeover. At the top of the list was Paramount. It had everything Kennedy had tried to put together elsewhere, a bustling studio, a dynamic distribution unit, and thousands of theaters. And, best of all, it was in a chaotic mess, just begging to be saved from itself. Adolf Zucker had withstood previous assaults, and was no slacker when it came to a fight. He had taken on William Hodkinson back in the teens, and First National in the early 1920s, and, in the process, accumulated one of the largest theater circuits in the country. Paramount was still operating in the black when 1931 dawned, claiming $300 million in assets and almost $20 million in annual profits. However, Zucker's personal wealth of $50 million was in Paramount stock, and he used it to buy more theaters, guaranteeing the stock value at $80 a share. When the price fell to below $50 and those purchase agreements were called, Zucker lost his fortune, and the company fell into a complicated bankruptcy. A railroad receivership is child's play compared to this vast, multi-headed company— the attorney, Elihu Root, said, in justifying his firm's $1 million legal bill. The morass eventually involved over 50 law firms in bitter, lengthy court fights. The maelstrom of lawsuits, even the lawyers were sued, left the company close to anarchy. Zucker's longtime partner, Jesse Lasky, left in 1932 to join RKO. Sidney Kent, who had headed distribution, moved to the presidency of the new 20th Century Fox, and Sam Katz, after attempting to dethrone Zucker, had jumped to MGM. Paramount emerged from these battles with a clean new corporate structure, but with fewer than a thousand theaters and a board of directors made up of ill-assorted bankers and real estate men representing the largest claimants against the company. As Fortune reported tongue-in-cheek, all that remained was for the new management to learn the movie business. The now 62-year-old Zucker was moved to what was commonly acknowledged to be the harmless office of board chairman. After almost a year of floundering, the new Paramount regime was facing the public release of their annual financial statement, and there was no hiding the fact their stock price had sunk to $8 a share. The board needed to do something dramatic to assure their shareholders they took their situation seriously, and several members suggested that Joe Kennedy had the combination of skills and experience to make a powerful statement, a man who had run more studios than any other executive, yet who also spoke Wall Street's language. The last week of April of 1936 found Kennedy in New York, negotiating to be Paramount's special advisor, 
with full and complete authority to conduct a survey of the affairs of the corporation. In other words, everyone in the company was mandated to cooperate with him and provide any information he needed to turn the company around. Joe could hire whomever he wanted with all his expenses covered, but the amount of his salary was left to be determined at a later date. That was just how he had started with Path A, and he ended up chairman of the board. So he agreed, but with a few demands of his own. Kennedy was most adamant that he was to be free of any interference, and warned he wouldn't be reporting back to the board until his findings were complete. In the meantime, they weren't to fill any of their current vacancies. Ready to do whatever he wanted, a special board meeting was called for Friday morning, May 1st, to ratify the agreement. And that very afternoon, Joe was in Paramount's New York office, beginning his latest challenge. One of his first moves was to bring in Johnny Ford to handle the theater end of the investigation. Paramount's theater holdings may have been slashed by two-thirds, but that real estate was still a major portion of the total value of the company. Leaving Ford in Manhattan, Joe, along with Pat Scollard and Arthur Poole, headed for the airport to fly to Los Angeles. Poole had stayed on at RKO as treasurer through the fall of 1935, when he decided, I can always get a job, but I can't always get the kind of job that is most worthwhile. He took Joe up on his long-standing offer to rejoin him and moved into the Rockefeller Plaza office. As a show of trust, Kennedy put Poole on the board of his Cinema Credits Corporation, kept active as a shell to house his stock holdings. By Monday, the trades were headlining the news that Kennedy had been unanimously invited by Paramount to spearhead a survey of the situation, to report and make recommendations. In a quote that echoed the Pathé appointment of eight years before, it was stated that, in his role as advisor, he is assuming no direct authority. On Tuesday morning, Kennedy, Poole, and Scollard were at the Paramount studio on Melrose, which dwarfed the abutting RKO, formerly Joe's FBO. Paramount was bigger all the way around. They had more than 80 actors under contract, including Gary Cooper, Carol Lombard, Fred McMurray, Claudette Colbert, and Charles Boyer. They also boasted 60 writers, such as Preston Sturgis, Charles Brackett, Clifford Odets, S.J. Perlman, and Dorothy Parker. The boys were back in business. Kennedy spent his first day in meetings with Adolf Zucker, whom the board had authorized to have a voice in production. A series of production chiefs, including B.P. Schulberg, Walter Wanger, and the director Ernst Lubitsch, had been shown the door, and Kennedy's former employee, William LeBaron, was now holding that position. It had been over seven years since he had left Kennedy and Queen Kelly, which he was supposedly supervising, to go with RKO, but that was water long under the bridge. There were other familiar faces as well such as Barney Glazer and Cecil B. DeMille. From the outset, Kennedy broadened his scope. A master of sending messages while actually saying very little, he praised the company and then asked, How that potentiality can be most fully realized? What line it should take? What changes in major policies? These are the questions I shall try to answer in my role, which is equivalent to a committee of survey and policy. He emphasized his assignment was open-ended and claimed he had no preconceptions about what he was going to advise. The word was out that the slate is to be wiped clean, and New York was no longer making the decisions. When Joe moved into the office suite of the current president, John Otterson, there was no question of who was in charge. Underscoring Kennedy's power, Scollard settled into the second largest office. Kennedy had come up in the world in more ways than one. This time he took up residence in the Beverly Hills home of the Countess de Frasso, a jet-setter before there were jets. Rich in her own right, through family money, she had picked up a title by way of a second marriage and was famous in the movie capital for taking Gary Cooper to Europe and teaching him the finer things in life. 
She gave headline-grabbing parties when she was in town, but just as often she was at her villa in Italy or her apartment in Manhattan. Joe reported he couldn't have been more pleased with the Bedford Drive home and the full staff that kept it running like a top. Joe didn't have to let people know he was in Los Angeles. The trades took care of that for him. He was soon inundated with letters from old associates, some wanting just to catch up, others looking for work. To most, he reiterated that he was not mixing in any question of personnel whatsoever. Being unattached in Hollywood gave Joe a new social freedom, and he became friendly with the town's preeminent agent, Charlie Feldman. Having an agent as a close friend was anathema to most studio heads, even former ones. But Charlie and Joe both considered themselves the best at what they did, and they gravitated to success in others. They were also both charming, if notorious, womanizers, known for their self-deprecating sense of humor. Charlie, like Joe, never let a little thing like marriage get in the way of a good time. Orphaned at a young age, Feldman had worked his way through USC Law School and practiced for several years before he handled his first Hollywood contract. It didn't take a genius to figure out that a $5,000 paycheck for negotiating a million-dollar deal for Edward G. Robinson would have been $100,000 if Feldman had been his agent instead of his lawyer. So he changed shingles. By the mid-1930s, Charlie was firmly established, but he ran head-on into Louis B. Mayer's wrath when he married the gorgeous MGM ingenue, Jean Howard. Mayer had it in his head he was going to marry her, in spite of still being married himself. And when Jean wed Charlie, Mayer swore he would not allow the agent on the lot or hire any of his clients. Hollywood being Hollywood, Mayer had to break down eventually, but not before disparaging him all over town. Everyone knew that to help Charlie Feldman was to cross Mayer. But Kennedy couldn't have cared less. In spite of the fact Joe was supposedly only advising, he upped the Paramount contract for one of Charlie's biggest clients of the moment, Claudette Colbert. From behind his big desk at Paramount, Kennedy interviewed executives and reviewed production records. He had the perfect excuse to question everyone about everything. The methods behind their operation, the way they organized production, and the efficacy of outside contractors. It was a refresher course on how to, or how not to, run a fully integrated film company. Their costs were out of control but Kennedy was most shocked by the board's blatant mismanagement. He had been among the first to bring financiers onto boards of directors, but the complexities of Paramount's receivership had allowed creditors and bankers to dominate decision-making to the point there was no one who understood filmmaking. Not that Kennedy was going to go after all the board members. Instead, he set the stage to play some against others— and he cultivated those who could be of long-term interest. John Hertz, whose yellow cab company Joe had saved over a decade before, had been on and off the Paramount board over the past several years, and Henry Luce was currently on the board. Kennedy had socialized with Luce in Washington, reaching out to the man a decade younger who had created Time magazine shortly after graduating from Yale. Luce was still in the process of building his own publishing empire when he and his new beautiful blonde second wife, Claire Booth, came west and asked Joe to dine with them. Luce was fleshing out ideas for his latest creation, Life magazine, and Claire was working on a play entitled The Women. They may have been the power couple of the moment, but Claire dubbed Joe the Destiny Shaper of the West Coast. After almost a month in Hollywood, Joe flew back to New York to meet with the Paramount board. He was as vague as possible and told them his report would not be ready for several more weeks, just in time for their scheduled annual stockholders meeting on June 16, 1936. 
At the moment, the board was more concerned about Adolf Sabbath's congressional investigation, which had expanded to include lawyers and others who had profited from receiverships. Paramount, with its tortuous and complicated legal history, was a prime target. With their annual meeting only weeks away, the last thing they needed was a public airing of their failures. Joe took on the challenge, and though he had rebuffed the committee the previous winter, he now cabled Sabbath that he was deeply appreciative of the constructive work he was doing, but was concerned about the ultimate good of the security holders. A hearing at this time would only confuse matters. Couldn't they at least postpone the hearings until after Paramount's stockholders' meeting? Kennedy was enough of a Paramount outsider and a Washington insider to pull it off. Sabbath agreed to defer calling Paramount indefinitely. Kennedy's swift and effective action was a tremendous relief to the board, and as he returned to Hollywood, Variety fanned the flames of anticipation by headlining, Wall Street awaits Kennedy's findings. Joe wasn't talking. Instead, he went into seclusion, along with Scholard and Poole, to write a devastating fifty-page report on Paramount's condition. What had gone wrong at Paramount? According to Joe, just about everything. He claimed the company's recent financial report showed only a bookkeeping profit, and in reality they were seven million dollars over budget, and lying to their stockholders. The opening pages of his report were a course in basic film economics. While acknowledging business in general had been bad, he pointed out that since 1934, every studio but Paramount had been recovering. No one was left unscathed. Talent was now, unfortunately, unionized, which strengthened their salary-grabbing methods. Then there were the agents— who were strangling producers with their death-hand clutch. Producers habitually overspent, but he found DeMille the worst offender. The shooting schedules were being disregarded, expensive stories junked, and, as Fortune later summed up his charges, costly stars were being alienated, writers were loafing, truck drivers were sulking, and things generally were in one hell of a mess. Kennedy saved his harshest shots for the men at the top. He practically charged the board with fraud and ineptitude, and suggested that executives should have fixed nominal salaries with bonus payments when and if net earnings justify them. His report was cloaked in secrecy, because his plan was to deliver it personally at the stockholders' meeting, where he could sway the convention into believing he was the only one who could save the company from itself. The trade speculated that Kennedy had too many outside interests to confine his future activities to Paramount. But if it was necessary for him to take over after submitting his report, he would oblige. Variety, among others, got wind that Kennedy was planning to call on the entire board to resign and name an outside proxy committee. Joe didn't comment directly, but he did allow that he— did not know of any movie man competent and willing to take charge of Paramount. The rumors were enough to convince Adolf Zucker that Joe was planning a coup. Zucker wrote Rose a thank-you note for letting Joe come to Hollywood, and told her, We all feel it would be a great loss if he did not remain with us. But that was the last thing he wanted. If Kennedy ran Paramount, Zucker knew he had no chance at a continuing viable role, and therefore he had to find an alternative leader. So while Joe returned to New York by plane, Zucker boarded the train with Barney Balaban, who had continued to run Balaban and Katz theaters since their merger with Paramount, and talked his ear off all the way. According to Balaban's son, Leonard, Zucker believed Kennedy would take over the company unless something drastic was done. He was confident the one man the troops would rally around was Balaban, who was blunt, uncomplicated, and respected within the company. If Balaban was on the fence, the idea of Kennedy taking over Paramount had to move him. He had distrusted and actively disliked Joe since their run-in over First National almost a decade earlier, 
and Balaban had come to think of him as a man interested in films only because he craved recognition and loved the reflected glory. Zucker might have been a man out of favor within his own company, but according to Balaban's son, he still had the clout to arrange for Kennedy to be met at the boardroom door, be paid off on the spot, and barred from entering the meeting. The story of the payoff may be apocryphal, but the results were the same. Instead of the stockholders hearing Joe's conclusions, his report was accepted without being read. The board didn't want Kennedy's criticisms to be publicly aired, and, as Zucker had hoped, Balaban was elected president, in part because he was a known quantity with unassailable experience, and in part because he stopped Kennedy. Joe went home and waited, and after two weeks he had his attorney draft a letter telling the Paramount board that, "'Since I have had no word from you that you desire me to press the investigation further, I assume that my services are at an end. I would thank you, therefore, to fix my compensation as provided in said resolution, and cause the same to be paid to me.' When he finally heard back in early July, it was to thank him profusely for his report and claim they had given a great deal of time and thought to the solutions of its management problems. After several pages of resolutions stating their appreciation and due consideration, they concluded that the prompt action Kennedy had called for had been dealt with by electing Balaban president. Joe would have to wait for a decision on his remuneration. As Balaban moved to New York to take over Paramount, and Zucker returned to Hollywood to supervise production, Kennedy seethed in Hyannis. He had been the horse at the gate, chafing at the bit to take over, and now they had dismissed his work, used his chits with Congressman Sabbath, and had yet to establish his fee. Several more weeks would pass before a letter arrived telling him that the executive committee had set his stipend at $50,000, less than half of what he had received, for the much less time-consuming RCA restructuring. Kennedy was livid. But what could he do? He had agreed to keep his compensation open, under the assumption it would lead to greater things. He curtly informed them he was willing to accept that amount without further discussion, only because of the condition of the company. He couldn't resist one final jab, and, addressing the full board of directors, asked that copies of his report be sent to all stockholders, since my recommendations have not been followed. His three-month-long mission to skyrocket to the top of the business had misfired. To minimize any public damage— and make it look like his choice, Joe sent a blanket missive to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Variety, and a dozen other press outlets stating, I have concluded my work as special advisor with the filing of my final report, and am not now associated with the company in any capacity. Privately, he told individual reporters that Paramount was still in a mess, and he was not at all impressed with their idea of working it out. The irony was that, with all he had learned and experienced, Kennedy may well have been an excellent studio head. He appreciated aspects and nuances of the business that only a man seasoned by both success and failure could. But he had named names and taken no prisoners. To have elevated him to president would have emasculated the board and most of Paramount's executives— as well as called all the studio's operations into question. Franklin Roosevelt turned to Kennedy to help raise campaign funds for his re-election. But Joe suggested something else he could do that would promote both the president and himself. Author a book entitled, I'm for Roosevelt. Joe claimed he wanted to take a crack at the people who should be down on their knees thanking Roosevelt— because he had saved the capitalistic system. As supportive as his verbiage was, he didn't actually write the book. While still in Hollywood with Paramount, he arranged for John Burns, who had worked with him at the SEC, to write a comprehensive outline, and then Kennedy offered Arthur Crock a thousand dollars a week for five weeks to help put it in shape. 
I'm for Roosevelt was released in August of 1936, and almost immediately went into extra printings. Full of facts and figures, it was a detailed and credible review of conditions in the country when Roosevelt came into office, and the success of his programs to date. The book was syndicated in newspapers, thousands of copies were distributed to local democratic organizations, and it was a catalyst for profiles and articles on Kennedy in national newspapers and magazines. In the process, he was promoted as a financier of national reputation and a father of nine children, both taglines being crucial to the image that was being massaged into celebrity status. Just as the story of the films had increased his credibility within the film community, I'm for Roosevelt set Joe apart from other new dealers and added a patina of power and prestige. In spite of this new burst of publicity, Kennedy was without a specific job or assignment. Friends noticed a change in Joe as he was given to long silences, deep distractions. By late 1936, Pat Scollard had served his purpose. He was removed from his various positions, including as the on-paper president and treasurer of the ubiquitous Fred Thompson Productions. The corporation had been kept alive to house stocks Kennedy had owned for years, but didn't want his name attached to, as well as recent acquisitions that were turned around quickly, such as Paramount. To further distance himself, Kennedy had Thompson Productions placed under the trust he created for his children. Eddie Moore shepherded seven of the Kennedy offspring through Roosevelt's second inauguration in early 1937. The speech, the parade, and a White House reception. Joe stayed close to home, as Rose was suffering a deep depression, and had not left the house since the unexpected death of her sister Agnes the previous September. Rose was not well by any means, Kennedy wrote Missy Lehand, in declining Roosevelt's invitation to dine at the White House. Instead of waiting for a phone call that didn't come about a cabinet appointment, Kennedy began working with William Randolph Hearst. They had now known each other for fifteen years, and their friendship continued, even though W.R. had broken with Roosevelt, taken to calling the New Deal the Raw Deal, and thrown his support to Alf Landon in the 1936 election. Marion Davies was completing what would be her last film, ever since Eve. In spite of the speech impediment that still plagued her in private, she had tenaciously conquered her stuttering when the cameras were rolling, and turned into a delightful romantic comedienne. Yet Hearst had wanted more for her, dramatic roles such as Marie Antoinette, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. At MGM, those parts went to Irving Thalberg's wife, Norma Shearer, and as important as Hearst and Davies were to Louis B. Mayer, the studio head was not alone in being unable to see Davies successfully portraying those characters. Hearst took it as a personal affront, and in 1934 they dramatically left MGM for Warner Brothers, dismantling Marion's famous 14-room bungalow into three sections for its move from Culver City to Burbank. Marion was pushing 40 and still looked great, but it was a challenge to play the ingenue, and after only four Warner Brothers films, she decided it was time to get out. Hearst was more than 30 years her senior, and although he loved watching her on the screen, he also wanted her at his side as they traveled the world. Davies was also aware that Hearst had reached the point he needed tending, not so much physically, but in facing a looming financial crisis. After years of borrowing and hedging his properties to pay for his massive buying sprees, the Depression, increased taxes, and his extravagant spending were catching up with him. With circulation of some of his newspapers and magazines at new lows, he asked Kennedy to come up with a corporate reorganization for his empire. The old bank examiner could never resist unrestrained access to someone else's books, especially for a man as rich and powerful as Hearst. Kennedy took the balance sheets and, along with Arthur Poole, evaluated the situation. Joe's suggestion was to sell new bonds attached to Hearst's property, 
but the reforms instituted by his own SEC mandated real numbers be appended to the prospectus. And so it was out there in black and white how tenuous Hearst's position was. Canadian banks began demanding that their notes be paid before newsprint was released. Without paper, his publications would halt, and Hearst was urged to sell some of his floundering newspapers, but he couldn't bring himself to part with any of them. At the point of desperation, Hearst and Davies were at their apartment at the Ritz Towers in New York when Kennedy arrived with an offer. Fourteen million dollars for all of the Hearst magazines. If Joe's proposal was considered, it wasn't for long. Even in the depths of the Depression, the magazines were bringing in that much each year. Yet dire action of some sort was needed, and Marion, who had been making $10,000 a week as an actress, had access to much more cash than Hearst at the moment. She sold $1 million of her assets and handed it over to him. One can only imagine how difficult it was for the proud Hearst to accept. But that million, along with loans from two other women, Sissy Patterson and Abby Rockefeller, bought him the time to turn his situation around. Marion later could not resist pointing out that Hearst's wife, Millicent, who was more than taken care of as she raised their four sons in New York, didn't lift a finger to help. If Hearst was shocked by Kennedy's lowball offer for the magazines, as his son later claimed, it doesn't seem to have made a dent in their relationship. There is no doubt that Hearst ran hot and cold in his feelings about Kennedy, but he considered him a trusted friend and a gentleman. Joe was on the short list of contenders to be named the trustee for Hearst's holdings, a step considered necessary to restore investor confidence. Kennedy also continued to advise W.R. and was one of the 500 people invited to one of their biggest parties yet, a circus-themed celebration of Hearst's 74th birthday in April of 1937 at the Santa Monica Beach House featuring a full-sized merry-go-round. Joe thanked Marion for the invitation, assuring her, "'There is nothing in the world I would like better than to attend the circus.' But his work— on matters in connection with Mr. Hurst's interests and his new assignment from Roosevelt, forced him to stay in Washington. After losing out on Paramount, Kennedy claimed he was going to take up the bum's life. But then, as he explained to a friend, Roosevelt had been so persuasive, he convinced Joe to give up my business, give up my leisure to take up the most unworkable bill I ever read in my life— but you know that man's winning ways. Joe's latest mission took him to the fourth floor of the Commerce Department building as chair of the Maritime Commission, recently created by Congress, to see if a respectable merchant marine could be created out of the high-cost, low-efficiency, strike-plagued shipping industry. The Maritime Commission was similar to the SEC in that it was a new agency designed to rein in an important slice of the private sector. There was no denying it was a second-tier appointment. Yet, in explaining his hesitancy to take the job, Joe implied it meant turning down very profitable enterprises such as Paramount or the Hearst Corporation, neither of which were actually available to him. Kennedy returned to Washington and his Marwood estate, determined to make the Maritime Commission a showplace for his abilities. With Eddie Moore at his side, he worked long hours hanging on to the telephone, negotiating, bullying, and charming the agency into effectiveness. Within three months of taking over, Kennedy settled millions of dollars' worth of claims by a dozen shipping companies for pennies on the dollar. Since he was simultaneously negotiating with them for new operating subsidies, they had more than enough reason to cooperate. Yet it was a tremendous coup— and his dramatic accomplishments created a new chapter in the Kennedy Book of Legends. Harvey Clemmer was hired to handle publicity, but he soon realized his boss was a genius in public relations. He had the whole country waiting for the economic survey. He built up the suspense like it was the second coming of Christ. Just as if he were preparing to premiere an epic film, Joe released his monumental study— 
surrounded by reporters and banks of cameras. The innately isolationist Kennedy touched a national nerve and played on fears that suggested the country was unprotected without him. Newsreels proclaimed Roosevelt's hard-boiled troubleshooter as the savior who had once again solved a national crisis that had eluded lesser men. Joe was heaped with adulatory praise as straight-talking, extremely able, and highly picturesque. Almost every print medium carried stories on Kennedy, and a full-page photograph of him in Life magazine was headlined, Chairman Kennedy Calls for a New Merchant Marine Built for War. Joe was diligent in his courting of the press, but his primary focus was Fortune magazine and the cover story they had been working on since shortly after the creation of the Maritime Commission. Kennedy agreed to make himself and his associates available for interviews on the condition that he be allowed to review the article prior to printing, and Fortune's managing editor, Russell Davenport, approved the terms. For years, Joe had managed to play most reporters like violins, promoting the version of his life he wanted projected and serving as the editor of his own biography. However, the fortune reporter, Harry Looker, began doing his own investigating, and when Joe read the draft of the article, he fumed that it was permeated with distrust of my character, dislike of my occupations, and social prejudice against my origin. He told Davenport it contained more than fifty inaccuracies, and was so cheap and tawdry reading it made him ill. It was the brainchild of a psychopathetic case, with an ingrained hatred of the Irish. There were indeed some cheap shots, and the overall tone was flippant. Kennedy's sister's voices were shrill, Winthrop, Massachusetts was dismal, and Joe had made a shambles of K.A.O. Stereotypical innuendos of his heritage, such as, he could bellow like an Irish cop, laced the piece. Kennedy questioned the taste and justice of such comments, but he didn't argue with other ethnic cliches, such as calling an Italian swart. There were a few blatant inaccuracies. Queen Kelly had been suppressed because it might have offended the church, and that at the time of his takeover, FBO was one of Hollywood's largest producers and heaviest losers. Joe couldn't have been pleased when the reporter alleged that few in the press had heard of Kennedy before he was named to the SEC. Some of Joe's points were totally legitimate, but his biggest concern had to be that this was the first article to raise real questions about his character. Looker stated that Joe was a cold-blooded bear of exceptional shrewdness, with dirty, money-changing hands and a history of being dictatorial. He summed up Joe's professional life as 22 years of quick profit-taking and 14 months of public service. Kennedy wasn't about to allow the piece to see the light of day, but even he had to be surprised when Davenport practically gave him carte blanche to make changes. Another writer was immediately assigned— and in mid-July, Kennedy was sent a new draft with a note from the editor, who assumed it's a big improvement, with its major changes in style, pace, and content. Still, if anything stirs your ire, Joe was to holler. To be sure all was to Kennedy's liking, Davenport asked to set up a meeting to go over it in person, and promised him that we are open to discussion on everything because you have in me your very sincere admirer. The cover story that eventually ran in Fortune's September issue led by describing Kennedy as a legendary man of action. The content and tone had been altered substantially, and the handsome full-page photograph of his smiling face and sparkling eyes, his slightly receding hairline, and the freckles he had retained since childhood verified the image he presented of himself, a straight-talking common man who just happened to be a multimillionaire. Kennedy could still find some fault, but there was much less to argue with. Fortune credited his film companies as a major source of his personal fortune, and found that tracing his path from Boston to Hollywood leads you into the ruins of vanished corporations, from which there arise whiffs of an atmosphere distinctly gamey.
That was the biggest question the article raised, and the remaining pages piled praise upon praise. Kennedy had fought hard for this picture of himself, using a combination of charm, fury, and influence to have his way. And for good reason. The Fortune article, along with the pieces written by Croc in the New York Times, and those that had previously appeared in Photoplay and The American Magazine, would be used as underpinnings of almost everything written about him from then on. He had taken the lessons of Hollywood, fashioned his own image, and then marketed it. Once again, Joe was promoted as having pulled himself up by his proverbial bootstraps from a poor childhood, graduating from Harvard as a star of the baseball field, finding economic success through disciplined diligence, and then this fabulous large family that he was so devoted to. In other words, the quintessential success story. As he would tell his sons, It is not what you are, but what people think you are. That is important. Chapter 28 The Embers of Terror, Isolationism, and Racism 1938-1940 Kennedy's public relations blitz gave Roosevelt new reasons for both pride and concern. Yet to Joe's mind, the president still owed him for taking two less-than-stellar appointments and turning them into administration triumphs. Arthur Crock was dining with Joe at Marwood when Jimmy Roosevelt came calling to see if Kennedy was interested in serving as Secretary of Commerce. After half an hour, Joe returned to Arthur and reported, FDR promised me London, and I told Jimmy to tell his father that's the job and the only one I'll accept. He was determined to be the first Irishman to be ambassador from the United States to the court of St. James. History has provided a variety of answers to why Roosevelt agreed to appoint Kennedy to the prestigious but potentially perilous post. After all, Kennedy's previous international experience had been limited to a few trips to Europe and foreign box office receipts. Henry Morgenthau, the man who received the coveted post of Secretary of the Treasury, claimed that the president told him that Kennedy was a very dangerous man and that he was going to send him to England with the distinct understanding that the appointment was only for six months, and that furthermore, by giving him the appointment, any obligation that he had to Kennedy was paid for. Joe himself repeated the idea of a short tenure when he told his aide Harvey Clemmer not to pack too many bags. We are only going to get the family in the social register. When that is done, we come on back and go out to Hollywood to make some movies and some money. Kennedy's appointment as ambassador was big news, especially in Boston. Even though his home there for the past decade had been the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, Kennedy was treated like a conquering hero by the local press. He couldn't resist claiming he had accepted the post only at the president's insistence, but no one was more pleased than Joe himself when he wrote in his diary on February 18, 1938, Today I resigned as chairman of the Maritime Commission and was sworn in as ambassador to Great Britain. England was in American headlines for more reasons than Kennedy's appointment. With the death of King George V in January of 1936, his eldest son, the 39-year-old Edward assumed the throne. Soon, however, his affair with the twice-married Wallace Warfield Spencer Simpson was the subject of international gossip and political concern. While she was seeking her second divorce, Edward was busy negotiating with the Church and Parliament for a special dispensation to marry her. Newspapers throughout the world updated the soap opera daily, and passions were fanned. It was blasphemous. It was an unprecedented crisis for the monarchy. It was the greatest love story of the century. Finally, on December 11, 1936, King Edward VIII went on the radio to announce that it was impossible for him to remain king without the help and support of the woman I love. The story was whipped into such an intense frenzy, Wallace Simpson became the first woman to be named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Edward's younger brother, George, was crowned, but by the end of his first year as monarch, 
the world had much more pressing concerns than his brother's love life. Since Adolf Hitler's rise to Chancellor in early 1933, the world had been given innumerable reasons for concern. That first year alone there were book burnings, anti-Jewish boycotts, and the establishment of Dachau. Yet the Jews Not Wanted signs had been removed in Berlin for the Olympics of 1936, and many international visitors left with feelings similar to those expressed by Joe Jr. during a visit to Germany in 1934. Hitler is building a spirit in his men that would be envied in any country. He did acknowledge that it is a remarkable spirit which can do tremendous good or harm, whose fate rests with one man alone. Generalissimo Francisco Franco had ignited the Spanish Civil War, Benito Mussolini's Italy had conquered Ethiopia, and under the guise of anti-communism, Germany and Japan formed an alliance. While Kennedy joked with a fellow American diplomat that you and I will be able to settle the affairs of the world, either on horseback or on the golf course. He had to be aware of the dark and complex clouds hovering over Europe. Still, Joe's immediate focus was on his triumphant send-off. Cameras lined the dock to capture his family waving goodbye, and a week later even more cameras greeted his arrival. His first official act as ambassador on March 16, 1938, was to present his credentials to the king at Buckingham Palace, followed by lunch at the Savoy, hosted by London-based American correspondents. Kennedy was now a star on the international stage, and he meant to make the most of it. He was once again alongside banks of cameras several weeks later to meet Rose and the first installment of five of his children— the media attention given to him and his family was phenomenal. Their arrival was covered as if it was a Hollywood premiere, and the publicity that followed was cultivated to ensure a long run. Eddie Moore was on staff, and Kennedy added a New York Times State Department reporter as his embassy press secretary. But his job description was tantamount to those of a press agent, promoting Joe as much as American interests. Even with a phalanx of staff, Joe was hands-on when it came to dealing with the media. He paid particular attention to the newsreels that were to be shown in America, and the results were sensational. The press went absolutely ape over the entire family, remembered Paige Wilson, an embassy secretary. I don't think there was a day in a month that there wasn't a photograph of the Kennedy family in the newspapers. When Joe hit a hole in one— there was extensive coverage in both Britain and the United States. Twelve-year-old Bobby was photographed, laying the cornerstone of a children's hospital, and six-year-old Teddy was starred, cutting the ribbon that opened a children's zoo. Within less than two months of Kennedy's arrival in London, Franco claimed victory in Spain, and Hitler expanded his power by absorbing Austria into the German Union. Joe filed regular briefings to the President and Secretary of State Cordell Hull, but to those Joe saw as his allies, such as William Randolph Hearst, Walter Lippmann, Arthur Crock, Fortune's Russell Davenport, and a dozen others, he took to sending weekly private and confidential reports on issues of the day. The criteria for inclusion seemed to be what the receiver could do for Kennedy, rather than whether they supported Roosevelt. In fact, the contents were not reviewed by anyone in the administration, and the president was not on the list of recipients. Kennedy's diary entries highlighted his socializing, meetings with various British leaders, and the resulting press coverage. Rose, Kathleen, known as Kick, and Rosemary were presented at court, and they all, particularly 18-year-old Kick, dove into the London season— that sizzling period from May through July when formal dances were held four nights a week and then continued through the weekend at country estates. The choicest of these, the Astor's Cliveden, became almost a second home to the Kennedys. Finally, Joe had the status he felt was his due. As ambassador, memberships in a variety of exclusive clubs were his, without applications or fear of snubs, People wrote him simply to ask for his autograph. 
The appreciation of what the position brought them and the children was the first thing in years Rose could truly share with her husband. The marriage she had fought to save was what she had always dreamed it would be. Sitting at the king's right at dinner, lunching at Lady Astor's, and dining with the Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street was suddenly the norm. For the rest of her 104 years, Rose would reflect on her time as the wife of the ambassador at the court of St. James as the happiest of my life. Kennedy claimed that before coming to London, they hadn't given 20 dinner parties during the entire 25 years of married life, but now they were entertaining several times a week. The fact his salary of $22,000 a year, plus $5,000 for expenses, required him to pour his own money in to cover the level of servants and entertaining he expected, was the least of his concerns. Screening new American films quickly became a hallmark of dinner at the Ambassadors, and while a few of their guests commented that the movies were not ones that we would have paid ten pence to see on our own, to question the appropriateness of the custom doesn't seem to have occurred to the Kennedys. To Joe, access to films before they were released was a visible sign of his continued importance in Hollywood, and he simply assumed they were a special treat he was in the unique position to provide. When Test Pilot, starring Clark Gable and Myrna Loy, was screened following their dinner for Lord and Lady Halifax, Charles and Anne Lindbergh were among the guests, and Rose proudly noted that the famous pilot found the aeronautical display was very authentic and well worth seeing. When King George and Queen Elizabeth were the honored guests, fresh flowers and strawberries were brought in from France, and Virginia Ham, two Disney cartoons, and Goodbye, Mr. Chips were flown in from the States. Rose remembered that the Robert Donat and Greer Garson film was long, as it had not been cut to use moving picture parlance, but excellent and marvelously acted. It was quite sad, and after it was finished it was very plain to see that the Queen had had a little weep. In the royal presence on a regular basis, Kennedy fell into interacting with the monarchs the same way he had treated the stars in Hollywood. He was particularly comfortable with the Queen, and reported to his diary that she blushed one evening when he told her she looked particularly beautiful. The historian Michael Beschloss surmises that Joe was the first American ambassador to have told the Queen that she was a cute trick. He was even more informal with the young princesses, and made a habit of talking movies with them, asking what they had seen and what their favorites were. When Princess Elizabeth told him she enjoyed the recently released Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Kennedy arranged to give her an original color drawing of Snow White, signed by Walt Disney, for her thirteenth birthday. Joe was often at his desk until six or seven, occasionally much later, but he didn't limit his work to his ambassadorial duties. He rode his horse almost every morning, and, weather permitting, golfed every Saturday with Eddie Moore. Letters and cables to Paul Murphy monitored his investments, and he frequently checked in with Ted O'Leary at Somerset Liquors. Johnny Ford was left with a million and one responsibilities, running Maine and New Hampshire, as well as minutia such as furniture appraisals for the Palm Beach House, weather damage at Hyannis, a termite infestation in Bronxville, and various requests from Rose, including dealing with her parents. Almost daily, some time was devoted to cultivating the press. No longer dealing with Variety and Film Daily, Kennedy now mingled with the publishers and editors of the major newspapers and magazines in America and Europe. He put his name on an article for the Saturday Evening Post, this time to praise Roosevelt's domestic programs, and none too presciently tell the business community that, not soon again, if ever, will we establish in office the philosophy that the welfare of the nation is advanced if we guarantee prosperity for the few. Woman's Day told of the nine Kennedys and how they grew, crediting Rose as the ever-vigilant general manager of the photogenic family. The ambassador agreed to cooperate with the Ladies' Home Journal as long as they showed him the piece first, so he might correct factual errors. Joe's ace in the hole was the same as it had been at Fortune. 
he knew the publisher, and was not above demanding changes to the point that the journalist didn't recognize it, and it almost seemed as if the ambassador had written it himself. Kennedy's scrapbook was beginning to bulge, as he received more press than any member of the administration besides the president. Joe enjoyed the company of reporters and publishers, for there was always interesting information to swap, and his zest for their camaraderie went beyond their immediate usefulness to him. The embassy guest lists often included visiting press barons such as Arthur Salzberger, publisher of the New York Times, and Henry Luce, who, by the time he visited London in the spring of 1938, had already proved himself more than generous to Kennedy, putting him on the cover of Time and giving him two major articles in Fortune, as well as frequent positive mentions. Yet it was Luce's wife, the beautiful Claire, who had just celebrated her thirty-fifth birthday, that piqued Kennedy's interest this time around. The play she had been working on when they had dined together in California two years before, The Women, was now a hit. But being the darling of Broadway was not enough for her. As her friend Irene Selznick summed her up, Claire's ambition was so great, she never stood a chance of satisfaction. Claire herself proclaimed her determination not to live for anybody but myself, and she rarely missed an opportunity to bed someone of power and influence. Her lovers included the sixty-plus-year-old financier Bernard Baruch and Randolph Churchill, the just twenty-year-old son of the future prime minister. Now Claire turned her eye on the ambassador, and to ensure his notice, she had her mail sent to his attention at the embassy. Notice he did. Kennedy valued Luce as an influential contact, but that did not deter his libidinous interest in her. The following month, when he made his first ambassadorial return to the States, the Luces were his fellow passengers, and Claire, according to her biographer Sylvia Morris, made no secret in reveling in Joe's company. If Kennedy enjoyed the crossing, he was even more pleased when the Queen Mary entered New York Harbor and the press literally stormed me at the dock. Only a few weeks before, Liberty Magazine had run an article entitled, Will Kennedy Run for President? with the subheading, A Candid Close-Up of a Prospect that Looms Arrestingly Large on the Political Horizon. Liberty proceeded to bat down every possible objection to his candidacy, practically crediting him with single-handedly ensuring Roosevelt's 1932 nomination and praising him as the president's bluntest adviser. If the country was ready to demand a man who can make business and progressive reform pull together toward sound prosperity, then Kennedy was their candidate. The article further refined Joe's biography. Of course, he had withdrawn from all stock market activity since joining the administration— he had taken most of the campaign trips with Roosevelt, and their close friendship stretched over twenty years. Roosevelt was serving his second term as president. No one had ever been elected to a third, and the Liberty article set up Kennedy as his heir apparent. The New York Daily News pronounced Kennedy the crown prince of the Roosevelt regime, and his personal selection as his successor— so when Joe met with Roosevelt at both Hyde Park and the White House, the tension of Kennedy's potential candidacy had to permeate their discussions. Joe had unequivocally said, I have no political ambitions for myself or for my children, during the 1936 campaign. But it was a different story now. The coverage ignited by Kennedy's potential candidacy clearly had his full cooperation. He thought he was about the most qualified individual on earth to be president, concluded his aide, Harvey Clemmer. Arthur Crock was convinced that, without any question, Kennedy wanted to be president. Yes, he did. Very definitely. And Joe assumed he had the wherewithal and the support to pull it off. He viewed himself as a popular personality, hailed in newspapers, magazines, and newsreels, he thought his services had so impressed the country, and there was money behind it for a gigantic propaganda machine. 
with cameras and reporters hanging on his every word becoming a common occurrence, Joe was now viewing the idea of his running as an inevitable question, and his diary entries reflect his seriousness at the prospect. Like so many others before and since, Kennedy began believing his own press clips. As more newspapers picked up on the story of Kennedy's candidacy, Roosevelt had enough. Besides the disloyalty, it must have seemed outrageous that this man, who had never run for, let alone held, elective office, seriously thought he should be president. Was there no limit to the hubris? Roosevelt instructed his press secretary to find an appropriate publication to report his displeasure of Kennedy's self-promotion, as well as his awareness of the existence and contents of all those private and confidential missives. When the Chicago Tribune reported that there was a chilling shadow over their relationship, Joe was blindsided, hearing about the article just after what he had considered a pleasant dinner with Roosevelt. Kennedy had been serving as ambassador for almost six months, the time limit he and the president had separately voiced as sufficient. Yet for different reasons, both men decided he should carry on. If he genuinely saw Kennedy as a potential rival, Roosevelt had to think that he was better served by having Joe thousands of miles away and in a position where he, at least publicly, had to remain loyal. Only a few weeks after Kennedy had been greeted at the dock with such interest and acclaim, reporters now asked about the chill between him and the president, as well as the latest issue of the Saturday Evening Post. It carried an article asserting that it was Jimmy Roosevelt who had helped Kennedy to reach the two real positions which he now holds, that of ambassador to London and that of premier Scotch whiskey salesman in America. Joe attempted to keep things light as he boarded the Normandy to return to London, along with his two eldest sons and Arthur Croc, who was traveling at Joe's expense. Croc noted that Kennedy was a very imperious man, and it must have been difficult for him to smile and be friendly when he was under strain. Yet Joe was also attuned to turning his focus to the next step, in this case entrenching his popularity as ambassador and paving the way for Joe Jr., who had just graduated from Harvard and was to become his secretary at the embassy, just as the sons of John Adams and others had done before him. The family was all together for the first time in quite a while, and, as had been his pattern since he could afford it, Joe took time for serious relaxation in a sumptuous location. In Europe, that meant the French Riviera, and so that August he leased a villa several miles east of Cannes, abutting the Hôtel de Cap, already one of the world's great luxury hotels. Enshrined on twenty landscaped acres on the tip of a peninsula, the de Cap featured an exquisite expanse of grounds that included a huge saltwater pool built into the rocks at the edge of the Mediterranean. A series of private cabanas ribboned the cliffs, and a sign soon graced the largest one, reading, J.P. Kennedy's family. The exclusivity of the Hôtel de Cap assured fellow guests that they were all members of rarefied society, and so the Kennedys quickly found themselves mingling with other guests including the menage of Marlena Dietrich. Rose may have been feeling a new security in her marriage with her husband close at hand, yet proximity seemed to have little impact on Joe's behavior. A high-profile beauty always turned his head, and his eye was caught by the international film star. Dietrich had appeared in several films in her native Germany before stunning American audiences in Joseph von Sternberg's Morocco in 1930. Yet seven years and ten films later, she joined Catherine Hepburn and Greta Garbo in being declared box office poison by a theater owner's organization. Marlena flatly turned down Hitler's offer to return to be Queen of UFA, the German film studio, where she could name her price her script and her director, and instead applied for American citizenship and exiled herself to the south of France with her extended family, her thirteen-year-old daughter Maria, her husband Rudy, Rudy's longtime lover Tammy, and Marlena's current amour, the author Eric Maria Remarque. 
Marlena, now thirty-six and as gorgeous as ever, had always set her own standards and lived by her own code. If her style of group travel bothered others, it didn't concern her. More eyebrows had to be raised when Sternberg arrived at the de Cap, while Remarque busied himself beginning the novel that would become Arc de Triomphe. Kennedy kept in touch with London and Washington and hired a beautiful French girl to take his dictation. Rose and the children had their own separate routines, and as each day passed, Dietrich's young daughter became more and more infatuated with the Kennedys, particularly the twenty-one-year-old Jack. Maria felt gawky around the children with their smiles that never ended, and she longed to be their friend. Because the older Kennedy children were permitted to join their parents at Elsa Maxwell's summer ball, Maria was allowed to go as well. Jack would remember that evening, too, but for a very different reason. He danced with Marlena to begin the begin, and she was holding me so tight, and then she slipped her hand down my trousers— Later he would wonder if his father put her up to it, but smiled when he remembered her terrific perfume. As the Kennedys were becoming important to her, Maria noticed the ambassador becoming a frequent visitor to her mother's cabana. She was embarrassed and feared her new friends would ostracize her as a result. But Rose continued to show Maria kindnesses, invite her to join the family for lunch, and in general act as if everything could not have been more normal. Maria concluded that the Kennedys must be as used to their father disappearing as I was my mother. Even if Maria didn't observe a change in her, Rose's pattern of taking off by herself resumed as soon as their holiday ended. Instead of staying in London and overseeing her children's return to school, Rose went to Paris and then Scotland. It was in Glasgow that Joe reached her with the news that she needed to return to London as soon as possible, for war was at hand. Still, she stayed in Scotland for several more days, taking golf lessons and buying what she feared was to be the last for tweeds. Hitler's army was gathering along Czechoslovakia's border, and tin hats and gas masks were distributed throughout the embassy. In feverish haste, Londoners were digging trenches in public parks for shelter from the bombs they assumed were coming. Then came the announcement that peace is at hand. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was cheered in the streets of Berlin, and he, Francis Edouard Daladier, and Hitler all shook hands in late September to a collective, if short-lived, sigh of relief. There was no question in Kennedy's mind that the ultimate goal was to keep America out of this European conflict. He was passionate that America's future and his family's depended upon his country staying out of the war. Yet the more he publicly pronounced American neutrality, the more questions were raised about his appropriateness as ambassador. As the glow over peace in our time gave way, insecurity grew. When Kennedy advocated trying to work out something with the totalitarian states, a new round of criticism followed. He was chafing under the restriction of having his public words approved in advance and his private thoughts second-guessed used to being his own boss and pleasing only the few he cared about at any given moment, Joe was far from a natural as a diplomat. In his worldview, it was economic maladjustment that was at the heart of the world's unrest. He saw Hitler as a CEO of an adversarial corporation and maintained his faith in the power of negotiation. There had to be something England can do to satisfy Hitler— Kennedy was so sure he was right, and others were wrong, he decided. The papers have made up a pile of lies about him, Joe Jr. reported to his diary in early December 1938. He also doesn't like the idea of sitting back and letting the Jewish columnists in America kick his head off. Kennedy vented to his eldest son that he would give it up in a minute if it wasn't for the benefits that Jack and I are getting out of it, and the things Eunice will get when she comes out next spring. Joe did see his position giving tremendous advantages to his children. The older girls received the ultimate in social acceptance by being presented in court, and Joe Jr. and Jack had front-row seats to the events of a lifetime. 
Yet if the family was uppermost in his mind, Kennedy had a strange way of showing it. Christmas found him once again separated from them, with Rose, Joe Jr., and the younger children spending the holidays in San Moritz, while Joe and young Jack headed to Washington and Palm Beach. Joe met with Roosevelt several times during his two months stateside, and he noted in his diary that during the final meeting he had asked for and received the President's assurance that he had his full confidence. Kennedy returned to London just as the Nazis were entering Prague, and he talked to Roosevelt on the phone almost every day, in the early evening, London time, around ten in the morning for the President. Jimmy Roosevelt, now a vaguely defined vice president of Samuel Goldwyn Productions, came to London to promote Wuthering Heights, and Joe arranged for them to spend a weekend at Windsor Palace and screen the film for the King and Queen. Jimmy was also at the palace as the son of the president, and he confirmed his father's invitation for the royals to come to America. Joe saw that as evidence the administration was going around him, and he was unhappy not to be included in the king and queen's visit that summer. Yet while they were at the president's side at the World's Fair in New York, Kennedy was busy entertaining Claire Booth Luce. She had signed her latest cable to him, Love Claire, and he immediately responded by offering to meet her ship at the dock and personally escort her to London. In town for the West End production of The Women, she cut a social swath through town, seeing the likes of Lord Beaverbrook and George Bernard Shaw. Most conveniently, Rose was spending several weeks in the States, and Claire's biographer notes that Kennedy's name appears more frequently than any other in her diary that month. No diplomatic complications were going to keep at least part of the Kennedy family from returning to the Riviera in August of 1939, and once again the entire Dietrich famille was there as well. This time Joe had competition for Marlena's affections, not only from Eric Remark, but from Joe Carstairs, the cross-dressing oil heiress. Carstairs held the world record as the fastest female speedboat racer, but she dramatically arrived at the Hotel de Cap on her three-masted schooner. Nothing prevented Joe and Marlena from picking up where they had left off the year before, and the Kennedy and Dietrich clans swam and dined together often. Marlena, who let her normally pale skin go bronze, took to calling the ambassador Papa Joe, to delineate him from all the other Joes in her life, his eldest son, Joe Carstairs, and Joseph von Sternberg. Marlena had been off the screen for two years, when the producer, Joseph Pasternak, called her at the Ducap to offer her a job. She thought the role of a dancing girl in a western sounded ridiculous. But she turned to Papa Joe for advice, and he quickly jumped into the negotiations. As if he had never left the business, Kennedy placed transatlantic calls to Universal, where Pasternak assured him he wanted Marlena so much there were also job offers for both Rudy and Remark. Later that evening, Joe announced, The money is too good to refuse. And so Marlena accepted the offer to play opposite Jimmy Stewart in Destry Rides Again. Before she was willing to leave, however, Dietrich needed one more assurance. She had become an American citizen, worked actively on behalf of refugees fleeing her homeland, and even tried to sway Kennedy from his adamant neutrality. She was worried about Germany's next move and said, I can't be away making a stupid film if anything happens. Kennedy promised that her family would be given the same protection as his. Marlena left for Hollywood and Joe returned to England sooner than planned. After meeting with the Prime Minister, Kennedy announced that it was advisable for American travelers to leave England. Within the week, Maria, Rudy, Tammy, and Eric were on their way to Sherburne, in time for the Queen Mary's departure for New York, on September 2, 1939, just as German troops marched into Poland. Rose, along with Kathleen, 19, Eunice, 18, and Bobby, 13, returned to the States on board the visibly armed S.S. Washington to find Joe's picture once again on the cover of Time. The inside article gushed that, from one point of view, 
Joe Kennedy is a common denominator of the U.S. businessman, sage, middle of the road, a horse trader at heart, with one sharp eye on the market, and one fond eye on his children. But he is a super common denominator, uncommonly common-sensible, stiletto-shrewd, practical as only a former president of a small bank can be. With references to his unprecedented close and friendly relations with the palace and members of the British government, as well as his efficient, if unconventional, approach to problem-solving, it was clear Kennedy himself had been the chief source of information for the article. In the midst of the breaking war, Kennedy still made time for the movies, but one in particular struck him as nothing short of criminal. Mr. Smith goes to Washington's depiction of a corrupt United States Senate was so offensive to him that he wired Will Hayes that it was one of the most disgraceful things I have ever seen done to our country, and sent a copy of his cable to the president. Joe genuinely believed that in foreign countries, this film must inevitably strengthen the mistaken impression that the United States is full of graft, corruption, and lawlessness. Kennedy had calmed down somewhat five days later, when he responded to cables from Harry Cohn of Columbia and the film's director, Frank Capra. Joe acknowledged they were looking at the picture through different eyes, but stood his ground and reminded them that American films are the greatest influence on foreign public opinion. He thought Capra's fine work makes the indictment of government all the more damning and will do inestimable harm to American prestige all over the world. From the Hayes office, Arthur Houghton tried to soothe Kennedy by assuring him there were no violations of the production code, and that was all they had the power to enforce. Joe's opposition to the film was a voice in the wilderness. Luella Parsons called it a smash patriotic hit, and most critics echoed her sentiments, finding that audiences left the theaters with an enthusiasm for democracy and in a glow of patriotism. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington went on to be nominated for eleven Academy Awards, but lose almost all of them to Gone with the Wind. Joe continued to grumble about the film, however, reminding Arthur Crock that the danger doesn't always come from communists. Kennedy's Hollywood days re-entered his life serendipitously when he flew home for the holidays on a Pan Am Dixie Clipper. Also on board was Eric von Stroheim, on his way to California to accept an offer from Fox to act in I Was an Adventurous. Stroheim had appeared in over a dozen films in the ten years since Queen Kelly, but had directed only one, a low-budget Fox film called Walking Down Broadway in 1933. In America, the Time cover story fanned Kennedy's presidential prospects, and he did little to discourage it. With only months to go before the Democratic National Convention, Roosevelt had yet to announce his plans. Names such as Secretary of State Cordell Hull and Postmaster General James Farley had been raised as possible successors, Yet time and again, Kennedy was mentioned as one of the most prominent half-dozen possible candidates. Those men, however, had to walk a very thin line between rousing support for themselves and appearing to remain loyal to the unusually coy president. While Joe publicly claimed not to be interested, the Boston Post headlined, Kennedy May Be Candidate. During his three months at home, Kennedy made enough speeches saying in various ways that the United States must not permit itself to be drawn into this conflict, either directly or indirectly, to firmly establish him as the isolationist alternative. Joe spent some time in Palm Beach, where Rose's parents and Johnny Ford and his wife came for visits. Ford was taken aback by the madhouse created, with Joe constantly on the phone and juggling all the different visitors who wanted to see him. Kennedy, however, appeared to be having a great time entertaining himself while polishing his image, spending an afternoon with Walter Winchell and Damon Runyon at a Miami beach club. When Joe returned to London in late February of 1940, his physical condition was a great deal better than when he first landed— and who else should be on board the ship but Claire Booth Luce? 
now even more famous because the women had been turned into a hit film by MGM, Claire left her husband at home and came to Europe to work on a book. Yet she made time to spend several days with Kennedy at his country home. When she headed to Paris in April, he followed and spent all morning in Claire's Ritz Hotel bedroom. In May, the Prime Minister that Kennedy had championed, Neville Chamberlain, was replaced by a man for whom he had little respect, Winston Churchill. As Joe became more vociferous in his differences with the President's policies, the King and Queen told Roosevelt they were terribly disturbed by his ambassador and alternative lines of communication with the British government were established. If grumblings about Kennedy were growing louder in Washington and London, there were no complaints from Hollywood. The trades praised the ambassador for giving every request immediate action, resulting in a much better relationship in London than our business ever had before. The war was curtailing British film production, and the demand for American movies was greater than ever. Kennedy facilitated meetings between Will Hayes and Lord Halifax, who told them England needed to have pictures, a lot of them, to keep up the people's morale. Payment for those films, however, went from slow to slower, and Hayes appealed to Kennedy to help. Hayes kept Joe constantly briefed, and his telephone calls to London were many and long. Kennedy always made time to stay in touch with his old colleagues from Hollywood, even when they simply dropped by. Jack Warner was in London when he decided to stop in at the embassy without an appointment, and the studio head was thrilled that when his name was announced, Joe rushed out, pulled me into the study, and was exactly the same friendly, forceful, down-to-earth, warm Joe Kennedy I had always known. In June of 1940, France fell to the Germans, and the Nazis began bombing London. After the first night, Joe walked with his aide, Harvey Clemmer, around Piccadilly and said, shaking his head, I'll bet you five to one any sum that Hitler will be in Buckingham Palace in two weeks. On paper, Kennedy's opinion that Britain would lose was difficult to argue with. As Henry Luce said after listening to his conclusions, I told him I could not match him argument for argument. I could only tell him I did not believe they would be defeated. And so I prayed. Or, as Pamela Harriman put it, Joe didn't understand the British steel. In the midst of the chaos and his dire predictions, Kennedy made moves to secure his own financial position. With the Nazis in the streets of Paris, the French ambassador closed his embassy, and Joe took the wines in his cellar and shipped them to Ted O'Leary at Somerset Liquors. Kennedy had ensured their stock by shipping hundreds of cases before the war began, but as the oceans became more vulnerable and cargo space more valuable, he used his ambassadorial status to preempt shipping space for 200,000 cases of Hague and Hague. With other companies unable to ship their goods, he was quietly informed questions might be raised in Parliament. And so, according to Clemmer, we tapered off a little after that. Roosevelt's decision to seek an unprecedented third term was not made official until he was nominated by the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in July. By then, his relationships with those considering running in his stead had suffered. But the breach between the president and Kennedy was more complex. Yet Joe concluded that the failure of his presidential boomlet, as he called it in his drafted memoir, was due to the fact that the time was not propitious, and not to what others saw as blatant self-promotion, disloyalty, or lack of experience. Kennedy began lashing out with less discretion than ever, including to his friends in the press. Finally, he told Secretary of State Hull that he was welcome to announce that he was being recalled. But one way or another, he was coming home. Joe privately threatened to endorse Roosevelt's opponent, Wendell Wilkie, and arrangements were made for him to immediately go to the looses upon landing and publicly make that announcement. However, Joe and Rose, who strongly believed he should remain loyal to the president because he had opened such important doors for their children, were whisked to the White House. 
Over dinner with Roosevelt, Kennedy vented his frustrations and complained of what he considered his maltreatment. But within days, Joe was endorsing his re-election in a national radio broadcast. While Kennedy used the forum to underline his own belief, there is no valid argument for putting America into war. He was not his usual smiling self as he gave his speech. This time it was all seriousness, and his eyes did not make their habitual contact with the newsreel cameras. It was almost as if he had a gun to his back, and his words were being spit out instead of spoken. The next night, Roosevelt was in Boston, where he called Kennedy my ambassador, and assured his audience, our boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Roosevelt was re-elected with over 60 percent of the vote, and three days later Kennedy offered him his formal resignation. If there was any doubt it would be accepted, Joe sealed his own fate when he proceeded to give an interview to several reporters, including Louis Lyons of the Boston Globe. Kennedy would later say he thought the conversation was off the record, but he never denied his words that resulted in headlines quoting him as declaring, "'Democracy is finished in England.'" He had gone on to say that it wasn't Hitler as much as National Socialism that was going to finish democracy. To the ultimate capitalist, socialism was just as dangerous, if not more so, than losing to Germany. Kennedy had said similar things before, but not to reporters outside the inner circle. All the years of saying one thing in private and another in public were finally catching up with him. But before that played out, on the very day he had given the interview, Joe flew to San Francisco where he was met by his son Jack, who had been auditing graduate classes at Stanford University. Together, father and son flew north to Wintoon to visit William Randolph Hearst at his Northern California estate, where the two friends could console each other with their mutual America First sympathies. Joe and Jack then headed for Los Angeles to stay at Marion Davies's huge Santa Monica beach house, for the staff couldn't have been nicer. The centerpiece of Joe's Southern California visit was a lunch at Warner Brothers, where four dozen of Hollywood's almost all Jewish moguls gathered to hear the ambassador speak about the European situation. He was to debrief them on the renewal of the British Film Exchange Agreement— but during the three-hour meeting, Joe reiterated the themes he had stressed about Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, that American films are the greatest influence on foreign public opinion, and producers must assume their responsibilities much more earnestly than they have to date. We must be more careful. It was another off-the-record session, and Joe forcefully repeated, there was no reason for our ever becoming involved in any war. Charles Lindbergh and groups such as the Legion of Decency and America First were not so far off the mark when they suggest this country can reconcile itself to whomever wins the war and adjust our trade and lives accordingly. Going beyond his isolationist position, Joe sounded as if he were speaking of the world after Hitler's victory— he appealed to what he saw as the studio head's basic economic interest. Hitler liked and appreciated films, but in order for him to allow them to be shown, you're going to have to get those Jewish names off the screen. Charlie Chaplin had just released The Great Dictator, and Kennedy warned the assembly that they had to stop making anti-Nazi pictures or using the film medium to promote or show sympathy to the cause of democracies versus the dictators. He came close to accusing the Jews of fanning the war's flames. Jews are on the spot, because in England the Jews were being blamed for the war. If the studio bosses use their power to influence the public dangerously, then we all, and the Jews in particular, would be in jeopardy if they continued to abuse that power. If they complained about Hitler, the more people would think a Jewish war was going on. In other words, their only hope was silence and shame. Kennedy had thrown the fear of God into them, and certainly riddled them with enough doubts that, for the most part, they remained publicly silent. A precious few objected. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., whose father was half-Jewish, 
protested to Roosevelt that Kennedy was stirring the embers of terror, isolationism, and racism. There was no doubt in Fairbanks's mind that His Excellency had made a very definite impression, and there were many who were susceptible to Joe's undoubted powers of persuasion. Ben Hecht agreed, reporting that the result of Kennedy's tirade was that most influential Jews espoused the Kennedy hide your Jewish head psychology. Joe returned east as confident as ever that his judgments were right, and his letters and diary were laced with anger. If he considered the resignation he had tendered in early November as perfunctory, the president did not. After receiving reports from Fairbanks and others that mirrored and magnified those of the reporters in Boston, Roosevelt was convinced that Kennedy's repudiation of the newspaper accounts was without merit. When Kennedy met with Roosevelt at the White House on the 1st of December, the president told him point-blank, I don't want to send you back. Joe reported to his diary, without a hint of irony, that he added, You've done enough. Kennedy thought it was an amicable, wide-ranging discussion. But shortly after the meeting, Roosevelt wrote his son-in-law that the truth of the matter is that Joe is and always has been a temperamental Irish boy, terrifically spoiled at an early age by huge financial success, thoroughly patriotic, thoroughly selfish, and thoroughly obsessed with the idea that he must leave each of his nine children with a million dollars. He concluded with his belief that, subconsciously, Kennedy thought the future of a small capitalistic class is safer under a Hitler than under a Churchill. With every other venture Kennedy had taken on, the stock market, the movies, the SEC, and the Maritime Commission, he had left as soon as he could declare success. Yet his ambassadorship was beyond his power to turn into a positive to almost anyone beyond himself and his family. He became wrapped in self-justifications. He still had his fortune, and he had his children. As he slowly realized his own retirement from public life was permanent, he turned his innate need to succeed into a dynastic imperative. Epilogue The First and Only Outsider to Fleece Hollywood 1941-1969 to While Kennedy continued to protest that America's entry into the war would be the biggest piece of foolishness the world has ever seen, nothing kept him from staying on top of the news from Hollywood. He lunched regularly with old colleagues such as Will Hayes, and continued to see films in the privacy of his homes before they were released. Without much passion, he frequently commented on movies, but he was outraged by Orson Welles's Citizen Kane. Not since Mr. Smith Goes to Washington had a film so disturbed him. While he found it one of the greatest pictures I ever saw, he told Arthur Houghton it was also the most cruel job I have ever seen done on anybody. I am against it, first, because I don't think the industry should portray living people without their consent, and secondly, because of my personal regard for W.R. and Marion. I regard this as a hateful piece of propaganda by an avowed communist. Still, Kennedy couldn't help but be impressed that the film had been made by a man who never did one before, by actors who never acted in one before, by musicians who never scored one, and by a sound man who never worked on one. From his post at the Hayes office, Houghton passed on the news that Gloria Swanson had signed a three-year, three-picture deal with RKO and was spending the next three months in vocal study. Joe clearly was not in direct contact with her because he responded, "'I am delighted to know that Swanee had a comeback.' If you run across her or find a way of talking with her, tell her that you wrote me the news and I sent back word that it's the only good news I have heard from the pictures in years. Kennedy often expressed interest in re-entering the industry and then just as quickly justified staying out. The movie business was in a terrible mess. Domestic box office was down by over 20% and there were no prospects of foreign business. He was convinced Fox was in so much trouble that they 
are liable to do nothing more in the next two or three years but answer stockholders' suits. He entered into meetings in late 1941 to take over RKO, but then he decided, there is nothing to work for, and I don't want to take on responsibility at this time. He continued to live on the road, vacationing in Virginia for several weeks with Ted O'Leary, back to New York where he kept a suite at the Waldorf, then on to the Ritz-Carlton in Boston or the Drake in Chicago. With Palm Beach for winter, Hyannis for summer, and his various temporary residences, Joe decided to sell the house in Bronxville and become a legal resident of Florida, where there was no state income or a state tax. That was fine for Rose and Joe with their separate but equally peripatetic lifestyles, but at the age of nine, young Teddy was sent off to what would be a series of boarding schools, and all the children lost the one real home they had known. When they arrived in Palm Beach from their various schools and travels, their first question was to ask which room to use this time. As Kennedy adjusted to being a multimillionaire untethered to any specific business, he turned his attention to his daughter, Rosemary. According to Eunice Kennedy, it had been Rose who had carried the main responsibility for Rosemary, taking her to doctors, educators, and psychologists. But now Rosemary occasionally experienced unpredictable rages and ran off from her school at night. The danger that she might be kidnapped or become pregnant loomed in their fears. Joe's relationship with his eldest daughter was loving and supportive, but he was much more emotional and was easily upset by Rosemary's lack of progress. Joe decided she was better off separated from her siblings, so she would not be as aware of her difference, and pronounced, She must never be at home, for her sake as well as everyone's else. Kennedy heard of the newly heralded prefrontal lobotomy, which was reported to bring back to useful life those suffering with troubled minds. What happened next is so clouded that even Joe's granddaughter, Amanda Smith, with familial access to all information, was unable to piece together the exact details, for no mention of Rosemary survives among her father's papers after 1940. Evidently telling no one, including his wife, Joe arranged for Rosemary to be operated on. The 21-year-old Rosemary awoke with the mind of a small child, not even knowing who she was. As devastated as Joe must have been, he kept the results a secret from the family, either to protect them or in fear of Rose's wrath. He sent Rosemary to St. Coletta in Wisconsin, a highly respected residence for the developmentally disabled. Joe announced that she was teaching in the Midwest, and Doris Kearns Goodwin says Rose did not see her daughter again until the early 1960s. Rosemary's brothers and sisters were used to visiting and writing her. Now, suddenly, nothing. If the veil of secrecy surrounding the reality of their parents' marriage had gradually seeped into their consciousness as they matured, what must they have thought when their sister literally disappeared from the family? The message of ultimate loyalty to the family was clear, but even within that tight circle there were subjects that were to be simply accepted and not discussed. Joe now had two failures to cope with, one very public, the other very private. According to Amanda Smith, Kennedy was ostracized, increasingly embittered, and isolated, and he put the full force of his energy into his sons, particularly his namesake. At Joe Jr.'s birth, Honey Fitz had declared that his grandson would be the first Catholic president of the United States. And as early as 1932, both Joe Kennedy and Eddie Moore were quoted as saying the same thing. Having grown up with that familial understanding, Joe Jr. was at Harvard Law School when he wrote his father in late 1940 that he had decided to enlist in the Navy Air Corps. They had discussed his joining the Naval Reserve, which would have allowed him to continue school relatively uninterrupted, but he assumed Jack's poor health would prevent him from serving, and therefore, with your stand on the war, people will wonder what the devil I am doing back at school with everyone else working for national defense. 
and then he reached out, with almost heartbreaking dutifulness, to reassure his father regarding what he saw as Joe Sr.'s ultimate concern. It seems that Jack is perfectly capable to do everything, if by chance something happened to me. Kennedy was in Palm Beach in December of 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and America finally entered the war he had dreaded for so long. He cabled Roosevelt his willingness to serve in any capacity, but he heard nothing in return. He decided the president wanted some kind of apology before taking him back to the fold, and that was out of the question. Well, I'm not sorry, so to hell with it. A sense of ennui and bitterness enveloped Joe, almost as if the war was all about him. In spite of his own beliefs, he had helped pull strings for Jack to enlist. But instead of staying behind a desk, Jack wants to get out on a destroyer in the Atlantic. It makes me sick to think of it. His eldest was stationed in England, and Joe sardonically told a friend, Kathleen has enlisted as a staff assistant to the Red Cross, and Bobby is getting ready to go this year, so, all in all, this war is great. I can't interest myself in private business, Joe wrote to David Sarnoff in February of 1942, or anything else besides his two oldest sons. My energy from now on will be tied up in their careers rather than my own. Presuming they are eventually going to make their homes in Massachusetts, if they get through this war successfully. He asked Sarnoff to keep his eyes open for a radio station there he could buy for them. Kennedy didn't buy a radio station, but he did invest in Miami's Hialeah racetrack and used his Somerset liquors as the avenue to stay in touch with Hollywood. He sent cases of liquor to studio executives and others such as the production code's Joe Breen. Though Joe believed Eddie Mannix of MGM would never agree to a formal product placement agreement, he sent him two cases of scotch with the suggestion that if the studio used Pinch or Gordon's or his other labels in their films, more would be forthcoming. Even in retirement, Kennedy couldn't pass up an angle. If there wasn't a movie he wanted to make, he did find a play, and so Joe became a Broadway producer. Frederick Lonsdale, who had written The Last of Mrs. Cheney, and Douglas Fairbanks's The Private Life of Don Juan, had a new light comedy entitled Another Love Story. Joe took pity on Freddy, because he had opposed the war and had a very hard time with the Jewish boys in Hollywood. Kennedy decided he needed something to keep my mind active and hoped the play might be turned into a film after a Broadway run, even though it was essentially a sex comedy dependent upon divorce and adultery as plot points. To direct it, Joe reached out to Eddie Goulding, without regard for their disagreements of a decade before. To Joe, Goulding had the magic touch, and was easily the best we could get with this kind of story, because he can help with the writing as well as the directing. Eddie was also willing to forget, and pronouncing another love story surefire, jumped on board. Kennedy left the Cape for a week of meetings at the Waldorf, and then headed to Wilmington for the play's preview in mid-September. By that point, however, Goulding and Lonsdale were locking horns, and when another love story opened in Washington, Goulding had washed his hands of it. Kennedy was there, but when he suggested that Claire Luce might make some cuts. Freddy haughtily announced that he had a contract. Frustrated because he thought the play could be a smash success if that thick-headed Lonsdale let anyone work on it, Joe packed his bags and left him cold. Kennedy was in New York for Another Love Story's opening at the Fulton Theater on October 12th, where Lonsdale was credited as both writer and director. The play ran through January giving over 100 performances and allowing Joe to recoup his money. But his enthusiasm had waned, and after opening night, he spent his time attending another New York attraction, the World Series. Eunice went to Stanford in 1942, with help from a letter of recommendation from Will Hayes, 
and she stayed with Arthur Poole and his wife, who had moved to Palo Alto. While in California, Eunice visited Hollywood, where Arthur Houghton took charge and treated her to studio tours and meetings with various stars, including Greer Garson. The next summer, Patricia took a trip to Hollywood, and this time it was Will Hayes who not only arranged her schedule, but also gave her the use of his Los Angeles apartment. Joe believed his daughter to be so stunning-looking she might have a career in pictures, but even if producers were interested, Pat wasn't. She wanted to get back to the Cape and spend the rest of her summer on the beach. After graduating from Finch and serving a stint as a reporter for a Washington newspaper, Kathleen had returned to England, officially to work with the Red Cross, unofficially to continue her relationship with William Cavendish, the Marquess of Hartington, heir to the Duke of Devonshire, known as Billy. As eldest son of one of the richest families in England, he was considered an appropriate match for Princess Elizabeth. But that didn't matter to Rose Kennedy. A marriage to anyone outside the faith would condemn her daughter to hell. Kathleen spent a year trying to wangle a dispensation, but after much agonizing, she married Billy in London with her eldest brother, the only family witness. The cables her parents separately sent to her on her wedding day summarize their relationships with their daughter. Joe's message ended with, You are, and still, and always will be, tops with me. And Rose limited herself to one word. Heartbroken. Jack had managed to talk his way into being sent to the Pacific to command one of the newly instituted PT boats that patrolled the Solomon Islands. Then, in early August of 1943, Joe received word Jack was missing in action. His boat, with thirteen men on board, had not returned from patrol, and a funeral service was held on the islands. Joe kept the news from Rose and the rest of the family, and Arthur Crock remembered thinking Joe's reaction was perfectly extraordinary. He took it with remarkable stoicism. Yet his relief was palpable when he learned a week later that Jack had survived. Two of Jack's men had died when a Japanese destroyer cut their boat in half, and, from all accounts, more lives would have been lost were it not for Jack's leadership and his fortitude in swimming for hours and doing considerable damage to his already vulnerable back while pulling one of his injured men. There were many stories of heroism that were not celebrated, but Joe made sure this was. John Hersey wrote of Jack's experiences for The New Yorker, and then the article was condensed to reach a much larger audience in Reader's Digest. The fate of his boys had hung heavily on Kennedy every day they were gone, but in early June of 1944 he could, at last, breathe a sigh of relief. Jack was recovering at the Chelsea Naval Hospital in Massachusetts, and Joe Jr. wrote from the base in England where he was stationed as a bomber pilot that, "'It looks like I am going to be on my way home in about ten days.'" He could have been released before June 6th, D-Day, but, as he said, "'I am delighted I stayed for the invasion.'" Back in Hyannis, Kennedy waited through the rest of June and July, expecting to hear the telephone ring and to hear you were in Norfolk, for troops disembarked from Europe. But it wasn't until early August he received a letter from his eldest, saying he was staying on for just one more mission, something different, with practically no danger. Upon reading the letter on August 9, 1944, Joe immediately responded, I quite understand how you feel about staying there, but don't force your luck too much. But Joe Jr. did force his luck. He had been in harm's way for over a year, had flown thirty-five missions, and could have returned home with honor. Yet he volunteered to pilot an experimental plane, gutted of everything but room for pilot, co-pilot, and the ten tons of TNT that would literally turn the plane into a bomb. His mission was to lock on to a German target and bail out but the plane exploded in midair before reaching its destination. On Sunday afternoon, August 13th, Joe was napping when two priests arrived, asking to see him. Rose went upstairs to wake him, and she was the one to put on the brave face for the children. 
Joe stayed in his room, listening to somber music hour after hour, going days without talking to anyone, and eating so little his wife feared for his health. Jack was still in the hospital when he heard the news of his brother's death. As he tried to cope with the devastating loss, one thing was clear. As he told his friend, Red Fay, the burden falls to me. Kathleen returned stateside to be with her family, for after being married for only a month, Billy had been sent back to join his regiment. She had been home a few weeks when she was notified that Billy, too, had been killed. A widow at twenty-four. She returned to England to stay. Joe's mourning turned to a deep bitterness. He was only fifty-six, but he told friends, All my plans for my own future were all tied up with young Joe, and that has gone smash. When Harry Truman, Roosevelt's choice for vice president for his extraordinary fourth term, came for a visit, Kennedy asked him, Harry, what the hell are you doing campaigning for that crippled son of a bitch that killed my son Joe? Almost a year after Joe Jr.'s death, Arthur Houghton's son was killed in the Pacific, and Joe wrote him, I won't offer you that hocus-pocus that he died for a great cause. I don't believe he did. I believe he died like young Joe, as a result of the stupidity of our generation. The one thing he did die a martyr to was his own conscience. He wanted to do the right thing, because it was his idea of the thing to do, and for that and that alone he died. That is the satisfaction which you and I will always have. Joe did not even want to leave the house, but he knew, I probably have to interest myself in something. He met with a producer, Mike Todd, to discuss going into business together. But Kennedy claimed, I looked at his balance sheet, and that was enough. Joe Shank approached him about going into private production, but again he couldn't get excited at the prospect. He continued to screen films several times a week, and kept his friends apprised of his opinions, particularly about female stars. After watching Dragon Seed, he said he thought— Catherine Hepburn borrowed those slacks from somebody in Long Island, and any minute she was going to take off her wig, shake out her hair, and say, Let's take the car over to Southampton. His libido was back, however, as he prodded both Eddie Goulding and Arthur Houghton to introduce him to a young actress who had caught his fancy, Joan Fontaine. Goulding told Joe he would have to put her on ice, because she was busy filming, but then Houghton was sent in to find out the details of her schedule. After over a year of inaction, Kennedy entered into a flurry of real estate deals, including the purchase of the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. It was the largest privately owned office building in the country, and he paid a fraction of the $30 million it had cost to build 15 years earlier. He also created the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation, which would go on to finance a variety of humanitarian efforts with emphasis on retarded children. Then Joe turned his attention to Jack's future. During his first 17 years, Jack had spent over a year in hospitals with various ailments. Joe had been supportive and hands-on when it came to finding medical experts, and it was assumed his second son would be an observer and a writer. If Jack was to step in to take on his brother's proactive role, he first needed to regain his health. He went to Arizona for what he thought might be as long as a year. Every morning he received the Boston Post by mail, and every night at five o'clock he received a call from his father. You could set your clock by it, remembers a friend who was with him. After only three months of recuperation, Jack was feeling well enough to head to Hollywood, where he partied at Gary Cooper's, and had his head turned by Joan Fontaine's sister, Olivia de Havilland. He found more success with starlets, signing his letters to a friend, The Extra's Delight. Then, on a visit to a film set, he met the actress Jean Tierney. She was only twenty-five, but had already been nominated for an Academy Award and iconized as the haunting Laura. 
while she was still married to Oleg Cassini and the mother of an institutionalized daughter. She became so smitten with Jack she began divorce proceedings. For Jack, it was up to San Francisco, where his father had arranged for him to report on the United Nations Charter meeting in May of 1945 for the Hearst newspapers. With the decision that Jack would run for what had been a part of Honey Fitz's congressional seat, they had to re-establish Boston and Massachusetts as the family base. What better way than to have the governor announce that Joe Kennedy was investing $500,000 in small companies in the state? He was actually selling what remained of Columbia Trust to Shawmut Bank and transferring the money from one company to another. But the aura created around the announcement was that the family cared about the state and considered it worthy of investment. It also helped Joe, who had been out of the public eye for half a dozen years, so he needed to publicly rehabilitate himself, give his biography a fresh face, and clean up loose ends. He became chairman of a commission to establish a Massachusetts Department of Commerce and took out ads picturing his smiling self promoting the state's economy. The last item on his to-do list was to sell Somerset Liquors, the company he had established with an investment of around $100,000. There was no reason to give the opposition ammunition to attack Kennedy's association with liquor, and while the company had served as a great source of profit and prolific gift-giving over the years, he picked a perfect time to sell. Somerset went for eight million dollars cash. Kennedy had used the still-active Red Thompson Productions to hold his liquor company, and with the sale, the corporation, which had served so many purposes and channeled so much profit— was finally and formally dissolved in the summer of 1946. Ted O'Leary and Tom Delahanty had been in Kennedy's service since the early 1920s, but as Joe pocketed his $8 million, he gave the two men bonuses of $25,000 each and let them go. From the old days, only Eddie Moore and Johnny Ford remained on the payroll. Joe continued to express an interest in returning to Hollywood, and he checked in with Arthur Houghton and Charlie Feldman to see if there is anything of interest out there in pictures. Yet he continued to balk because, I don't know any industry in the world that is as vulnerable for pay raises as the motion picture business. The topside people get so much that the little fellow down below feels he is getting a bad deal, and I don't think you will ever change it. He was also concerned with the growing strength of unions. I have always been against putting money into anything that had a big labor quotient. Wherever Joe was, a buzz of activity surrounded him. Sunday morning in Palm Beach meant mass, followed by loading everyone into cars for the trip to Hialeah Racetrack. The first car was old Joe, with men friends who might include two ex-senators, remembered Pamela Harriman. Then there were several cars of young people, the Kennedy children and friends who were staying at the house, and bringing up the rear was Mrs. Kennedy and two priests. When Rose was out of town, and even sometimes when she was in residence, Joe became quite blatant in parading a series of secretaries, chorus girls, or various choices of the day upstairs to his bedroom, right past anyone who happened to be gathered in the house. It never bothered me at all explained Arthur Crock, because Rose acted as if they didn't exist, and that was her business, not mine. The Kennedy children had become inured over the years to their parents' unique relationship. As they grew older, Joe regaled them with stories that implied his conquests. And it wasn't just the boys. The girls' friends and future daughters-in-law were included in the conversations about his serial infidelities Kathleen was still at Sacred Heart in Connecticut when her friend, Charlotte MacDonald, walked into Joe's suite at the Waldorf, where they were to meet. She called out, and Joe yelled from the shower that Jack and Kick were across the hall. A few minutes later, Joe joined them, wrapped only in a towel, and laughingly told Charlotte, who had left her bag and coat in his room, that Will Hayes came in and saw your coat and turned around, thinking I had a girl in the bedroom. The three Kennedys all thought this was hilarious, but Charlotte was left shaking her head in confusion. 
When Kathleen and Eunice were working in Washington and their father came to visit, friends were solicited for ideas of women he could dine with. As one of Jack's girlfriend's sons later recounted, she thought old Joe was awfully hard, a really mean man. He could be very charming when she and Jack were with him, but if Jack left the room, he'd try to hop in the sack with her. She thought it was a totally amoral situation, that there was something incestuous about the whole family. While friends were welcomed at Palm Beach and the Cape, they were also warned. When they joined in watching films in the basement screening room, female friends became reluctant to accept Joe's invitations to sit next to him because he would pinch them during the feature. He kissed all female overnight guests on the lips, including girlfriends of his sons. Any pretty young woman who came into Joe's purview was fair game. He seems to have treated them just as he did his business conquests. If they allowed themselves to get caught, it was their own fault. And if they somehow eluded him, no umbrage was held. But there was always the hope of another day. The ambassador likes to prowl at night, is how Jack cautioned one young woman staying at the family compound. Actually, it was early in the morning when the old bugger slipped into Pamela Harriman's room, she told her friend Truman Capote. Harriman, then Pamela Churchill, was in her mid-twenties, and just divorcing her husband Randolph, the son of the Prime Minister, when she was Kathleen's guest at Palm Beach the winter after war's end. Capote went on to fictionalize the story in his novella Answered Prayers, and wrote from the point of view of his female character that Joe— was already between the sheets with one hand over my mouth and the other all over the place, the sheer ballsy gall of it, right there in his own house with the whole family sleeping all around us. But all those Kennedy men are the same. They're like dogs. They have to pee on every fire hydrant. That is Capote talking, not Pamela. But Truman's biographer, Gerald Clark, claimed that Pamela had actually experienced everything described in the story. Why all the women? Kennedy regarded women as a kind of food to be consumed, remembered Harvey Clemmer. Gore Vidal uses another analogy for what he considered Joe's super-alpha male approach to women. They were like collecting stamps. Joe proudly told Joan Fontaine that he had instructed his children not to fool around at home, but do what you like when it doesn't throw a shadow on the family. Yet as he aged... He failed to follow his own advice, and became more blatant in his flaunting of women in front of family and friends. After finally meeting the star he had lusted after, Joe made his move fairly quickly. They shared a few lunches in New York, and then he called Fontaine to say he was coming to Los Angeles and would like to take her to dinner. She was already planning a party for that night, and so invited him to come. Joe thought all was going well as the dinner plates were being cleared, when Joe got up from his place on her right and beckoned me into the living room. I like it. I like your guests, your children, your house. Tell you what I'll do. I'll live here whenever I come to California. I'll invest your money for you. He assured her, You can do what you like when I'm not here. But there's only one thing— I can't marry you. In recounting that night decades later, Fontaine still laughs in bemusement over his assumptions, but at that moment she was stunned. Joe had never even held my hand. Or, as she put it to Liz Smith, Can you imagine that old man coming on to me? That night at dinner she just smiled and returned to her guests, and they never spoke of it again. Fontaine says she knew one other man for whom women were just a possession, and that was Howard Hughes. Still, she continued to see Joe occasionally when she was in New York, and he became a sort of father confessor. What attracted her to him? He was so powerful that he was very relaxed about it, adding he made you feel like you were the only one in the world who mattered. Although he insisted that he would do anything for her and invited her to visit Palm Beach, the one time she did call, she was with her daughter, and there was no room at the inn. 
Other women, however, did not have the confidence or experience Fontaine possessed, and there seemed to be a never-ending number willing to serve him. He expected friends, from Igor Cassini to Frank Sinatra, to procure for him. Occasionally their efforts were thwarted, such as the time Caroline Graham, a lovely nineteen-year-old who was working for Liz Smith, then a writer for Cassini's column, published under the moniker of Charlie Knickerbocker, returned to the office with the news that Igor had been so kind as to arrange for her to have dinner with Ambassador Kennedy. Liz informed the naive girl, "'You are not going to dinner with him, and if you do, I am calling your mother and sending you back to England.' Smith is convinced that while Caroline might have escaped Joe's grasp, there were plenty of others lined up to take her place. Kennedy, in turn, took care of his powerful friends— when Bernard Baruch was heading to Hollywood, Joe assured him that everything would be done to his heart's content, and then wired Arthur Houghton to take care of Baruch, who was still partial to beautiful blondes. As Jack's campaign for Congress began in earnest, he grew from a gawky greeter of potential constituents to a confident campaigner. He was often up and out at six in the morning, shaking hands and attending events on through the night. Behind the scenes, Jack's friend, John Galvin, recalled, Joe Kennedy could get almost anything done that he wanted to get done. He could reach almost anyone he wanted to reach. While he helped finance the campaign, there was no extra money floating around. They wanted accountability for everything they bought. Joe's contacts with the media were legion, and now he called in favors to the point that two of Boston's daily papers literally left space every day for a two-column picture and some story about Jack Kennedy. Jack's election that November of 1946 bucked a national trend as Republicans swept into control of both the House and the Senate for the first time in almost twenty years. That translated into powerful committee assignments and among them was the new chairman of the House on American Activities Committee, J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey. One of his first announcements was that hearings to investigate subversion in the film industry would take place the next summer, but they had to be postponed because there was so little to base the investigation on, until Thomas went hat in hand to the FBI. Director J. Edgar Hoover instructed his agents to extend every assistance to the committee, and soon Thomas was in possession of blind memos and lists of organizations, fronts, and individuals deemed subversive, as well as those who were potential friendly witnesses. One of the 32 names on Hoover's list of cooperative or friendly witnesses was Ronald Reagan, and another informant. Hoover insisted on using that term instead of informer because it sounds more admirable, was Joseph P. Kennedy. Knowing the FBI director held files on both himself and Jack, Joe let it be known he would be happy to assist the Bureau in any way possible. Joe was designated a special service contact, and in multiple conversations with agents, he expressed concern about the threat of communism to our domestic institutions, and pinkos in the film business. He specifically volunteered that he had many Jewish friends who would furnish him, upon request, with any information in their possession pertaining to communist infiltration. Hoover and his close personal friend and assistant, Clyde Tolson, visited Joe at his Palm Beach home, and shortly afterward, the FBI director told agents they should feel free to ask Kennedy about people and use anything he offered, but to keep Hoover informed. Joe kept up a steady stream of correspondence with Hoover over the years, praising some action or speech. Joe told him that he was his candidate for president, whatever year, whatever party. On their own, they are friendly, often innocuous notes— but taken together they read almost like love letters, similar to the ones Kennedy wrote Will Hayes, showering him with admiration, telling him he wasn't appreciated enough, and that the world or a portion of it would fall apart if something happened to him. 
Left-leaning Hollywood was just one of many of Joe's concerns that his son did not share. Jack had an intense curiosity, sought knowledge for knowledge's sake, and had an empathy for others his father never had. Joe McCarthy was Joe Kennedy's friend, not his son's. While Bobby would work for McCarthy, and Jack walked a thin line in his relationship with the senator, Jack and Bobby very publicly crossed American Legion picket lines to see Spartacus, starring Kirk Douglas and commonly known to have been written by one of the most celebrated of the Hollywood Ten, Dalton Trumbo. Jack's interest in the film business continued to center on Jean Tierney, and she even spent a week at the Cape. Although her family and her now ex-husband, Oleg Cassini, warned her that a Kennedy would never marry a divorced Episcopalian mother, she hung on to the hope for over a year. Tierney went to Washington to watch Jack working on the floor of Congress, and then, finally, one afternoon, he quietly informed her, You know, Jean, I can never marry you. With that, she did not see him again. But later in life, she remembered she wore her heart on her sleeve for a long time. Breaking with Tierney hardly curbed Jack's appetite for Hollywood, and he fell into the habit of visiting regularly. He usually stayed at the Coldwater Canyon home of his father's friend, the agent, Charlie Feldman, who was now also producing, buying the rights to stories and then packaging the actors, directors, and writers he had under contract— and presenting them fait accompli to the studios. Charlie often set Jack up with beautiful young actresses, but Joe was growing concerned that his son's promiscuity was becoming too public. On a trip of his own to Hollywood in 1947, Joe took it upon himself to find an appropriate woman for Jack, and discussed the situation on the golf course with Feldman and RKO executive Phil Reisman. Charlie's eye for the ladies had not dimmed in the slightest, and he was always cultivating new talent, so he told Joe about his latest find, a young woman who was not only a real beauty, but a virgin besides. The just twenty-year-old Arlene Dahl was in Hollywood because Jack Warner had seen her in a New York musical and signed her to a contract. She had passed her screen test and was waiting to start her first film— when she received a phone call inviting her to join the three men at Romanoff's. It was an interesting lunch, and as it was ending, Joe said to me, I like the way you think, and I would like to talk to you. Can I come by your apartment later this afternoon? Looking back, the actress laughs at her own naivete for agreeing to see him. But she did, and once he arrived, even she was surprised by his mission. I have a son I would like you to meet and assured me, he's a very nice young man. He went on to tell me a little about him, and then asked me who was handling my business affairs and offered to advise me. And shortly thereafter, a call came from Boston. Jack was coming to Hollywood, and would she go out with him? It was the night of a black tie affair at the home of Charles and Elsie Mendel, and Jack arrived straight from the airport in a rumpled brown suit, brown shoes, and when he sat down, I noticed one sock was black and the other was brown. Well, I didn't have a black suit in my closet, so I asked him if I could press his suit for him. If it made me happy, that was all that mattered. So he was sitting there in my hot pink chiffon robe when my roommate walked in. He didn't care. We all just laughed, and he thought it was very amusing. He even let me comb down his cowlick, but he drew the line at hairspray. The evening was a great success, and Jack returned regularly to Hollywood, usually staying at Charlie's and seeing Arlene. He never had his own car or a driver or carried any money, so it was always my car and I made the reservations. But when we went out, it was mostly to private parties. I loved dancing, and because of his back, he couldn't dance. He always had that bad back. He never complained about it, but occasionally he might say, if I am a little strange tonight, it's because I took one or two more pills than I should have. I just don't want to think about it. Dahl's screen career was taking off, and she moved to MGM, where she remembers introducing Jack's sister, Patricia, 
who Marlene worked with on Catholic charities, to the Metro star, Peter Lawford. In between her dates with Jack, Joe would check in with Arlene to see how things were going, and eventually it was he who asked Arlene if she would marry Jack. I think he was in awe of my virginity, and, knowing of her charity work with Pat, simply assumed she was Catholic. When he discovered she was a Midwestern Lutheran, he asked her to convert. But in the end, while Arlene found Jack to be so handsome and interesting, I admired him on almost every level. They both insisted on deciding for themselves whom they would marry. Asked if she heard from Joe again after her break with Jack, Dahl says, Oh, no. Once he knew I wasn't going to marry his son, I was off the list. He was on to Plan B. Looking back over those years, she concludes, I think I was the only Hollywood star not to have slept with Jack Kennedy. Joe gave up on guiding his son's love life and added the south of France to his list of annual pilgrimages. The children were almost all grown and out on their own. Eunice, now 27, was working as the executive secretary at the Justice Department's Juvenile Delinquency Committee. Bobby, 23, was out of the Navy without seeing action and back at Harvard, while Jean, 20, was a student at Manhattanville College in New York, where her roommate was Eunice Gakel, soon to become Mrs. Robert Kennedy. At 16, Teddy had already attended almost a dozen schools in his short life and was now at the Milton Academy. Kathleen had remained in England since the death of her husband, but after several years of widowhood, had fallen in love with the married Lord Peter Fitzwilliams, whom friends described as quite the rogue male, with a charm and bravado that reminded them of Joe Kennedy. Rose would never approve, but Kathleen hoped her father would give them his blessing. She and Peter were flying to France to meet with him when their plane crashed into a mountain during a storm. Joe was in his George Sank hotel room on May 14, 1948, when he received the phone call from a Boston reporter. Kennedy flew to Lyon, drove to the crash site, and identified the body of the daughter he adored. He called home, told the family how peaceful she had looked, and then holed up in his hotel, not knowing what to do next. It was Kick's former mother-in-law who came to the rescue, suggesting Kathleen be buried in their family plot. Joe agreed and went to England to attend her burial a week later, surrounded by the friends who had loved Kathleen, but disliked him for what they thought he had done or not done as ambassador. Joe continued to travel and have enough stature to meet with leaders such as President Truman and Generals Douglas MacArthur and Dwight Eisenhower, he stayed in touch with a few of his remaining Hollywood friends, such as Morton Downey, Will Hayes, and Arthur Houghton, as well as those in the press, such as Arthur Crock. Yet with less reason to be pleasant to get ahead, he became more presumptuous and quicker to condemn. He grew more conservative and claimed that the Democratic Party that considers nominating LaGuardia for United States Senate certainly isn't the Democratic Party in which my father was interested. When he was asked to come to California to speak at a Democratic dinner organized by Joe Schenck, he declined the honor, privately telling friends the schedule clashed with a more important commitment, the World Series. While both Kennedy and Gloria Swanson continued to make dismissive remarks about each other to friends, they saw each other off and on over the years in Los Angeles and New York. Gloria and Rose occasionally ran into each other in foreign ports, and the two women carried on a sporadic correspondence, recommending doctors, sharing family news, as well as flowers and notes of sympathy when Joe Jr. and Kathleen died. Joe Schenck eventually bought back Swanson's UA stock and severed the relationship. Gloria would make several films in the 1930s, but neither her screen career nor her bank account ever recovered from Queen Kelly. The Internal Revenue Service continued to haunt her. To her fury, Joe consistently claimed to have no records, 
Yet his files hold substantial accounts regarding her films, as well as his profits from Eddie Goulding's song, Love. Swanson would marry three more times, each ending in divorce, and gave birth to another daughter, Michelle, during her brief marriage to Michael Farmer, a British playboy friend of Eddie Goulding's and Noel Coward's. Gloria was introduced to a new generation of filmgoers in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard in 1950. She was in her early fifties, but Norma Desmond would become her signature role, and she reveled in it. Unlike her character, however, Gloria lived very much in the present, involved in a wide variety of projects. She moved to New York, where she developed a clothing line, was a spokeswoman for Jurgens and other products, and took up sculpture. She hosted a television show and went into the cosmetics business, where she was her own chemist. She became a vocal advocate of organic farming and nutrition. She was always determined to be as self-sufficient as possible and never had another mentor. The only person she ever really loved and respected was her mother, says her daughter Michelle, who went through her own private hell growing up in boarding schools. One of the positives Michelle remembers is her mother repeatedly telling her, If you don't discipline yourself, life will. Swanson's children, particularly Joseph, continued to look upon Kennedy as an authority figure. Gloria sent Michelle to see Joe when she was balking at following through on an acting contract, and Joseph consulted with him when he faced major personal decisions. Kennedy's and Swanson's mutual willfulness came out in both public and private conversations. Kennedy often regaled friends with stories of Gloria and claimed she had wrecked my business, wrecked my health, and damn near wrecked my life. She, in turn, would dismiss him in interviews, and when pushed to explain their relationship, she waved her hand and said, What did I know? My job was to look good and show up. Gloria tried to salvage Queen Kelly with the help of Stroheim in 1956, and went so far as to round up Cena Owen and Walter Byron, who were both amenable to reprising their roles almost twenty years later. Yet when she approached Kennedy for help with the financing, he refused. She was forced to give up on the film, and another thirty years would pass before preservationists combined the remaining footage with stills to produce as complete a version as possible. In 1952, Joe was invigorated by Jack's run for the Senate against Henry Cabot Lodge. Eddie Moore, who would pass away the next year, was too ill to participate to any great degree, but Johnny Ford was still based in Boston and helpful in ways large and small. Once Jack became the junior senator from Massachusetts, Joe was more concerned than ever about his son's love life, at least the possible publication of it. So he was relieved and genuinely pleased when, in the summer of 1953, it was announced that Jack was engaged to the Newport socialite come Washington photographer, Jacqueline Bouvier. His son's escapades had been a source of pride to Joe, and he had even gone so far as to reimburse Jack's friend, Lem Billings, when he took young Bobby to the same Harlem whorehouse where Jack had lost his virginity. However, now there was an image to protect, and Joe wrote to Jack's friend, Torb MacDonald, I am a bit concerned that Jack might get restless about the prospect of getting married. Most people do, and he is more likely to do so than others. I am hoping that he will take a rest and not jump from place to place and be especially mindful of whom he sees. Joe never showed any remorse for his own infidelities, let alone curtailed them for any length of time. But now that Jack was a public figure, monogamy was a price he should be willing to pay, and gladly. A Newport Society wedding was the perfect backdrop to stage a massive publicity campaign and Joe wanted a separate tent for the press with an open bar. However, he met his match in Jackie's mother, Janet Auchincloss, who insisted that a few friends who happened to be with the press could be invited as guests, but there would be no separate facilities at her daughter's wedding. 
She won the Battle of the Tent, but enough reporters and photographers were given access to have the September 12, 1953 wedding covered prolifically in national magazines. Joe's portion of the guest list ranged from J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson to his old friend Marion Davies and Horace Brown, the man she had married less than three months after Hearst's death two years before. Davies and Brown stayed in the East so Jack and Jackie could spend a week of their honeymoon at Marion's Beverly Hills estate, secluded, yet with every whim met by the dozen-plus household staff. Kennedy had stayed close to Marion. He had inserted himself into discussions with Hearst over her future, saying, I hope I'm not being too forward, but it seems to me that things should be earmarked for her right away, so any disputes might be avoided. He added that, You might tell her if she needs advice on anything else to call me. I would like nothing better than to see that she had whatever protection I could give her against that hungry horde, referring to the Hearst Corporation. Hollywood came back full force into Kennedy's life a few months after Jack's wedding, when Patricia brought the actor Peter Lawford to Palm Beach for the holidays. The Lawford family had a title, but little money. Peter's parents, Sir Sidney and Lady May Lawford, had been married to others when May's pregnancy by Sidney moved them to divorce their respective spouses and wed. They created quite a scandal in the process, and most of Peter's youth was spent traveling the globe. Sir Sidney was unable to get money out of England, but May insisted on keeping up their globe-trotting ways. Almost twenty years older than his wife, Sidney was nearing seventy, and so Peter became the primary breadwinner working at gas stations and parking cars. When the family moved to Los Angeles, he quickly went from theater usher to movie actor and was in half a dozen films, including Mrs. Miniver and A Yank at Eaton, before signing a contract at the age of 19 with MGM. When it became clear that his daughter was serious about the now 30-year-old Lawford, Joe began investigating him. He heard rumors that Peter was bisexual and had several gay friends, so Kennedy called Lawford's old boss, Louis B. Mayer, who had been out of MGM since 1951. But he was willing to tell Joe what he knew. Mayer was proud that he had cultivated young talent and considered Peter one of his finds, along with Jackie Cooper, Elizabeth Taylor, Judy Garland, and Mickey Rooney. Mayer told Joe that the gay rumors had been started by Peter's own mother, who had come to him with her concerns about her son's sexuality. At the time, Lawford was in the middle of a torrid affair with Lana Turner, and Mayer assured Kennedy that the rumors were just that. Peter was heterosexual through and through. To double-check, Kennedy placed a call to J. Edgar Hoover, and within days Joe was reading through Lawford's FBI file. The pages included the fact that Peter had turned over the name of a Hollywood figure to the FBI as, oh, so red. But most of the documents dealt with the repeated times that Peter's name had been found during the Bureau's investigations of prostitution rings. As one of Lawford's biographers notes, such information would have turned most fathers against a prospective son-in-law, but not Joe Kennedy. He concluded that Peter was not only a proven anti-communist, but a normal, red-blooded American male. And that, plus the almost $100,000 in the actor's bank account, convinced Kennedy that Lawford would do just fine. Still, Joe put Peter through his paces when he called on Kennedy in his New York office to officially ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. Joe greeted him with, If there's anything I'd hate more for a son-in-law than an actor, it's a British actor. And asked him about his finances. Joe had a lengthy prenuptial agreement prepared for Lawford to sign, but he pulled it when the actor consented to the idea. To prove both his sincerity and his net worth, Peter gave Pat an eight-carat diamond engagement ring. Even Rose did not object too strenuously to Peter. Although he was an Episcopalian, he agreed to raise the children as Catholics, and the major upheaval that had greeted Kathleen's marriage was not repeated. 
This time the outrage came from Peter's mother, who called the Kennedys barefoot Irish peasants. She was a thorn in Joe's side, but it was Peter who was scornful of her, fed up with her pretenses and the way she treated just about anyone who wasn't obsequious to her. The April 24, 1954 wedding was a relatively small one at St. Thomas More Roman Catholic Church on New York's Upper East Side. But the glamour of a Kennedy Lawford wedding took on the look of a Hollywood premiere and captured the imagination of the media. More than 3,000 curious spectators congregated outside for a glimpse of the newlyweds, requiring police cordons. Joe stoked the publicity machine, and Igor Cassini used his column to hail the marriage as one of the great romances of the year. Joe actively coordinated, solicited, and monitored the press coverage of his family in general, and Jack in particular. W.R. Hurst was gone, but Joe stayed in touch with his son, W.R. Jr., who had taken over the Hearst Enterprises, and Hearst's national editor, Frank Conniff. When W.R. Hearst III was born, Joe sent the infant several shares of stock in blue-chip companies. Kennedy maintained efficient offices in each of his homes, and in Palm Beach he had his 100-square-foot walled open-air sunbox, with padded benches and chairs where he could sunbathe while having the privacy he needed as he worked the phone. Decades before the term telecommuting was coined, Joe was running his kingdom poolside. He was looking at a fortune of around $400 million, or the equivalent of $2 billion today, as he prepared to stay behind the scenes, but still actively participate in his son's campaign for president. As Jim Landis, who had stayed friendly with Joe since their New Deal days, described it, the Kennedy fortune is different from most others. It isn't paper, it's real. Joe could write a check for $9 million just like that. He owned more real estate than any other individual American, and he was ready to spend what it took to see his vicarious dream come true. Kennedy was painfully aware that his public appearances would not help the campaign. In spite of his years of playing the press and desperately trying to create a sterling biography for himself, questions raised over the years had careered like a game of telephone into the common knowledge that the family fortune was the result of bootlegging and stock market manipulation. Joe may have lain low, but he stage-managed. He declined an offer from the Ladies Home Journal for Rose to write an article extolling her children, but cooperated with Redbook for an article on Jack's life, and scheduled his children's summer visits to coincide with the arrival of a reporter from Collier's. Throughout the 1950s, multiple articles appeared under Jack's name in venues as diverse as Look, Vogue, TV Guide, McCall's, Life, and the New York Times magazine. Kennedy also made time to keep his proverbial eye on his other children and their families. Peter Lawford had found some success in television, but after his run as Nick Charles in the Thin Man series was off the air, he went behind the camera as a producer. Carl Reiner was looking for backing for a new situation comedy he had written and planned to star in, called Head of the Family, about a television writer named Rob Petrie who worked in New York and lived with his wife and son in New Rochelle. Both Reiner and Lawford were represented by William Morris, and their agents put the men together. Reiner remembers going to the Sherry Netherland Hotel in Manhattan for their first meeting, where he found Lawford wearing velvet slippers with gold embossing and no socks. That's important. No socks. That's what stood out. Lawford agreed to back the pilot. And then, a few weeks before shooting began, Reiner received a request. Could you please send a copy of the script to Florida? Reiner slowly realized that meant it needed to pass muster with Joe Kennedy for the ultimate green light. According to friends... Lawford was terrified of Joe, and the Kennedy wealth hovered over the Lawfords like an enormous carnivorous bird. And so, with some trepidation, Reiner sent the script off to Palm Beach. 
The filming went ahead as scheduled, so he assumed that since there was nothing anti-Irish or pro-Gloria Swanson in the story, Joe had given his approval. Head of the family was not picked up. But less than a year later, Sheldon Leonard, along with his partner Danny Thomas, convinced Reiner his scripts were great, but they needed someone else to star. And so the Dick Van Dyke Show was born. Lawford's role as producer ended with a pilot, and he went on to his next project, a film based on a story he had optioned, Ocean's Eleven. As Jack Kennedy's campaign for president picked up steam, Joe was rarely seen in public, but from Antibes, Palm Beach, and Hyannis, he made it his business to keep in contact with friends in the press and other influential players, soliciting their ideas and promoting Jack. He also called in favors. There are variations of the story of assistance from the mob, and one of those willing to talk on the record is Tina Sinatra, who says her father told her that Joe called him to come to his Waldorf suite early in 1959. He arrived, assuming he would be asked to fundraise, but instead Joe told him they needed help in West Virginia in the primaries and Illinois in the general election. You and I know the same people, and you know the people I mean, Joe told Frank. Sure, my father said. He didn't need to have the dots connected. I can't go to those people the old man went on. It might come back at Jack. But you can. The best thing you can do for Jack is to ask for their help as a personal favor to you. Keep us out of it. Tina says that Dad had never done anything like this before, for no one was more aware it was not a good idea to be in their debt. But he took Chicago boss Sam Giancana out on the golf course. After Frank relayed the request, and assured him he was getting nothing out of it himself, Giancana told Sinatra, It's a couple of phone calls, and tell the old man I said hello. During the primaries, Joe spent time at the Cal Neva Lodge on the California-Nevada border, and visited Sinatra at his Palm Springs home. Sinatra's valet claimed that the abuse Joe heaped on all of us was cruder and meaner than that of any other visitor in the fifteen years he worked for Frank. Joe bought a plane so Jack could fly more comfortably and expeditiously around the country, saying he had risked a million dollars before on an adventure much less worthwhile. In July of 1960, the Democratic National Convention was held in Los Angeles, and Joe set up residence at Marion Davies's Beverly Hills estate. It had been Hearst's home for the last four years of his life, and was fully equipped not only with the obligatory pool and tennis court, but with a switchboard and a dozen phone lines, in addition to a full phalanx of staff. It was a perfect arrangement for a man who wanted to be invisible, yet in constant contact. The delegate voting was to begin on Wednesday night and that day Jack managed to get away unnoticed to spend several hours alone with his father at the Davies' home. With all that was going on and all that needed to be done, father and son shared the ability to remove themselves for a few hours of rest and relaxation. Two nights later, the rest of the family was at the convention to hear Jack's acceptance speech, but Joe had left that morning to fly to New York to watch his son's speech at the home of Henry Luce, in the company of the single most powerful influence on the minds and opinions of America. Once Jack's nomination was assured, and the campaign against Richard Nixon went into high gear, Joe physically removed himself from the country, spending the rest of the summer on the French Riviera, where he was photographed walking the golf course with his beautiful young caddy, who also happened to be in residence at his villa. While Joe stayed in constant touch with the campaign by phone, he had been laying the groundwork for years. The crucial difference between Nixon and Kennedy, concludes Seymour Hirsch, as had been foreseen and carefully orchestrated by Jack's father, was Kennedy's celebrity status and his confidence and ease in front of the camera. As the votes were being tallied on election night, Jack, 
the family and their friends, including Ben Bradley and his wife, gathered at what was now the family compound of houses on the Cape. They went down to the basement theater to watch a John Wayne movie, and when that failed to hold their interest, Butterfield 8, starring Elizabeth Taylor, and released in theaters just days before, was put into the projector instead. Early the next morning Jack awoke as president-elect, and when his family accompanied him to the local armory for his press conference, Joe was photographed with his son for the first time in many months. Joe Kennedy was 72 years old that January of 1961, and proud to claim that the tuxedo he wore as ambassador still fit him for his son's inauguration. The festivities were star-studded, with Frank Sinatra, who had provided the campaign with its theme song, a variation on high hopes, literally producing the inaugural ball. Yet the planning turned rancorous, as Sinatra resented what he considered the shabby treatment of Sammy Davis, Jr., whom Joe insisted be disinvited after he married the very white My Brit. Peter Lawford was the bearer of that news, and he took the brunt of Sinatra's anger. Nothing was to spoil the triumphant day for Joe, who saluted his son, now the President of the United States, as Jack passed the reviewing stand and tipped his hat to his father. It was the ultimate culmination of fifty years of telling the rest of the world they could go to hell. Alongside the multitude of family members sat Marion Davies and her husband, Horace. Joe had made arrangements for them to stay in the presidential suite of the Sheridan Park Hotel and be treated as very special guests throughout the festivities. Marion was wearing silk scarves to cover the results of an operation to remove cancer of the jaw, and when Joe realized what was happening, he made it his business to talk to her doctors and then have two New York specialists sent to examine her. He took several of his grandchildren along with a nurse to visit her for a week in Palm Springs. He added a doctor from Illinois to her retinue, and they operated on Marion early that summer. She believed she was getting better, but in trying to walk she broke her leg and was bedridden for the two months before she died on September 22, 1961. Mary Pickford helped Horace choose the casket, but few friends from those glory days of the teens and twenties were left. Joe was an honorary pallbearer. While photographs decorated many walls in the Hyannis house, Joe's bedroom featured only one, and that was on his night table, a smiling picture of a young Marion Davies. She was a wonderful woman. She was a great friend, Joe told his chauffeur, Frank Saunders when they heard the news of Marion's death. She was a woman who understood men. She understood men who wanted great things. She understood me. Shortly after his election in 1960, Jack Kennedy was relaxing in Hyannisport, playing backgammon with his friend and distant in-law, Gore Vidal. You know, Jack said, I am getting a little tired of reading how my father bought me the election. I think of the things I did. I was the one out there. Well, Vidal responded, he certainly made a big contribution. What do you think drove him? Jack paused, looked out to the sea for a moment, and then said with finality, Vanity. It was vanity, and of course much more. Joe Kennedy was a very complicated man who could be harsh and brutal in his business dealings, able to cut off formerly close friends without a blink. There was nothing unconditional in his life, except his love for his children. Joe had always been the center of the familial universe and a major player in the world at large, but now the second son, who had spent his first twenty-five years in the shadow of his elder brother, had emerged as the one in the floodlights. Friends such as John Kenneth Galbraith, who had known Jack since Harvard and went on to become his ambassador to India, believed that Joe Kennedy had a diminishing influence on his son. Certainly by the time he was president, Jack Kennedy was very much in control of himself. 
He was kind to his father. He admired his father. But he did not feel it necessary, perhaps even wise, to be guided by his father. Many people commented on how Joe must have had to restrain himself from calling Jack on a regular basis. Instead, he waited to be called. He was there for him when he needed to talk, such as in April, when Joe reported to Rose he spent most of the day on the phone with Jack and Bobby, venting their frustration over the Bay of Pigs. In Hyannis, Joe had the outdoor field turned into a helicopter pad for presidential visits, and he laid the groundwork for his youngest son, Teddy, to run for Jack's former Senate seat in the fall of 1962. Joe also helped negotiate the movie rights for Bob Donovan's book, PT-109, for $150,000, with $2,500 for each of the crew members or their widows, and the remaining $120,000 to Donovan. Bobby Kennedy, as Jack's attorney general, had tried to learn to live with J. Edgar Hoover, who overtly disdained the man who was technically his boss. There was little Hoover enjoyed more than turning the screws, so he must have smiled as he passed a memo to his superior on December 11, 1961, that wiretaps on the phone of Sam Giancana had revealed that the Chicago mob chief had made a donation to the campaign of President Kennedy, but was not getting his money's worth. Bobby, of course, would have told Jack, and the next weekend the president stopped in Palm Beach after a brief trip to South America, arriving in Florida on December 18th. Jack spent the evening with his father, and it's hard to believe they didn't discuss the Hoover memo. The next morning they drove together to the airport for Jack's return to the White House. Joe returned to the house and then went golfing with his niece, Anne Gargan, the now-grown daughter of Rose's sister, Agnes. Several hours later, Anne returned with Joe to the oceanfront house, reporting that he had felt faint on the course and wanted to rest. Later that evening, an ambulance was finally called to take him to the hospital, where he was put on life support. Joe had suffered a severe stroke, and over the next year, attempts at physical therapy and rehabilitation were made, but they were aborted on several occasions. Anne Gargan became his caregiver and given complete authority over him. The right side of his body was paralyzed and, according to his private nurse, Rita Dallas, he did not know what the words were that he was saying. He knew the words he wanted to use, but the directive mechanism, the portion of the brain that directs this ability, was not operating. He lay there with a functioning brain unable to communicate, except for the word no. There were variations in tone and length, but still the only thing that came out was no. Efforts were made to promote the idea that little was wrong. He was taken in a wheelchair to his New York office, where subordinates were brought in to report to him in a one-way conversation. Yet privately it must have been agonizing for Joe, knowing what he wanted to say and being unable to say it, embarrassing for his employees, and emotionally draining for the family. He was brought to the White House, and his children all visited regularly, carrying on as if all was normal, giving him accounts of their activities, yet without the familiar response and counsel. For decades all activity had revolved around him, and he had been able to pick up the phone and reach into almost any area of power. That man was gone. Rose agonized over, My poor son. So much responsibility, and there is no way for his father to help him now. It is possible, even probable, that neither Jack nor Bobby knew all the details of Joe's various relationships, including those with the mob, and only a few months after the stroke, that pivotal role was sorely missed. Frank Sinatra was making very public plans for the president to stay at his Palm Springs compound, where both Jack and Joe had been guests before. Now Frank added a helicopter landing pad and multiple phone lines, with visions of his estate becoming the Western White House. 
Only two days before the long-planned presidential arrival, Peter Lawford informed him that the Secret Service thought the house was too open and unsafe, too big a security risk. Sinatra didn't believe it for a minute, and the ultimate insult immediately followed when he was informed the president would be staying at the Palm Springs home of Republican Bing Crosby instead. Had the Kennedys sought deliberately to humiliate my father, they couldn't have done a better job, says Frank's daughter Tina. Sinatra cut off his relationship with Peter Lawford, and he never trusted Bobby. But Dad couldn't bring himself to blame Jack. Bobby clearly wanted to distance Jack from any friends of Sam Giancana, no matter how helpful they had been in the past. And when the Attorney General went after the mob, and Giancana particularly, Tina says Dad was stunned when the administration began to prosecute the very people it had enlisted for help just the year before. He had gone to Giancana out of friendship for Jack Kennedy and expected nothing back. What he did not expect was to be set up like a fool. The rebuff of Sinatra sent reverberations deep into the mob, who had to wonder what was next. If there was one area in which friends saw the pattern of Joe's life repeated in Jack, it was in his eye for actresses and his congenital, emotionless womanizing. Jack's attitude toward his father's conduct seems to have evolved from acceptance to almost respect, if not awe. When Joan Fontaine dined at the White House in 1962, she told the President the story of Joe offering to move in with her, and Jack's response was, Let's see, how old would he have been then, sixty-five? Hope I'm the same when I'm his age. Just as he had when he was a congressman, Jack continued to squeeze in a trip to California whenever possible. The Santa Monica Beach was turned into an impromptu helicopter pad as the president landed and ran escorted into the oceanfront house of Pat and Peter Lawford. There were always a lot of women around, one of their neighbors remembers, but Angie Dickinson was the perennial. Another regular visitor was Marilyn Monroe, whose relationships with Jack and Bobby have been discussed elsewhere. The president's escapades with movie stars weren't limited to his time away from Washington. Marlena Dietrich, whom Jack remembered as the glamorous woman in the south of France, who had massaged him seductively when she wasn't off in her bungalow with his father, was past sixty when she brought her sold-out one-woman show to Washington in September of 1963. Both she and her daughter had campaigned for Kennedy, and Dietrich was flattered by his phone call inviting her to the White House, with directions for arrival at the South Entrance. She later told several friends, including Gore Vidal, that she was shown upstairs and found the President alone and expecting her. The tour consisted of the West sitting room and the bedroom, where he made a clumsy pass. Her initial protest of you know, Mr. President, I am not very young, soon gave way to, don't muss my hair, I'm performing. After an ecstatic three to six minutes, Jack was quickly asleep. Marlena pulled herself together and, already running late and not wanting to just wander the halls, woke Jack. He apologized and rang for his valet, who was clearly used to this sort of thing. The President asked for Miss Dietrich's car to be readied, and then, with a towel around his waist, he led her to the small elevator across the hall from the bedroom. He shook her hand as if she were the mayor of San Antonio. But something else was on his mind. If I ask you a question, will you tell me the truth? Marlena did not guarantee anything, but said, fire ahead. Did you ever go to bed with my old man? Knowing exactly what he wanted to hear, Marlena demurred. He tried. She responded after a brief pause, but I never did. Jack was triumphant. I always knew the son of a bitch was lying. Marlena couldn't resist a little bragging of her own. She returned to her New York apartment, where she was greeted by her son-in-law, who was staying there. Before even saying hello, Marlena smiled, opened her bag, 
and pulled out a pair of pink panties and waved them at his nose. Smell. It is him, the President of the United States. He was wonderful. As Marlena's daughter recounts the story, she is quick to note that her husband immediately moved to a hotel. It was only two months later that Jack and Jackie took off on a pre-re-election campaign trip to Dallas. Joe and Rose and their retinue were still in Hyannis, with the staff readying to make the annual move to Palm Beach in time for Thanksgiving. Joe and Rose were napping in their separate bedrooms when Frank Saunders, the family chauffeur, heard the news on the radio, and Joe's nurse went into his room to make sure he was still sleeping. It wasn't long before the Secret Service entered the house and informed the staff the President was dead. But Rose heard it from the television. She emerged from her room to instruct the help to keep the news from her husband. I just talked with my children. They're coming right up. I want them to be with him. I want them to tell him. The normal schedule was that, after his nap, Joe watched a movie. So Frank pulled himself together and went into the room a bit too cheerfully, announcing, Hey, Chief, it's movie time. Looking anywhere but at him, Frank put Joe into his wheelchair and rolled him into the elevator that took them to the basement screening room. A distraught Anne Gargan joined them, and Frank went into the projection booth, dimmed the lights, and, with a quick focusing, Kid Galahad, starring Elvis Presley, illuminated the screen. Kid Galahad was Elvis's tenth film in six years, and Joe usually had the patience to sit through all kinds of movies. But this day not even co-stars Charles Bronson and Gig Young with an Irish backstory could hold his interest. The film was not halfway through when Joe started fidgeting and waving dismissively at the screen, so Anne called to Frank to turn it off. Joe silently nodded when asked if he wanted to go back upstairs, and while the staff expected an explosion when they told him his television was broken, they were relieved when he just gestured toward a magazine and settled for that. Joe was in his bed when Eunice and Ted arrived, red-eyed and exhausted. They broke the news of Jack's death to their father, and Joe sobbed as the reality sank in. After the unthinkable had happened to Joe Jr., his second son had accomplished the familial imperative of catching the gold ring, and Joe had convinced himself, after thinking he was standing at Jack's deathbed on four different occasions, I know nothing can happen to him. But it had and while Rose joined the rest of the family in Washington for the state funeral, Joe stayed behind his closed bedroom door. This time there was the continuous coverage on television, which, now that it was fixed, he watched off and on with Father Kavanaugh of Notre Dame, who had arrived to be at his side. Five years later, no one tried to interrupt the television coverage as Joe lay watching and waiting, during the twenty-four hours between the time Bobby was shot and when he died. This time it was Teddy's turn to give the eloquent and emotional eulogy, as the last surviving son. Joe's agony is almost unimaginable, not only for the tremendous loss, but also his total inability to do anything about any of it. When former President Eisenhower's funeral was televised in early 1969, Joe became visibly upset. His caregivers finally realized his grief was way beyond anything they had seen, except for his son's funerals. And it wasn't until Teddy was called from Washington to come to his father's bedside that the old man was convinced he hadn't outlived his only remaining son. While there had been several near-death scares, Joe's health severely faded over the summer and fall of 1969. The family, his two dozen grandchildren, and his widowed daughter-in-law Jackie, now married to Aristotle Onassis, made the pilgrimage to the Cape to say their goodbyes. Finally, on the morning of Tuesday, November 18, 1969, at the age of 81, and after eight years of being unable to speak, Joe Kennedy passed away. 
The obituaries that headlined the country's newspapers and national magazines paid homage to the great patriarch, the father of a president, and a man who lived to watch four of his children die before him. There were references to his earlier life on Wall Street and as ambassador, but precious little was mentioned about his time in Hollywood, let alone his unique impact on the film business. He had shifted the gears of an entire industry from one that took the creative long view to one whose guiding doctrine was the next quarter's balance sheet, unheard of then, but taken for granted in today's multinational corporate Hollywood. The years had blurred his extraordinary influence, and the fact that, as Betty Lasky, daughter of fellow mogul Jesse Lasky put it, in the over one hundred years of the business of film, Joe Kennedy was the first and only outsider to fleece Hollywood. This concludes the reading of Joseph P. Kennedy Presents His Hollywood Years by Carrie Beecham. Copyright 2009 by Carrie Beecham. This book was read by Pam Ward. This unabridged recording was published by arrangement with Alfred A. Knopf, a division of Random House Incorporated, and was produced in 2009 by Blackstone Audio, Inc., which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio, Inc. If you would like to obtain a complete catalog of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD and MP3 CD, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.